الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته dear viewers welcome to the second day of Jalsa Salana USA and this is live proceedings coming to you from our MTA International US studios we are still in Harrisburg Pennsylvania where the 73rd Jalsa Salana is happening here in the United States and uh, Nanbali Saab this is day two I'm sure you're very excited yesterday was great a lot of experiences, a lot of things that we showed our viewers, but uh, today is day two. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Ham apne tamam nazreen ko jalsa salana Amerika ke dusre din ki nashriyat mein khush amadid kehte hain. Khuda tal ke fazl se kal jo pehla din tha, wo bada hi kamyab aur baabarkat guzra aur ham umid karte hain ki aaj ke din ki jo nashriyat hain, wo bhi hamare jo nazreen hain unko pasand aayengi. To inshaAllah taala uska mazid taaruf chaya bhi ham aapko karwate hain. Inshallah. So as you know, we always start with the recitation of the Holy Quran to invoke the blessings of Allah on all of our gatherings. And Jalsa Salana is not any different. And we want you to enjoy that experience as well. So we'll begin with the beautiful words of the Holy Quran. And then we'll come here back into the studio to tell you more about the programs that we have for you for the rest of the day. So enjoy that and join us right back. من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما خلقنا السماء والأرض وما بينهما با ذلك ظن الذين كفروا فضيل للذين كفروا من النار أم نجعل الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات كالمفسدين في النرد أم نجعل المتقين كالفجار كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته وليذكر أولو الألباب I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the Rejected. In the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, Ever Merciful. And we have not created the heaven and the earth and all that is between them in vain. That is the view of those who disbelieve. Woe then to the disbelievers because of the fire. Shall we treat those who believe and do good works like those who act corruptly in the earth? Shall we treat the righteous like the wicked? This is a book which we have revealed to thee, full of blessings, that they may reflect over its verses, and that those gifted with understanding may take heed. Sayings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. 
الماهر بالقرآن مع السفرة الكرام البررة والذي يقرأ القرآن ويتتعتع فيه وهو عليه شاق له أجران The Holy Prophet peace be upon him stated One who is skilled in the recitation of the Holy Quran is associated with the noble, upright, recording angels. And he who falters when he recites the Quran and finds it difficult for him will have a double reward. Alhamdulillah, it's again beautiful to hear the words of the Holy Quran. This is what gets our energy going. It's the words of Allah that really, really blesses all of our gatherings. So Adnan Sahib, day two, this is the longest day, this is the busiest day, this is where even the ones that come late don't want to miss Saturday. Everyone has arrived now for the most part. It's an exciting day and uh, we can quickly have a recap of yesterday, what happened, and then we can give uh, viewers a taste, just a glimpse of what they should expect for the rest of the day as well. Yes, absolutely. As you have heard the theme of the Quran and Kareem, and the theme of the year of the Quran and Kareem has been related to the Quran and Kareem. And some of the other stories will be related to this topic, but from God's sake, the day of the day of the day, we have been able to meet with the Quran and Kareem, and some of the other people who have been able to meet with the Quran and Kareem, and some of the other people who have been able to meet with the Quran and Kareem. And if we look at the special highlights of the Quran and Kareem, حضور انور عید اللہ تعالیٰ بن صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کا جو پیغام تھا جماعت احمدی امریکہ کے لیے وہ سب سے زیادہ اہمیت کا حامل ہے جس میں حضور نے ہمیں اس بات کی طرف توجہ دلائی کہ خدا کے بھی حقوق ادا کریں اور اپنے جو انسان ہیں ان کو بھی حقوق ادا کریں اور جو آپس کے تعلقات ہیں اس میں پیار اور محبت کی جھلک جو ہے ہمیں نظر آنی چاہیے اور اسی طرح آپ نے یہ بھی فرمایا کہ جماعت احمدی امریکہ کو جو ہے اپنی تبلیغ کی کاوشوں کو مزید بڑھانے کی ضرورت ہے تاکہ جیسے پہلے مبلغین نے تبلیغ کے میدان میں کامیابیاں حاصل کی آج کے لوگ بھی جو ہیں اسی طرح جماعت احمدیہ کے جو فولڈ ہے اس میں شامل ہوں اور یہ مین پیغام تھا حضور انور کے جو جو پیغام تھا الحمدللہ we were indeed lucky because the day started off with all احمدیس around the whole world do not want to miss the Friday sermon of the خلیف المسیح and we didn't want to miss that too so um, it comes early in the United States for those who may not know but also we had a replay of it at Jalsa so we started off with that Friday sermon and of course Friday here too means we had our own Friday sermon to begin um, the, the energy of Jalsa Salana we had a flag hoisting we talked about the importance of our identity as Ahmadi Muslims and we talked about the United States flag which was also hoist along with the flag of um, Islam Ahmadiyya but you highlighted the message from Hazrat Khalif Tul Masih and in Amir Saab's opening remarks, he talked about how, how much responsibility we have when we receive these messages from Huzur. It's not just for that day. It's for many other years to come for us to keep following those guidelines. He talked about spreading the message of Islam Ahmadiyya. That's our responsibility because the Khalif al Masih has drawn the attention of USA Jamaat and by default to the whole world as well to, to continue the mission of the Promised Messiah that's also part of what this Jalsa is about. So, so along with the Friday sermon and again with the message from Huzur, that means we receive two very detailed messages from the Khalif al Masih, which, which makes it a great start for us. And then we had, of course, speeches um, along with that. Yes, absolutely. And God has also been given a gift of God. There was a gift of love and love and love. There was a gift of love and love and love. There was a gift of love and love and love. There was a gift of love and love and love. اس کا ذکر کیا گیا تھا پھر جو ہے آئیلی معاملات میں جو آج کل مشکلات در پیش آ رہی ہیں اس کا ذکر کیا گیا تھا کہ کیسے اس پر جو ہے وہ قابو پایا جا سکتا ہے تو بڑے ہی اچھے اور معلوماتی نکات جو ہے وہ بیان کیے گئے تھے جو ان پر اگر ہم عمل کیا کریں تو اپنی یہ کامیاب آئیلی زندگی جو ہے وہ گزار سکتے ہیں اور یہی جلسہ سلانہ کا مقصد ہے کہ ہمیں بار بار اس بات کی آدھیانی کروائی جاتی ہے کہ ہم کون ہیں ہمارے مقاصد کیا ہیں اور کس طرح ہم ان کو جو ہے وہ پورا کر سکتے ہیں آف کورس آف کورس اور یہ جو بہتی 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 connects us all is Khilafat of course people traveling from far and wide and we saw that yesterday from across the United States and people coming from the West Coast we're talking about flight of over five six hours some people drive 17 hours 18 hours to come here but the, the speeches that we heard Al Ghafoor Allah being Al Ghafoor the speaker of Fahim Yunus Qureshi Sahib reminded us that when we see these attributes of Allah it also teaches us what do we have to do 
in, in treating one another, in being kind to one another, in being forgiving to one another. That, that was the essence of the message that, that he delivered to us. And the second speech, like you said, Adnan uh, Bali Sahib, it reminded us of our responsibilities in our marriages. Uh, Hassan Khan Sahib was the third speaker. He talked about after 10 years of marriage, how does one remain best friends with their spouse? And again, you can watch all of these speeches again on our YouTube channel. And that's MTA USA on YouTube. You can go back if you haven't watched it, if you missed yesterday, but you don't want to miss today. Of all the speeches that were delivered in a beautiful manner here at Jalsa Salana and other things that we showed you, and we'll have more of those as well. Yes, in the case of the Jalsa Salana, it's a very important part of the Jalsa Salana. We also saw the Jalsa Salana from our own viewers. We came from the Jalsa Salana from the Jalsa Salana. اور جو ان کے جذبات تھے کہ کیسے وہ جلسے سے استفادہ کر رہے ہیں وہ ہم اپنے ناظرین کی خدمت میں پیش کرنے ہم نے پیش کیے اور نہ صرف امریکہ بھر سے لوگ آئے بلکہ کل میری ایک دوست سے ملاقات ہو رہی تھی وہ اسٹریلیا سے آئے تھے تو اتنی دور سے بھی دنیا کے دوسرے کنارے سے بھی لوگ جلسہ سلانہ کی برکات سے استفادہ کرنے کے لیے جو ہے وہ آئے ہیں اور پھر ہم نے اپنے ناظرین کے لیے نمائش بھی دکھائی جو لنگر خانے کا انتظام تھا وہ بھی ہم نے دکھایا اور مختلف ڈپارٹمنٹس کے جو افسران تھے ان سے ملاقات ہوئی کہ سارے جو انتظام ہے اس کو چلانے کے لیے کس قدر رضاکار جو ہیں وہ درکار ہوتے ہیں اور کیسے یہ جلسہ سلانہ جو ہے گزشتہ کو جلسہ سلانہ سے مختلف ہے کیونکہ کووٹ کی وجہ سے کئی پابندیاں تھیں گزشتہ سالوں میں لیکن اس وقت اس سال جو ہے وہ ایسا سچ کوئی پابندیاں نہیں ہیں اس لیے افسر صاحب جلسہ سلانہ نے ہمیں بتایا کہ وہ پہلے سے زیادہ مہمانان کی توقع اس سال جو ہے وہ کر رہی ہیں Absolutely and we know that some of you might have wanted to be here with us even within the United States you may not have had the opportunity this year so we will try here from the MTA studios and other parts of Jalsa we have exhibitions that show the activities of humanity first across the whole world and within the United States we have bookstalls that show us the, the latest books that have been printed and are able for sale uh, available for sale and there are some that are they giving out for free as well so there's many other parts of Jalsa Salana uh, along with the speeches and the food and the brotherhood we of course can't show you everything but we will try our best uh, to show you as much as we can yesterday you heard some interviews uh, from people that have traveled even from other countries aside from the United States um, people from the Gambia which is you know where I'm from originally I, I met a friend who came and visited purposely for Jalsa and he'll be going back after Jalsa and, and Adnan Bali Saab mentioned that somebody came from Australia so you can see that this is also taking a, a another beautiful form of international jalsa in our own way uh, but the united states just i like to say it's as international as it gets because again the, the distances that people travel uh, for people who have not been to the united states they may not understand those distances but this is a huge country and to have one jalsa on this side of the country can be challenging for some so کل ایک دوست سے بات ہو رہی تھی انہوں نے بتایا کہ وہ سولہ گھنٹے جو ہے وہ ڈرائیو کر کے یہاں آئے ہیں تو یہ سولہ گھنٹے تو یورپ میں تقریباً آپ سارا یورپ ہی اتنے وقت میں جمع پھر دیں گے تو اس سے پتہ چلتا ہے کہ فاصلے کس قدر زیادہ ہیں اور بعض جو ہے لمبی پانچ پانچ چھ چھ گھنٹے کی فلائٹس جو ہیں وہ لے کے آئے ہیں تو امریکہ ایک وسیع ملک ہے اس لیے یہاں آنا اکٹھے ہونا ایک جگہ پہ یہ بھی ایک بہت بڑا چیلنج ہوتا ہے لیکن اشاق احمدیت جو ہیں خلافت کے جو پروانے ہیں اور عزت اقدس مسیح محمد علیہ السلام کی جماعت کے جو افراد ہیں یہ جو معمولی دقتیں ہیں اس کی پرواہ نہ کرتے ہوئے جلسہ سلانہ کی برکات سے استفادہ کرنے کے لیے آتے ہیں اور یہی اس کا مقصد ہے کہ ہم بار بار آپس میں ملے باہی چارہ بھی ہے اس میں ترقی ہے اور یہی عزت مسیح محمد علیہ السلام نے جلسے کا مقصد بھی بیان کیا ہے کہ آپس کے تعلقات میں بہتری آئے خدا تعالیٰ کے ساتھ جو ہے تمہارا تعلق مضبوط ہو اور آخرت کے لیے بھی جو ہے انسان تیاری کر سکے یس اندر اسپیشل تھنگ اباؤٹ جلسہ سالانہ آن سیٹرڈے از دا لیڈیز لجنا دے ہیو دیئر اون سیشن وچ گوز سائڈ بائی سائڈ ود دا مین سیشن سو دے آر ایکسائٹیڈ لکنگ فور ٹو دیئر گریٹ اسپیچز ایز ویل اینڈ ول گیو یو سم انویژننگ ان ٹو وٹ ول بی کمنگ اپ ٹو ایز ویل بٹ Um, before we come back into the studio, we'll give you a little break with a short video that we've prepared for you, and we'll have you right back here to tell you about the rest of the day. سمیٹے برکتے اس کی 
करे दीदार जलसे का समेटे बरकते उसकी करे दीदार जलसे का जहर किस्मत पलट आया विशाले यार का मौसम सलाम अलैकुम माय नेम इज हाशिम सलमान शेख आई एम फ्रॉम फिनिक्स टू मॉस इन एरिजोना एक्चुअली बॉन्चिंग एट अ लॉट ऑफ प्लेसेस I am doing Spanish tests, um, water duty, and I am also helping out at the Bleak Center. Water duty has been fun. I've got to spend time with my friends, but at the same time, I'm helping out people by give, just giving them water simply. When I'm doing my work, I feel happy. I always give uh, the person I'm giving water a smile. <laughs> जमालो हुसने कुरआन नूर दोली कान कैन ट्रांसफॉर्म अस बाय अस रियलाइजिंग आई थिंक वन इंपोर्टेंट थिंग दैट इट इज एक्चुअली लिटरली अल्लाह अलमारी दैट स्पीकिंग टू अस एंड इफ वी हैव दैट माइंड सेट देन होली कुरआन कैन हैव अ ग्रेट इफेक्ट ऑन अस इफ वी कम अक्रॉस पीपल इन आवर लाइव्स दैट आर मोर नॉलेजेबल देन अस और हैव हैव सम टाइप ऑफ सक्सेस then of course we lend ear to them we want to listen to what they say we go quiet around them because they have that experience they have that success but if allah almighty is all knowing he's all knowledgeable and all power then that is the being that we need to listen to more than anything else so the holy quran can transform us by being that source of guidance if we realize that that guidance is actually from the creator of the heavens and the universe it's from the most powerful thing that could possibly exist kalam e पाके नूर फुल है जो सब नूरों से अजला sallallahu alaihi wasallam says verily allah almighty will raise the status of a righteous servant in paradise and they will say oh lord what is this essentially saying we're dead how can our stature be raised and allah taala will say this is due to your child seeking forgiveness for you the man who wasted his life away chasing money should do charity rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says charity extinguishes sin just like water extinguishes fire and if here there is a youth out there who's worried about their private life getting leaked on social media and their image getting destroyed stop worrying about your image in front of your friends think of what is your image in front of allah taala rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said show mercy and you will be shown mercy forgive and allah will forgive you but is that what we're doing nure furqa सब नूरों से अजला निकला अलैकुम वरहमतुल्लाह व बरकातहु वेलकम बैक टू आवर जलसा सलाना यूएसए स्टूडियोस Again today we're going to have another discussion and it's a very interesting discussion because as you see this beautiful Jalsa Salana set up you can imagine there's a lot of work that goes behind it and it's all in line exactly with what has started with by the hands of the promised Messiah Allah himself 
when he began Jalsa Salaam in Qadiyan, when only 75 people joined. Since then, we have seen leaps and bounds of improvements and changes. And that's exactly what we want to see today here in the United States of America. What are things that we're doing in terms of the construction side of things? How are things set up? How are these, you know, these halls put together, the banners and the carpets? And so many elements are there. And I think a lot of the viewers are very interested to know more about what, is, what goes behind the scenes and what kind of people are the ones working and volunteering. Because you know, it may be assumed in America we have, we're just hiring everybody for everything. But that's not the case. There's a volunteer service here. Everybody is stepping forward, sometimes months, sometimes an entire year in advance. And that's exactly the beauty of this Jalsa Sulana. And so I'm, uh, mashallah, joined in the studio today with uh, two of our esteemed uh, volunteers for the Jalsa Sulana. We have Ibrahim Chaudhry Sahib and Fakhar Sahib. Both are working uh, behind the scenes for, for a very long time. Um, either boots on the ground or even just planning. There's so much that goes involved in terms of the planning, um, the stages of how we're going to get to this particular point. And so that's what we're going to ask them today, inshallah ta'ala. If you can start off with just introducing what are some of the things that, you, that go involved in the work that you're doing or the work that you're doing, just so that the audience can understand, you know, what are the different roles that you oversee. So I'll start with Ibrahim Chalizah. <laughs> So, you know, my role basically entails the construction of the three Jalsa Gahs that we have. So the men's Jalsa Gah, the women's Jalsa Gah, and children's Jalsa Gah. And what that means is uh, I'm responsible to be really the implementation of the, all the planning that's done to put the Jalsa together. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, Murabi Sab, that, you know, this, this process starts much earlier, yeah. uh, sometimes months in advance, talking to the vendors, um, some of the rentals that we have to do. And uh, when all of that has been done, then it, our team has to come here on, um, you know, just two, three days before and make sure that we can get the process going. And uh, and everything that you see here, basically from um, the carpet, sure. the lines, the uh, chairs, the, the stage, the banners, the... Uh, all the setup, physical setup that sure. you see inside the Jal Saga, that's so what we Before do. we get into that, before we get asked for Sahib, you said two, three days. Is it not, we don't get this facility months in advance? No, we, <laughs> we basically get this uh, Tuesday, that's when we get full access to it, meaning our volunteers... Meaning there's nothing it. set up, it's, no. it's bare bones. Right, and right. And we have to build it up all, mashallah. Correct, okay. Correct. So, Fakhar Sahib, please tell us what goes involved since Tuesday or even long before that in terms of the planning and the work that goes involved. So, the task that we are assigned uh, to serve the guests of Promised Messiah is the, is the management of the main pandal, men's pandal. So, whatever Ibrahim Sahib's team set up, uh, we are supposed to take care of that, maintain that during the Jalsa Salana uh, three days. So that includes uh, the cleanliness of the carpet, cleanliness of the entire Jalsa Slana, making sure that shoes are arranged uh, properly. And another task that our team is assigned to is the planning of the electrical system, temporary electrical system of the Jalsa Slana. Lot of equipment, uh, as you see, we are sitting here, lot of these uh, TVs and cameras and all what not. Uh, all the broadcast equipment needs power to be uh, to be in the working condition. So the electrical so, work. Uh, electrical work. So what we do is we reach out to all the departments that are working here, get their electrical uh, requirement, requirements, <clears throat> make sure that uh, we have a plan set up, and then we share up that plan, the drawings, Beautiful. with the with the facility. And with the help of their electricians, we provide uh, all the electricity requirement that is needed for the Jalsa Salana. And these are not all the volunteers. Maybe uh, you would see they are not professional electricians or sure. professional <laughs> um, uh, cleaner, cleaning staff. They are doctors. They are engineers. They are uh, professionals in whatever. And, and, and they are kind of on top of their professional um, uh, uh, journey. So they, they leave everything behind and come here and uh, uh, offer l f at least four or five days in the Dasa Slana. But before that, planning start at least th <clears throat> three months ahead of us. So that's a beautiful point that you mentioned, in fact. 
imagine again somebody's at the top of their field professionally. Yeah. Yes. But when it comes to Khilafat, when it comes to Jalsa Salam, when it comes to Ahmadiyyad, that doesn't matter. When you get here, you are a volunteer like yes. everybody else. So as you mentioned cleanliness, I can imagine there are a number of people who are in the bathrooms cleaning them or helping yeah. to you know, keep them maintained. So that's why it's good for our viewers to understand that the same spirit of Ahmadiyya that we see in other places in other countries, it's seen here in America too, alhamdulillah. And that is exactly how powerful the message of the Promise of Sai and how Khilafat unites us. Because at the end of the day, it is people from you know, far, you know, the, even the distances alone. I can imagine your planning starts months in advance and it starts from very diverse places. Jeez. As was mentioned yesterday in one of the Jeez. interviews, he said one, one of the people on his team is in Seattle, was five, you know, 3,000 miles away in one direction. Another team member is in Los Angeles, another 3,000 miles away, and the planning is happening. So, Ibrahim Joseph, I was just thinking about the same aspect. You are, your team is boots on the ground. These are, are these, again, are they professionals? Are they khudam? Are they, you know, young, you know, resilient workers? You know, what is, give us a picture of what kind of people come with the boots on the ground and actually right. pick up chairs and move them and set them up. And just right. share a little bit about that as well. No, Jazakallah, I think so. We, you know, we tend, try to bring at least 40 to 50 volunteers Tuesday night to help with the setup arrangements here. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, we have three different halls. And so each, di each hall is actually managed by Nazim, who oversees the upkeep, bringing of that hall. And I just give you a story, I think just to mention that is that, you know, a person who's our Nazim for men's hall, you know, when I reached out to him this year, he's an extremely busy person, bringing, he had, you know, he had three businesses. But when I spoke to him, I said, you know, would you be willing to come and be part of the construction team? You know, he immediately responded and I think that is, that was the spirit of sacrifice and also serving the guests of Promised Messiah alayhi salam. And not only that, that understanding that this is a divine um, system of, you know, the Jalsa that we was established by Hazrat Musim Islam that you don't want to be, you don't want to miss out. Exactly. And then, and, um, and that's something that, mashallah, and the work that entails, you know, it's picking up chairs, it's putting down salat lines, it's, uh, uh, you know, doing things that are just the heavy lifting and sometimes, you know, it doesn't, t doesn't matter, uh, you know, which background you come from. Sure. You're there to just serve the guests of Promised Messiah Islam to reap the blessings of Allah. And we see that spirit, alhamdulillah, in our volunteers. And as you mentioned, the range, the age of the volunteers, it's, it's quite interesting actually because we have some very young volunteers that we bring. Uh, that they How learned. young? How young do they I go? would say as close to some older atfal sometimes, Ten they're there to help out. And as far as, you know, someone who's maybe in their late 30s, early 40s would be there helping us out. Uh, and uh, they're there. And what kind of professions? You know, businessman. You mentioned for example. Um, all sorts of professions. I think uh, you know we have someone who was a medical student who was taking time off, who's going into medical field. He was, you know, he's Amazing. here. He's someone else's. Um, you know, if I could think of, I think all range of professions we can see that we see in our in our volunteer base, and some are technical, non-technical. Some are, you know, so. This is just the blessing of the Jamaat of Promised Messiah that we see under the hand of Khalifatul Masih that you know they're ready to serve. Absolutely. And uh, that Khilafat is what unites us. We yeah. come here and they all are here for that purpose. And uh, Alhamdulillah, we see that spirit That throughout. reminds me in fact of a mayor who you know visited USA, Jalsa Salana. And when he came back and shared his impressions, he said, I, they took me to the Langar Khana. Mm. He said, and you know, we walked around and I saw people cutting onions and I saw people, you know, you know, it's very right. hard. Langar Khan is one of those very difficult right. places. And he said, then I started asking them what professions they are. He said, among them, they were doctors, they were engineers, they were lawyers, and they're sitting there cutting onions. He said, that was inspirational for me. And I said, that's exactly the message of the Promised Messiah. That's exactly what we are supposed to do here. There's so many conferences that happen, I'm sure for your businesses and different work-wise. We go to conferences, but this is a spiritual conference, yeah. a spiritual convention. So as you mentioned earlier as well, in terms of electrical work, for example, or in terms of you know what the wide range of work that you do, the people that you're working with, how do you court, how do you find them? How do you find volunteers, for example? So, actually, to summarize all that, we start our work with requesting prayers from Hazur Abdullah Taala bin Asri Aziz. Every week uh, there is a, we, we write letters to Hazur, we offer two nawafil for the success of the Jalsa Slana. So 
depending on the uh, if you add a professional person to the work it adds quality to the work or definitely of so for example i would uh, i would like to mention one of our volunteers he was having trouble uh, getting time off and he already took a lot of time off and he was telling me that no there is no chance that I'm, my employer gonna uh, let me go for jalsa mm-hmm. but i told him okay keep praying yes ma'am. and inshallah uh, something will come up and and once he asked for the time off his employer was more than happy to give him the time off Allah, so this is uh, this is the thing i would like to um, highlight here is that everything what we do, we do here is is not uh, our hands that are doing is is the prayers of huzur ayyadullah taala and and the selfless work of the uh, the volunteers that uh, brings up this beautiful jalsa salana and then people look at that and think that okay this is amazing but right. but there is lot of prayers behind that absolutely absolutely no absolutely in fact uh, i was going to ask you brain joyce were there any difficulties that you may have faced in the setup you know with the boots on the ground i'm sure there's a lot of you know ji trinkets that appear that are very difficult challenges so. right so by the grace of allah i think one thing that what what we got this year we had a brand new carpet installed in the men's jalsa ga and that brought up a new challenge we realized that the carpet that was installed at uh it was nothing would nothing would stick on it so typically we would put our salat lines with some sort of a tape so we could put it down so you know there's or coordination and it's facing the qibla so now this prince presented a new challenge and something that we didn't anticipate we had been think of and uh we tried probably every single type of tape out there <laughs> to see that if anything would stick on that carpet and nothing did and uh, but this is what you know what fakhr sahab is saying uh, i would completely echo the point that um you know this is the work of allah taala and we see that with that passion with that rigor that um, the volunteers were there and you know each were each trying to figure out a, a solution what we can do and they came up with a very unique right. idea putting up a string alhamdulillah you know tying it underneath so that was something that happened and i i hopefully you know that is uh, working well so far and not only that you know we see that uh, just taking up a challenge of what sure. what's out there and i think uh, the volunteers really displayed that as well with that spirit jazakallah so much and and you know really this is a summary of it that at the end of the day we see so many people who are dedicated who are committed and it, it is it is khilafat that unites us and that is what differentiates us from any other muslim organization in this world today it brings us together it doesn't matter what country we're in right we're in america and yet we have khudam who are laying out carpets and cleaning the bathrooms and you know whatever it may be and these are the same people who if i went to united kingdom or i went to bangladesh they would be doing the same thing and that's the beauty of the spirit of khilafat and, and how it transcends borders right. it it goes past all these places and and it makes us exactly to where we need to be today and so again this is all connected to the time of the promised messiah alayhi salam when he established jalsa salana because jalsa salana is has many goals you know the spiritual upliftment the brotherhood the the ways to to train us and and all of the things that we've heard already today in today's interviews is that it's just powerful how these are ways that our kids get involved from a very early age as he mentioned that you know you could be a tifl and starting to come and set up things but that adds character it adds so much to the to the to the portfolio of a of a upbringing that when we talk about tarbiyat and so many other things these are all the hidden tarbiyat that's happening when our kids are standing outside in the in the in the heat of the humid humidity and standing you know to guard our flag for example simply standing there for hours upon hours upon hours that is tarbiyat that is when you train somebody to worth standing there for the for for dedication sometimes there's menial tasks somebody sitting in a corner in a random part of this jalsa salon no air condition sitting outside on security but he's there they're there passionately and as we're walking around we see this constantly that they're you know they're doing this and that's actually I was going to ask you Ibrahim Chaudhry sir any point that you saw your volunteers who you know they stepped up they wanted to do something even more pro- proactively sometimes like you said well there are different things you know i would say that we were we were uh, th- have we were going to 
we had 90% chance of rain and actually that's one thing that I also wanted to just quickly mention is that we were preparing for that and uh, you know last year we had some flooding and we, we wanted to make sure and this year we were doing proactively and I sent out a message to the volunteers that be on standby and they were coming back to me. They were asking me that um, what, what they can, um, you know, w tell us when we are ready. And one other thing that, that comes to mind is, um, you know, when last night after we were done, it was late at night after namaz, um, you know, volunteers came up to me and asked me, can we stay back and make sure these salat lines are fixed? And staying till late as 12.30, 1 in the morning to make sure the Jalsa Gal was ready to go. Uh, for the proceedings. Alhamdulillah. So, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah so much to both of you. See, that's exactly why we want all the audience to join us in this conversation. Many of you are tuning in right now. So come on and, and tune in and, and you know go to our social media handles, Muslim TV USA or Jalsa Connect USA and try to have that engagement. And as you do that, we'll inshallah ta'ala take a break and we'll come back to the social media uh, side of things and see the different comments and pictures and so many beautiful things that you are all sharing. So keep it up, and inshallah, ta'ala, we'll be right back very soon. Stay tuned. Basically, what we do with exterior security is just to make sure that everyone inside of the Jalsa is safe. Right? So we have strategic positions throughout the site that we try to man, we make sure that we have personnel at each and every entrance to the facility. So we have a lot of people from different parts of the country who are coming to serve under our department. Some of them are flying in, some of them are driving for over 10 to 15 hours coming in. <laughs> There's nothing better, bro. There's nothing better to do at this time than serving the Jamaat and the Promised Messiah of Islam. One thing that we're constantly reminded is that the people you serve at Jalsa are the guests of the Promised Messiah. And there's no greater honor than serving the guests of the Promised Messiah of Islam. Beauty and Perfection of the Holy Qur'an I call Allah to witness that the Holy Qur'an is a rare pearl. Its outside is light and its inside is light, and its above is light, and its below is light, and there is light in every word of it. It is a spiritual garden whose clustered fruits are within easy reach and through which streams flow. Every fruit of good fortune is found in it, and every torch is lit from it. Its light has penetrated to my heart, and I could not have acquired it by any other means. And Allah is my witness that if there had been no Qur'an, I would have found no delight in life. I found that its beauty exceeds that of a hundred thousand Josephs. I incline towards it with a great inclination and drink it into my heart. It has nurtured me as an embryo is nurtured, and it has a wonderful effect on my heart. My self is lost in its beauty. It has been disclosed to me in a vision that the garden of holiness is irrigated by the water of the Qur'an, which is a surging ocean of the water of life. He who drinks from it comes to life. Indeed, he brings others to life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to our MTA USA studios. So as Imam Saab mentioned, we've been collecting and curating all of your Jolsa moments through the hashtag Jolsa USA um, on our handles Jolsa Connect USA. And so we have a few curations that we'd like to share with you of people that have just been enjoying all of the auspicious occasion of Jolsa and the happy moments that they've, they've been enjoying together. Um, so the first one is a video um, from Muslim scientist. Um, and the video goes, Jolsa Joyride, say a little prayer for the volunteers driving all day in the heat. Um, as you know, the volunteers have been working tirelessly to transport people um, from the various locations, from the parking lot, you know, elderly guests. Um, the volunteers are working tirelessly in this Pennsylvania humid weather um, and just working tirelessly to make sure that everyone is taken, taken care for and accounted for. Um, 
So you can see, I think uh, he's just enjoying a bit of a he's enjoying a bit of a ride through uh, Pennsylvania. It seems on a little golf cart. You'll see many golf carts around in Jolsa Solana. Uh, it's one of the the common sights is just a golf cart um, outside and transporting our, our wonderful guests um, through through the parking lots and various facilities to make sure that everyone gets to Jolsa on time and is taken care of, and no one has to trek too far uh, in the sort of humidity of Pennsylvania weather. Um, on the next, on the next uh, post we're looking at, um, it's also from Muslim scientists, it goes spiritually home. And I think that's a wonderful sort of thematic message about what Jolsa means to every single person. It is our spiritual home to be with each other, to be with the guests of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam, under one, under one flag, under one banner, and under one roof. Um, that's the sort of, I think, the community that we all enjoy together. On the next post we have from Saima Sheikh Saiba. She goes, first day, hashtag Jolsa USA ended. Can't go to Jolsa without having some mango kulfi. And I think that itself is just speaks about one of the other things that you'll often see at Jolsa Solana. It is a kulfi. And obviously the stalls um, that are that, that have been set up, you can easily get a kulfi, enjoy it with your peers, you know, treat treat one each other, send us a post on Jolsa Connect USA, um, and continue sharing those those moments with us. Our next post is something that has was doing that the Jamaat was doing yesterday, and this is from our North Jersey chapter. Um, it says, "Mashallah, North Jersey Khadam taking part in the Jolsa Cares Initiative during USA Jolsa Salon in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania." And this is, of course, the public affairs initiative of Jolsa Cares, working with the city of Harrisburg to make sure that the local community is supported by the efforts of Jolsa Salon. So there was a blood drive, there was cleanup initiatives with the mayor of Harrisburg, um, with with our secretary of public affairs, Amjad Mahmood Khan Sahib, leading those efforts, and that's a wonderful sight to see about just how tirelessly and hardworking our Khudam have been in terms of working in this hot, humid weather, uh, but also making sure that the local community is supported by the efforts of Jalsa. And finally, we have uh, Wuji Mirza Sahib, who tweets about, it is not the quantity of our sins that matters, rather it is the quality of our repentance. And that was the thematic sort of uh, message that Fahim Yunus Qureshi Sahib uh, sort of really ushered home. Um, and, and he continues that, although thought-provoking, powerful, and timely needed speech about Al-Ghafur, our most forgiving God. And that was the theme of the speech yesterday. And I think there are many speeches that are we, we've recorded, and they're on our sort of MTA USA Studios YouTube page. So if you've missed a speech, you can log on there and, and watch all the action from yesterday's speech as well, in addition to the speeches to come in the sessions today. So as I mentioned, please be sure to connect through us using the hashtag Jolsa USA in all of our channels, Jolsa Connect USA, and we'll be collecting those moments throughout the day and sharing them with you. So please be sure to engage. And now we'll go back over to Muhammad Ahmed Chaudhry Saib, who is with our Ahmadiyya Muslim scientists. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. We're in, we're in the studio and you just heard some great tweets from Mango Kulfis to quotes from the three amazing speeches that were yesterday as we kick off day two of U.S. JOSA. I am pleased to share the next session, which is the Association of Amdia Muslim Scientists, which was established in 1995, and their mission is to lead the next Islamic golden age of science and technology. And the vision is to produce 100 of the salams. And we have three members of the association here with us today who will share a little bit more about that. First, we have Dr. Sohail Hussein, who is, who is the president of the association. He's the Chambers Okamura Professor and Chief of Pediatrics and Gastroenterology. I hope I got the, that right. And we have Dr. Athar Malik, who is from Boston, and he's the Kennison Assistant Professor of Neuroscience and Neurosurgery at Brown University. And we have Asif Jamil, who is from Boston, who's an instructor in uh, psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School, also in Boston. So we have Boston, we have Stanford, we have everyone here. Uh, let's start with you, Do Dr. Hussein. Share a little bit about why is the, does this association exist and what, what inspires you? The reason we exist as an association is simply because of Khilafat. All of the directives of Huzur comprise our mission, the mission that you just read out to lead the next Islamic golden age of science and technology. The vision towards 100 of the Salams is also a directive of the Khulafa and everything that we do in terms of activities 
are based on instructions of the Khalifa. So what is what is the next golden age of science and technology and how would you lead that? Let's look at the first golden age, which was a time when Muslims in the 9th, 10th, all the way up to the 13th century, not only led but created various fields of science, learning, the acquisition of knowledge was central uh, to uh, their core. And that is our is that legacy. Like, is that like algebra and coffee even, I think? Uh, coffee for sure, <laughs> to keep awake <laughs> Which I today. Need more. Yes. <laughs> um, algebra, to do the math that we do. Chemistry, to wow. create all the compounds that we uh, really? use as a basis for the 21st century technologies. Yeah. And so that's our uh, legacy. First golden age. And we as Amelie Muslims believe that in the latter days, which is today, uh, that there would be a second golden age led by Amelie Muslims. And that golden age would be as or bigger than the first golden age. So imagine what you saw a century ago and now multiply that. That's fascinating and and uh, we'll come back to what is the um, the vision but we'll come to you um, dr. Malik recently during Hazur's blessed visit I mean the first leg of that visit was in Zion there was a lot of great things that happened there but including there was a, a group meeting of the of the of the association and tell us about that meeting and uh, what what do you recall from that and what inspired you from that meeting? We have a little bit of, we've all seen a little bit of the clips, but perhaps you can share a little bit that we haven't seen. Jazakallah, absolutely. Uh, we had an incredible opportunity in Zion, Illinois, to meet with Hazrat Khibut al Ayatollah uh, Talab Minister Laziz. Both the men's and women's scientist associations were able to meet with beloved Hazur, and we were able to uh, present to Hazur. Uh, a little bit of uh, the work that we have been doing. Like uh, what? Uh, as associations, as well as individuals, we shared some of the research that we were doing with Hazur. Give me an example of one. So, for example, I shared with Hazur my desire to study disorders of consciousness and better understand the brain circuits that are perturbed when patients have brain injury and lose consciousness. Uh, and my interest in um, re, uh, reactivating the brain circuits that would enable recovery in that condition. So we were I'm able to pretend like I understood all of that, yeah. and then just give you a, a nod. Zaka, <laughs> <laughs> But that's just an example. In right. Mashla, there's a broad array of research being done by the members of the Jamaat, and uh, we also had the opportunity to learn from Hazur. Uh, what we need to be focusing on. So what I took away from that meeting uh, were a few points. One, Hazur ex expects us to excel in our chosen fields. Two, Hazur desires us to pursue fields that will benefit mankind. And three, that as an organization, we should strive to really create one or two of the Salams or equivalents in the near future. Uh, so that's on, on really, the second part, I know you guys yeah. uh, also presented on the technology <laughs> side, which is more along more, more along battery technology. So it's a wider array of presentations. But real quick before we go, uh, Dr. Malik, to tell us what is an MD PhD? I think it's Mutfud for short. That's right. That's right. So Mashallah, our association comprises of members with distinct backgrounds. Some are engineers. Some are physicians. Some are uh, PhD scientists and uh, MD PhDs like myself have pursued medicine as well as science with the goal of doing research that can benefit our patients. So Alhamdulillah that's just one example of the broad array of uh, backgrounds that are That is a pretty have. high bar though from what I understand. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And we have a few MD PhDs in the Jamaat. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. great. We'll go to um, Asif Jamil Saab. Uh, Asif, I, uh, can you you recently, in order to achieve all these things, from what I understand, in most organizations, you have to meet, you have to come together, share research, share ideas, perhaps collaborate. And you just had an event in Orlando, Florida, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, to, um, to enable that. Uh, what did you achieve there? Yeah, yeah, so uh, every year our organization tries to get together and we hold um, we hold an event called the Quran and Science Symposium. 
and uh, this year, inshallah, mashallah, we had the 10th uh, Quran and Science Symposium. And uh, one unique thing that we did this year was to combine it with the Ahmadiyya Medical Association. And uh, our objective there was to really highlight the excellence in our Jamaat in terms of science, medicine, technology. And, uh, and so in that way, we, we had a very diverse program. We had uh, speakers who, who talked a lot about um, some of the topics uh, of Khalifa Rabi in his book, uh, Revelation, Rationality, Knowledge, and Truth. Um, so, for example, topics about um, creation of life, um, evolution, um, a lot of these topics that, uh, you know, today a lot of scientists um, are still trying to find the answers for. And, uh, so you're connecting all the research, which I pretended to understand that they're doing, back to the Quran as well, exactly. which will, I assume, lead to the next golden age of leveraging um, what's already in the Quran and enabling it through technology? Am I, am I connecting the dots or am I missing it? You're absolutely right. In 2013, uh, 10 years ago, Khalifa al Masih, again, coming back to why we exist, it's because of Khilafat. Yeah. Khalifa al Masih, uh, Ayyidullah Ta'ala bin Ashil Aziz, sent us a letter in which he outlined that the early Muslims, that first golden age, excelled because they turned to the Holy Quran. Then the Muslims declined because they forgot the study of the Holy Quran. And wow. it is incumbent upon us today to seize again the study of the Holy Quran to uh, enact that second golden age. That's, a, that's incredible in how connecting the dots uh, in doing this. Now, we, one of your visions, and which I believe was given by Hazur, is to have at minimum a hundred of the Salams. Right now, we've had one uh, in the last 50 years. Um, what is the path towards that, and what can I do? Although I would ask for some scrubs at the end of this uh, session uh, to be more medi medically inclined, but what can I do as a student, as a mother, as a father, to place my child on a path towards becoming an Abdus Salam? I'm so glad you asked, because the message that we want to convey to every student who's uh, listening, watching today, is that if you have an interest in science, STEM, technology, then we want you, we want you to be part of that 100 of the salons. We will help you. We'll give you the networking, we'll give you the guidance, join the organizations uh, that we belong to. And we want you to lead the second Islamic golden age. And we want you to be a helper of Khilafat in so doing. So the message is, Get connected uh, with us if you have an interest in science and technology and aspire to be the best. That's, that's an incredible story and I hope every student, every parent can connect and become and be on a path to becoming the next Abdus Salaam, to be a part of leading the next golden age of science and technology. Um, Jazakallah for all three of you for joining us. Jazakallah for all that you're doing in your research and enabling at the best universities the United States has to offer and serving the Jamaat in such an incredible way. Jazakallah. We, you just heard from the Association of Amdiya Muslim Scientists. They are an incredible or, or organization that has even a, a tremendous vision and mission and we hope that each of you can join them and, in, and at least pray for them if not do more with them. With this we will be going over to our break and then to the session next. Thank you for joining us. So Allah Ta'ala has mentioned in Surah Al-Imran, وَأَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا جَمِيعًا is a loves which is uh, to me of utmost importance here. Because Allah Ta'ala says that we want to hold on to the rope of Allah Ta'ala collectively as a group. So spirituality cannot be achieved all by ourselves. What Allah Ta'ala wants us to do is to come together as a united uh, group and hold on to the rope of Allah Ta'ala all together. So to me, if I need to, 
you know, spiritually up- uplift myself and I want to strengthen my connection with Allah Ta'ala and, and enhance my spirituality, I need to do that in a, in, in, in a group. Uh, and that's what Jalsa provides me. When I come here, I, I kind of, the energy uh, I receive around me really, you know, uh, gets me going further. And, and doing congregational salat and listening to speeches and, and seeing all uh, brothers around me focused on the same purpose as I am in those three days uh, strengthens my spirituality. The Prophet Messiah once stated, The perfection of the Holy Qur'an is seen and its miraculous character is proved from every point of view, that is to say, from the points of view of excellence of composition, of the sequence of its subjects, of its teaching and its perfection, and of the fruits of its teaching. That is why the Holy Qur'an has not demanded its match from any particular point of view, but has issued a general challenge demanding a match from any point of view. From whichever point of view it is looked at, it is a miracle. السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ہم آپ کو جیسے سالانہ امریکہ کے دوسرے دن کی نشریات میں ایک دفعہ پھر خوش آمدید کہتے ہیں جلسہ سالانہ کا آج چونکہ دوسرا دن ہے اور ہفتے کا روز جو ہے ہمیشہ سب سے زیادہ مصروف بھی ہوتا ہے اور جیسا کہ کل افسر صاحب جلسہ سالانہ نے بیان کیا کہ سب سے زیادہ جو تعداد ہے وہ اسی دن متوقع ہوتی ہے تو آج بہت ہی بعض علمی تقریر ہوں گی جس میں بہت ہی اہم موضوعات جو ہے وہ زیر بحث آئیں گے سب سے پہلے تو میں اس پروگرام کا آپ کو تعارف کروا دیتا ہوں کہ آج ہمارے ناظرین کو کیا کیا تقریر جو ہیں وہ سننے کو ملیں گی سب سے پہلی تقریر جو ہے وہ امریکہ میں جو احمدیت کی تاریخ ہے اس کے متعلق ہوگی اس کے بعد جو ہے کیا ایک ہی وقت میں ہم احمدی اور امریکن بھی ہو سکتے ہیں کیا یہ ایک دوہری زندگی تو نہیں ہے پھر اس کے بعد جو ہے حیا کے متعلق سر صاحب خدا مل احمدیہ تقریر کریں گے کہ یہ ایک خوبی ہے نہ کہ کوئی قابل اعتراض چیز پھر خلافت حبل اللہ کو مضبوطی کے ساتھ پکڑنے کے متعلق جو ہے وہ ایک تقریر ہوگی تو ڈیبر صاحب اگر انگریزی میں بھی آپ ہمیں بتائیں یس ابسلوٹلی سو ان دا مارننگ سیشن وچ فار اس از ٹین اے ایم ایسٹرن ٹائم اینڈ اگین دس ڈفرنٹ ٹائم زون ان دی یونائٹڈ اسٹیٹ ان دس سائڈ آف ٹاؤن وی گن اسٹارٹ ود آف کورس آفٹر ریسیٹیشن آف دا ہول قرآن دیر ول بی اسپیچز ان دا فرسٹ سیشن دس از مارننگ سیشن دا فرسٹ اسپیچ ول بی بائی حبیب شفیق صاحب who will talk about the history of Ahmadiyyat, the dawn of Ahmadiyyat in America, again, to remind us of what our history is, so we can pave the way forward based on our experiences and improvements. Um, Rizwan Hamid Khan, Murabi Sahib, will have the second speech as an Ahmadi Muslim and American. Are we leading a double life? Can we potentially lead a double life? Are these two 
um, can we can we work together hand in hand with these two things? So he will shed some light on that. Madil Abdullah Sahib, who is Sadar Khudam al the uh, president of the Youth Association, uh, he will talk about modesty. Is it a source of embarrassment or does it make you make you distinct? That will come at 11:20 a.m. And the last speech for the morning session will be by Sahib Zada Usman Latif Sahib. He will talk about Khilafat, what brings us all together as the holding fast to the rope of Allah. So this will be the morning session which will then end with uh, Zuhur and uh, Asr prayer combined followed by lunch. تقریر کے علاوہ جو بس اب جو جلسے کی رونق ہوتی ہے وہ بھی ایک قابل دید چیز ہوتی ہے اور بہت سارے جو رضاکار ہیں جو اس جلسے کو کامیاب بناتے ہیں ہم ان کے بھی مشکور ہیں کہ ان کی کاوشوں سے ان کی کوششوں سے ان کی محنت سے ہم جلسہ سالانہ کی جو ساری کاروائی ہے اس سے مستفید ہوتے ہیں اور جب آپ گاہے بگاہے دیکھتے ہیں کہ کس قدر محنت سے وہ کام کر رہے ہیں تو ان کے لیے دعا کرنے کا بھی موقع ملتا ہے اور ان کے ذریعے سے حضرت مسیم علیہ السلام کی جو صداقت ہے وہ بھی ظاہر ہوتی ہے کہ کیسے مختلف قسم کے لوگ ہیں مختلف نیشنالٹیز کے ہیں وہ آ کے سب ایک ہی مقصد کے لیے جیسا کو کامیاب بنانے کے لیے جو ہے وہ اکٹھے ہوئے ہیں تو ہم ان سب کے بھی مشکور ہیں اس کے علاوہ ابھی ابھی میری بات ہو رہی تھی کہ کیسے لوگوں میں جو شکروش ہے جلسہ کے متعلق ایک تقریباً اسی سال کے تھے ہمارے ایک بزرگ کہتے ہیں کہ پچھلے تین چار سال سے میں آ نہیں رہا تھا اور اس سال بھی میرے گھر والوں نے کہا کہ جو ہے آپ کو نہیں جانا چاہیے کیونکہ آپ کی طبیعت جو ہے اس کی اجازت نہیں دے گی لیکن کیونکہ میں جلسے کو اتنا زیادہ مس کر رہا تھا اس لیے میں نے کہا جو ہو میں نے جلسے پہ جانا ہے تو لنگر خانہ میں ایک جگہ بیٹھ گئے تھے جہاں سے لوگ گزرتے ہیں کہا کہ جو بھی میرے جاننے والے ہیں سب سے میں سلام کروں گا تو یہ وہ باتیں ہیں جو صرف جلسہ سالانہ میں دیکھنے کو ملتی ہے وہی جذبہ ہے بالکل صحیح بات ہے کہ لوگوں سے بات کرنے کا بھی اور لوگوں سے ملنے کا کافی دوستوں نے کل بھی ذکر کیا تھا کہ جو کووڈ کا جو دور تھا اس میں ہم جلسے پہ نہیں آ سکے اور دوستوں کو دیکھ رہے ہیں کوئی پانچ سال بعد کوئی کہتے ہیں کہ چھ سال بعد ملاقات ہو رہی ہے یہ بھی جلسہ کی ایک برکت ہے الحمد للہ اور میں ذکر بھی کر رہا تھا کہ نماز تحجد جو ہم نے ہوٹلوں میں بھی جو لوگ وہاں پہ رہے ہیں انہوں نے بھی نماز تحجد ادا کی باجماعت ادھر جلسہ گاہ میں بھی لوگ سفر کر کے ادھر آئے ہیں اور الحمد للہ اسی وقت سے شروع ہوا ہے تو یہ سارا اللہ تعالیٰ کی فضل خاص فضل کی وجہ سے ہے اینڈ وی ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ آلسو دی 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 other parts of jalsa the most important thing is that spiritual connection that we all have standing shoulder to shoulder and we pray in congregation here at the jalsa ga in the hotels and and people get that opportunity some people still live so far from their local mosque but here you're able to do five daily prayers back to back in congregation with thousands of people that's also a big big opportunity that people get اور اس کے علاوہ اگر کسی وجہ سے آپ ہمارے کل کے جلسے کی کاروائی کے جو ہے وہ نہیں دیکھ سکے تو آپ جو ہے ہمارے یوٹیوب کے چینل پہ جا کے کل کی نشریات کو بھی دیکھ سکتے ہیں اور آج کی بھی جو نشریات ہے اس میں بھی شامل ہو سکتے ہیں جلسے کی تقریر کے علاوہ کئی انٹرویوز تھے جو ہم نے شاملی نے جلسہ سے کیے مختلف ڈپارٹمنٹ سے انٹرویوز جو ہے وہ کیے گئے تھے اس کے علاوہ ڈاکومنٹریز جو ہے وہ بھی دکھائی گئی تھی تو یہ ساری آپ ہمارے یوٹیوب چینل پہ جا کے دوبارہ دیکھ سکتے ہیں Absolutely. So the Jalsa experience is not just about these three days that we're here for. They're the highlights. But there were some videos that were captured of people's experiences, their thoughts, um, that were prepared beforehand that we want to show you. Some documentaries were made, very exciting ones, that we will be showing you over the period of these um, Jalsa proceedings. Um, so, so this is all part of that, that Jalsa experience by the grace of Allah Ta'ala. So um, Adnan Sahib, even for me personally, if I could share Um, I, I drove 13 hours, we came in four cars, mm. men, women and children. Uh, we stopped in Columbus, Ohio, spent the night there. So for us, Jalsa starts even two days before. For some people that have been here, young people, they've been here for days, Good. putting up this whole place, decorations, and they left their families behind. Like you said, someone was, was not feeling very okay. But as soon as he came here, you get uplifted. Mm. So, so all of these things that may not be seen in front of screen, but behind the scenes, there's so much that goes on, so much sacrifice. and dedication by men, women, children, um, that, that families are sacrificing, um, sacrificing their meals um, to come here and make sure that this is a great experience. So, so please keep on watching. And the hashtag we talked about social media earlier is at Jalsa USA. So if you want to share any thoughts, any questions, please keep them coming on social media. And at Muslim TV USA is our Twitter and Instagram handle. So for those on Instagram, uh, you, can, you can keep watching those proceedings as well. Yes, we want to see our viewers who are watching this video, they can also be sitting in their homes and how can they be sitting in their homes. One of our viewers is the hashtag JalsaUSA. You can send your messages to us. Besides, our Twitter handle is 
ایٹ مسلم ٹی وی یو ایس اے وہاں پہ آپ اپنے پیغامات بھیجتے ہیں کل بھی ہم نے بعض بچوں کی ویڈیوز دیکھی جو کہ رسا سلانہ میں آ رہے ہیں راستے میں نظمیں پڑھ رہے ہیں نعرے لگا رہے ہیں تو ہم چاہتے ہیں کہ ایسا جو ہے آپ بھی بھیجیے اپنی تصاویر جو ہیں اپنے پیغامات بھیجیے تاکہ سب کے سامنے ان کو دکھایا جا سکے سو دی جلسہ گا اسٹارٹنگ ناؤ سو وی ول اینڈ آور پروسیڈنگس ہے اینڈ دین پلیز انجوائے دی جلسہ السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ وی اسٹارٹ آف ود ریسیٹیشن آف دی ہولی قرآن بائی ابراہیم کمارا صاحب ابراہیم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم انما کان قول المؤمنین اذا ليحكم بينهم أن يقولوا سمعنا وأطعنا وأولئك هم وَأَقْسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ جَهْدَ أَيْمَانِهِمْ لَئِنْ أَمَرْتَهُمْ لَئِنْ أَمَرْتَهُمْ لَيَخْرُجُنْ سِمُ طَاعَةٌ مَّعْرُوفَةٌ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ فَإِنَّ 
يَسْتَخْلِفُونَهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِن قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَا يُمَكِّنُونَ لَهُمْ يُبَذِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِي ഫലത്തോ ഫീന ജസാക്കുമുള്ള ദി ട്രാൻസ്ലേഷൻ ഓഫ് ദീസ് വേഴ്സസ് വിൽ ബി റെഡ് ബൈ ജുനേദ് ലത്തീഫ് സാഹബ് Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Following is the English translation of the just recited verses of Surah An-Nur chapter 24 verses 52 through 
I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the accursed. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. The response of the believers when they are called to Allah and his messenger in order that he may judge between them is only that they say, we hear and we obey. And it is they who will prosper. And whoso obeys Allah and his messenger and fears Allah and takes him as a shield for protection, it is they who will be successful. And they swear by Allah their strongest oaths that if thou command them, they will surely go forth. Say, swear not. What is required is actual obedience in what is right. Surely Allah is well aware of what you do. Say, obey Allah and obey the messenger. But if you turn away, then upon him is his burden and upon you is your burden. And if you obey him, you will be rightly guided. And the messenger is not responsible but for the plain delivery of the message. Allah has promised to those among you who believe and do good works that he will surely make them successors in the earth as he had made successors from among those who were before them and that he will surely establish for them their religion which he has chosen for them and that he will surely give them in exchange security and peace after their fear. They will worship me and they will not associate anything with me. Then whoso is ungrateful after that, they will be the rebellious. And observe prayer and pay the zakat and obey the messenger that you may be shown mercy. Think not that those who disbelieve can frustrate our plan in the earth. Their abode is hell, and it is indeed an evil resort. Jazakumullah. <clears throat> Next uh, is a poem, and this will be recited by Sayyid Labib Janood Sahib. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Pakiza manzum kalam, Hazrat Akhtas Masih Maud, wa Mahdi Masood alayhi salatu wa salam. Kaha tak hirso shok maale fani. Utho dhundo Matai asmani Kaha tak josh So, so, chid hai nihani to Thank you. 
یہ ملک و مال جھوٹی ہے کہانی بسر کرتے ہو غفلت میں جوانی بسر کرتے ہو غفلت میں جوانی مگر دل خدا کی ایک بھی تم نے نہ مانی ذرا سوچو ذرا سوچو یہی ہے زندگانی خدا نے اپنی راہ مجھے کو بتا دی فصبح نلدی اخ آدی فصب ہل اخزل آدی کرو تو با کے تا ہو جائے رحمت دکھاؤ جلد تر سد کو کھڑی ہے سر پہ ایسی ایک سات کہ یاد آ جائے گی جس سے مجھے یہ بات مولا نے بتا دی فصبح نلزی اخ فصبح نلدی اخزل آدی م 
پر ہے بٹھایا یہ تو ہی کر کے پھل ویسا ہی پایا یہ خدا نے پھر تمہیں اب ہے بلایا کہ سوچو عزت خیر سبح نلدی اخ زل آدی فسب نلدی اخ زل آدی مسیح وقت اب دنیا میں آیا خدا نے اہد کا دن ہے جب مجھ کو پایا محمد مصطفیٰ محسن انس 
انسانیت محسن انسانیت غلام احمد کی غلام احمد کی خلافت احمدیہ خلافت احمدیہ نرائے تبیر وہی ساقی نے پلا دی فصبح نلدی اخ زل آدی فصبح نلدی اخزل آدی بسر کرتے ہو غفلت Jazakum Allah. <clears throat> the translation of this poem will be read by Khairul Baraya Hughes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. The following is the English translation just recited of the poem written by our beloved Hazrat Musi e Mahmud. Alayhi salam. And it reads, To what extent will you indulge in greed and love for mortal things? Awaken, go and seek heavenly provisions. How long will you remain immersed in your comforts and desires? When a hundred weaknesses are hidden in you, How then can that dearly beloved be discovered? How can pure water remain in a sieve? Pray, think a little of everlasting land while this land and wealth are nothing but a mirage. That you will not entertain a single thing from God. Please think, is this the way to live? God has shown his path unto me. Holy is he who has confounded my foes. Supplicate and repent so that his mercy comes. Seek urgently in truth and humbleness. Such hours well nigh near. Looming over our heads that will call to mind the day of doom. God has related this to me. Holy is he who has confounded my foes. The Muslims, the Muslim Ummah, were overtaken by a decline when they forgot the teachings of the Holy Quran. They put the Messiah of Allah in the ground and placed the Messiah up in the heavens, Awudu Billah. After this insult, they reaped the fruit accordingly. What all things befell them for this disrespect? God has now once again sent you a summoner 
to reflect and consider some respect the best of creation. God himself has shown this path to us. Holy is he who has confounded my foes. The Messiah of the time has now come to the world. God has shown the day of his covenant. He is blessed who now believes it and follows it. He meets the companions when he finds me. The wine tenders have served them the same wine. Holy is he who has confounded my foes. MashaAllah. Jazakumullah. <clears throat> so we start off with the first speaker of the day. Habib Shafiq Sahib is going to talk to you about uh, history of Ahmadiyyat and dawn of Ahmadiyyat in America. Habib. <clears throat> Respected Nav Amir, brothers and guests of this 73rd Jalsa Salana USA, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu. We are all aware that the dawn designates the first appearance of light before the rising of the sun. Dawn, in this instance, symbolizes the beginning of a new era, that is, the first appearance of Islam Ahmadiyyat in America. The theme and objective here will be to highlight and appreciate some of the historical milestones achieved and the challenges faced by the Jamaat at the dawn of Islam of Ahmadiyyat in America. Select examples of events and milestones as they happened in the U.S. Jamaat's history will illustrate how these challenges were surmounted with divine support of Allah Ta'ala. These few but significant examples are limited to the first 50 years of Islam Ahmadiyyat in America. The serene and dusky twilight that descended before this dawn beamed and revealed a divine prophecy from Allah Ta'ala to Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, the promised Messiah and Mahdi. From the obscure village of Qadian in the Punjab district of India, a divine, a divinely revealed glow settled on the horizon and emanated its unceasingly radiance. I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. The promised Messiah, alayhi salam, believed profoundly and stated emphatically that this prophecy was a divine assurance from God Almighty, which was to begin advent of the era for the completion of the propagation of the perfect guidance for all of mankind foretold by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam some 14 centuries ago. More than 100 years ago, rendering to the circumstances of his time, the promised Messiah leveraged with divine support an extraordinary system of efficient outreach, fulfilling this prophecy of conveying the message of Islam from the four reaches of Mecca, Medina, and Qadian. Hazrat Ahmed, the promised Messiah of Qadian, brilliantly and most effectively utilized and deployed the various means of his day to spread the message of Islam. During this time, during his time, print media was the most efficient means of conveying information and sharing one's ideas. Hazrat Ahmed engaged this medium in an extraordinary manner. While boldly carrying out his divine mission of fulfilling this divine revelation, the Promised Messiah published books, articles, statements, and announcements in newspapers with divine sustenance. This facilitated the dissemination of the true message and teachings of Islam, causing them to reach the corners of the earth with ease. Indeed, history bears witness to the fact 
that even with the most meager financial resources, the message of the promised Messiah reached the United States, Europe, United Kingdom during his lifetime. The promised Messiah commenced his divine mission around 1882 and sent many letters to the scholarly community about his claim. A journalist named Alexander Webb in America came across an announcement of the promised Messiah and started corresponding with him. Through his correspondence, he was convinced of the truth of Islam and accepted it as his faith. In a letter dated February 24th in 1897, Mr. Webb wrote to the promised Messiah and stated thus, Sir, it occurred to me that I might through your aid assist in spreading the truth of Islam here in America. We can see clearly that the initial ray of the dawn of Ahmadiyya of America was this divine revelation of the promised Messiah in 1897. I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth, whose incandescent light traveled over 7,000 miles to a corner of the earth known as New York City. Fast forward, it is now October 26. This foreshadow prophecy reached New York, specifically the American publication called the New York Commercial Advisor. It boldly printed and distributed this tagline, the historical prayer challenge between Alexander Dawi and Hazrat Ahmed. When Hazrat Ahmed, the promised Messiah, came to know about Dawi's claims, he called upon him to stop his antagonistic remarks about the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hazrat Ahmed sent a leaflet to Mr. Dawi, challenging him to enter a prayer duel. To enter this prayer duel with him and whomsoever was the liar should die during the life of the truthful one. I do not need to elaborate on in details this historic prayer duel, Dawi's provocative, provocative and arrogant attitude, his claims, his inflammatory public remarks, and his ultimate pathetic and, and prophetic end. All of this, all of this is in stark contrast to the inspiredly divine prophecy and victory of the promised Messiah in every aspect of this has been imprinted indelibly in our minds and history forever. The American press gave wide coverage to this event. Several newspaper publications even carried the picture of both Hazrat Ahmed and Mr. Dawi. In short, from an unknown village in Qadian in 1903, the first glimpse of the divine message reached America in an extraordinary and historical manner. Hazrat Promised Messiah brilliantly engaged the American print media establishment to establish the message of the true peaceful teachings of Islam. Clearly rehearsing in the dawn of Ahmadiyyat in a most fitting and historical manner. It was December 27, 1919, at Ajalsa Salana in Qadian, that Hazrat Musli Maud made a far-reaching announcement during this particular Ajalsa address. He stated that we are dispatching, quote, our humble Darvish, Dr. Mufti Muhammad Sadiq, to the Americas in the endeavor to fulfill the revelation of the promised Messiah. I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. To appreciate the enormous challenges confronting the Jamaat at that time, when Hazrat Mufti Saab was sent to give this message of guidance to the great and mighty nation of America, our international headquarters in Qadian, India, was in such impoverished conditions that sometimes the Jamaat officials could not even be paid their already meager allowances, and sometimes for more than six months at a time. Often their families even faced starvation. Hazrat Muslim Maud would make special appeals to some of the more affluent members of the Jamaat 
for a trust loan which would be refunded in due time. In response to his distressful calls, Allah Ta'ala would show mercy to the members and some of the members would send generous donations. Alhamdulillah. Despite these strained and desperate circumstances, it was deemed necessary that a servant of faith, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq, be deployed to the United States. So, what was the purpose of this noble Darvish being sent here? In a handwritten note to Mufti Saab in 1919, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih instructed him as follows. Reach America by devising yourself as a disciple of the promised Messiah. You have been made a teacher for the whole world. It has two phases. Firstly, you should call others to God. And secondly, you must transform Ahmadis to obey the doctrines of God. And God has promised that we shall be successful, though we may be weak. Allah, Allah is great. Mufti Saab's mission was clear and straightforward. He would proceed to America, plant the seed of Islam here, which would then bloom with the dawn and ultimately the sun would rise here. The Jamaat at that time and this humble Darvish would have resolute certainty of faith that the mission would be successful because this was the revealed prophecy, revealed by Allah to Hazrat Ahmed, the promised Messiah of the Holy Prophet Now there are many aspects about Mufti Saab's service that we have already highlight, highlighted with deep appreciation during our Jamaat centenary year, and I do not aim to detail them here. Yet, Let's be quite clear and remember that Mufti Saab was taught and trained by the promised Messiah personally. Mufti, Mufti Saab worked as secretary of all English correspondence and English administrative affairs directly with and for the promised Messiah. This pre presentation, however, would be remiss without relating briefly two aspects, often obscure aspects, which cannot be ignored alongside this era of the dawn of Ahmadiyya in America. Firstly, what was the state of the nation of America, that is the social backdrop in which Mufti Saab arrived in the 1920s? And secondly, and secondly, just what did Muslim Maud Salam, mean in his letter to Mufti Saab when he boldly stated that the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat would be successful in the Americas in facilitating this divine promise. More importantly, more importantly, how would success manifest itself given such of the challenging material resources of the Jamaat at that time and what would success actually look like? It is important to note that this was at the very beginning of the infamous American history known as the Roaring Twenties. Let's be very clear. The dawn of Islam in America was undeniably just opposed with the historically turbulent era of American history at this time. My time here will only permit only a few examples to convey a snapshot of the social backdrop and background in America at that time. First, Mufti Saab reached America in October 2020. This was just 57 years after the official signing of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. However, Mufti Saab discovered in order for America to continue its systematic and egregious scheme of social and racial inequality, the Jim Crow laws were enacted. Now, Jim Crow laws were local and state laws introduced in the southern United States in the late 1920 and earliest 
early 20th centuries that enforced racial segregation in public and private spaces. The name Jim Crow being a pejorative term for an African American, the, such laws remain in force until well into the 1960s. These formal and informal segregation policies were presented in many areas in the United States, were enforced in many areas in the United States as well. Next, now following the collapse of Europe at the end of World War II around November 1918, there was a mass migration of Muslims to America. Many of them were summoned to America by the allure of the massive industrial manufacturing industry complex spearheaded by the automobile innovator Henry Ford. Reliable sources report hundreds of Muslims of Middle Eastern descent were present in America at the collapse of World War I through the 1920s. In brief, in 1916, Henry Ford's factories had hundreds of Syrian employees, including many, many recently arrived Muslims. By 1916, 9,000 Arabic speakers were among the residents of Detroit alone. While there were many Muslims in the United States from 1915 through the 1920s, there is no documented history that any of these Muslim groups or affiliate organizations ever had a concentrated effort, a concerted effort to spread the message of Islam in America. These Muslim immigrants came to America, understandably, to better their lives and escape the ravages of World War I and the collapse of, the, uh, of Europe, as well as the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Consequently, they did not come to America with the express intention or purpose of spreading the message of Islam. Now, with this brief historical background in our time remaining, let us highlight and recall how the dawn of Ahmadiyya began to manifest successes. Now, given such meager material resources of the Jamaat at this time and within the context of the Roaring Twenties in America. Now, my brothers, as I deliberated and reflected in preparation for this presentation, I, I, find my, I found myself having to resist the feeling of being overwhelmingly inundated by with just so many examples to choose from and with so little time allotted for such a vast topic. So how, how do I proceed? And there it was, so beautifully illuminated right before me. You see, Mufti Saab recounted well after he returned from America that during his detention by the U.S. authorities, he prayed to Allah for three things, for success in America, and Allah Ta'ala graciously fulfilled all of them. Firstly, he prayed to be successful in the establishment of a jamaat of devoted people in the U.S. who bow down before one God. Secondly, he prayed for the publication of a magazine for the propagation of Ahmadiyya, the true Islam. And thirdly, the construction of a proper mosque where one God will be worshipped. I shall narrate a few significant events through the prism, the filter, as it were, of his prayer and how God Almighty answered these three aspects of Mufti Saab's humble petition. And while blessing him with extraordinary accomplishments, as a direct result of each of these three earnest supplications offered by this selfless, humble, and most dedicated noble soul. The first prayer he prayed was for the establishment of a jamaat of dedicated people who would bow down before God. The second Khalifa stated in a speech in Salko, Pakistan, that God gave him the following words. He said, these are God's words. Mufti Shab shall definitely enter the United States. These words revealed, these words revealed, sorry, these words revealed to him in Pakistan, in Salkot, that God said the following. These are God's words. Mufti Saab will definitely enter the United States 
and these words, and they and the U.S. Immigration Authority shall not alter this plan. Therefore, through the lens of this first prayer that Mufti Saab prayed during, the detention, during his detention, he remained focused on his mission, preaching Islam and Ahmadiyyat to all who would listen. His appeal was upheld, and he was permitted to enter the United States, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the conversion of scores of new Ahmadis during the seven-week determinant. Mufti Saab's compassionate, emphatic, thoughtful approach attracted the curiosity and the hearts of the American public. He painstakingly recorded not only the names and addresses of other and other relevant data of these individuals who, he, who came to join the Jamaat, he established direct personal attachment and genuine bonds with them through written correspondence. In short, he emulated the practice of Hazrat Promised Messiah by attaching these new soaring American doves of Ahmadiyya to himself. He endured, he endeared these early American converts from the 1920s to 1923 through Allah's grace and Mufti Saab's diligent efforts, the hearts of over 700 souls were converted in the U.S. at that time. Within this short spirit span of 10 years, Mufti Saab's monumentalist inaugural efforts in the U.S., Americans of all races, creeds, social, economic backgrounds had joined the fold of Islam Ahmadiyyad. Mufti Saab modeled four particular qualities to these very brave early pioneers, which he himself reflected as a direct result of being a devoted disciple of the promised Messiah. These early pioneers emulated these following four qualities in a consistent, extraordinary manner. They heard, they obeyed, they sacrificed exceedingly, and they remained steadfast as they passed through these, as they passed these enduring moral and spiritual qualities forward, which reverberated well into the 20s and subsequent decades and beyond. Mukti Saab's sincere prayer for devoted souls continued to be answered at, well after he left. Mukti Saab ultimately succeeded, succeeded by establishing chapters in Detroit, New Orleans, Florida, South Carolina, Indiana, West Virginia, New York. The next, segment, <clears throat> the next segment of Mufti Saab's earnest supplication was for the, a publication of a magazine for the propagation of Islam. In 1921, the manifestation of this second prayer was gloriously, was gr gloriously answered with the establishment of the Muslim Sunrise. Mufti Saab utilized the pen brilliantly and effectively spread the teachings of Islam and Ahmadiyyat in the U.S. and around the world. Once again, solidifying the truth of this prophecy, I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. Mufti Stab stated that he had prayed sincerely for such a publication intended solely for the spread of the message of Islam. The targeted circulation was, boldly, was to boldly reach out and directly invite established Middle Eastern Muslim communities and the American citizenry at large to study, understand, and faithfully embrace the teachings of Islam in America. Now, why this name, the Muslim Sunrise? Mufti Saab explained that this name came, was taken from the promised Messiah during a response to a question. And that question was, what does it mean that in the time of the promised Messiah, the sun will rise in the West? The answer to this is a natural phenomenon, that the sun always rises in the east and always sets in the west. This cannot be changed. This means, the promised Messiah emphasized, this means that at the time of the coming of the promised Messiah of the Holy Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a people of the west will start accepting Islam as their faith. From its blessed inception, the Muslim Sunrise brothers 
was no ordinary, docile, unassuming coffee table publication. There were so many misconceptions. The Muslim Sunrise was utilized to educate, enlighten, remove misconceptions about Islam and while inviting its readers to view Ahmadiyyat in an open, unbiased, with an open, unbiased attitude. Now, after Mufti Saab's historic tenure here in the U.S., the missionary caravan continued to spread and the pristine message of Islam, of the pristine message of Islam in Ahmadiyyat. Time permits mention of only a few of these noble souls who took over the task from Mufti Saab. Nevertheless, their service will forever be a part of the dawn of Ahmadiyyat in America. Hazra Khalifatul Masih appointed next Muvi Muhammadin B.A. as the second Ahmadi missionary to America in 1923. He was among the first of 13 fortunates to dedicate their lives on the call of the promised Messiah in 1907. He brought the message from his, from, uh, his Holiness Hazra Khalifatul Masih of Brotherhood. This message read, in quote, strive to excel in the works of faith. Strive hard to acquire knowledge of faith. You should see Islam in its true and bright form and make others see its illustrious face. Movi Muhammadin was missionary in the U.S. from 1923 to 1926. During his tenure, over 650 souls accepted Islam Ahmadiyyat. Next, Dr. Muhammad Yusuf Khan served as an honorary missionary, he took charge of the American mission in, in October 20, 1925, and worked diligently for two years from 1925 through 1927. Later, on June 4th, he took charge of the Pittsburgh mission. There were 500 active um, African-American Ahmadis in Pittsburgh alone. Sufi Imar Bengali, missionary in the USA from 1928 to 1948. Sufi Imar Bengali arrived in Chicago on August 19, 1928. He tirelessly worked to establish the chapters in Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Washington, Steubenville, uh, Homestead, Kansas City, and other cities throughout the United States. Sufi Imar Bengali Saab served he delivered a short le lecture in Chicago with the title, and this was the title, What Would Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Say to Chicago? Sufi Imar Bengali undertook a lecture tour in the East and throughout the South, and his addresses were given universities and, and churches alike. He also had the honor of reading a message from Hazrat Khalifa Masih at that time to the World Fellowship of Faith, in addition, it was under his tenure that Lajna Imala would officially become into being with that particular name. And during this tenure, prior to this, sisters were given, were gathering under the name of sewing circles. His Excellency Chaudhry Muhammad Zafullah Khan visited Chicago, Illinois in, in, in August 1933 through September 1933. He addressed three public meetings, he, was, he gave inspiring lectures in Islam and World Fellowships of Faith. He delivered two speeches in Chicago Mission, uh, and he expected the, inspected the mission there and gave valuable suggestions and wrote to Hazrat Khalifa al Masih at the time the, the difficulties that the mission was facing. Next, Dr. Khalil Ahmed Nasser, 1946 to 1959, served as an assistant to Sufi Bengali Saab until 1948 and then succeeded him as missionary in charge. He established the first mosque in the nation's capital, which was named the American Fazl Mosque by Hazrat Musli Maud, and he served, it served as our headquarters until 1994. The first Ahmadi Mosque in the nation's capital was procured at 2141 Leroy Place in 1949 by Khalifa Masih Sani, and it was named the American Fazl Mosque and served as our headquarters from 1950 to 1994. Dr. Nasser 
Under his tenure, he started the annual conventions and initiated elections national, of national executives and national auxiliaries and published new books and launched the Ahmadiyya Gazette and participated in several international conferences. Jamaat, Jamaat, Ahmadiyya, was in, Jamaat Ahmadiyya United States held its very first, one of its very first Jalsa Salanas. They, they, were under, they were one day conventions at the time in September 5, 1948 in Dayton, Ohio. Ahmadis from Chicago, Pittsburgh, Indianapolis, Cleveland, Nagstown, Homestead, New York, Kansas City participated enthusiastically. Second, second annual convention took place the following year in September <clears throat> 1949 at Pittsburgh. The third annual convention of Ahmadiyya was held uh, uh, September 2, 2 and 3rd through 1950, and it was the first time Qadam al-Ahmadiyya and Lajnai Maula held their auxiliary members separately. Next, Mirza Manawar Ahmed, son of Mirza Sharif Ahmed, who arrived in the United States of America at the end of 1946, was posted as a missionary in Pittsburgh. He was very popular in the region, mainly due to his ease of simplicity and love and affection, which induced, uh, which, which, which induced a resoundingly positive stir among the Ahmadis of Pittsburgh. During his efforts in this region, Pittsburgh, this particular area, was declared one of the top performing chapters in the United States Jamaat. He later contracted a tumor and was operated on in a local hospital, but unfortunately he did not survive. He died in the service of Islam, and therefore Mirza Manara Ahmad became the first martyr of Islam Ahmadiyya in America, in Allah wa in Allah Rajiyam. He would do any work assigned to him with due diligence and honestly. Hazrat Khalifa Dumasi mentioned his qualities in his September 24, 1948, Kudba. <laughs> I now call your attention to Mufti Saab's third prayer. He supplicated for the construction of a mosque where one God would be worshipped. From the early 1920s well into the mid-1940s, there were active prayer halls, lodge halls, community hubs, flourishing as prayer centers all over the United States under the banner of the Ahmadiyya, Muslim, uh, the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam. However, Mufti Saab's prayer and heartfelt plea to Allah was to bless him with the capacity to get a mosque constructed. Within a relatively short period of time, we are now witnessing the divine message being propagated not only on the ground through the literature, through literature on the ground, but also from the sky via the satellite, the Muslim television Ahmadiyya MTA. With limited resources, a small and poor community has been able to harness the contemporary cutting-edge technology to spread the message of the promised Messiah's revelation, I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth with new glory and fulfillment. Alhamdulillah. Today, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has donned was donned and established itself in more than 200 countries and everywhere we go we spread the message of love for all and hatred for none. My dear brothers, in conclusion, I stand before you today as a testament of the progress of Ahmadiyya in America. As I have mentioned earlier, the first annual convention of Ahmadiyya was held in Dayton, Ohio in 1948. It was here that my father, Mark David Taylor, a 17-year-old boy, was a guest. 
He was taken by the loving and encompassing message of Islam and brotherhood in the community. That only one year later, in September 1949, he traveled to Pittsburgh to attend the second Jalsa there. It was then that he accepted the message of Islam and the promised Messiah. He took by it, he took by it without his parents' permission and embraced the name Habib Muhammad Shafiq Sr. Alhamdulillah, 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 Alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allah. Our next speaker is uh, Murabi Rizwan Ahmed Khan. He will talk to us about uh, <clears throat> I am the Muslim and American leading a double life. I would uh, remind the speakers that they should try to stay within the time allotted to them so that we can all proceed in time. Thank you, Jalla. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan nabduhu wa rasuluh amma ba'du fa a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim Huzur ayyadaw Allah ta'ala bin Asr al-Aziz gave a couple of reasons for why an Ahmadi Muslim, someone who believes that Ahmadiyyat is true, would suffer from an inferiority complex about their religious identity. And this is important to understand when we're talking about an Ahmadi living a double life. Because the reason why someone who believes Ahmadiyyat is true would live a double life is because he is suffering from an inferiority complex about his religious identity. If he wasn't, then he would simply live his entire life by one set of ideals. So two reasons that Huzur Ayyadaullah gave. One was a person may feel embarrassment because they live in a society where religion is seen as backwards, where religion is seen as out of touch with the modern world. He's afraid that people would taunt him. He's afraid that he may feel humiliated and rejected by such ridicule. So having the odds against him with the sheer numbers of people who are not Muslim and the many people who are against Islam, this fear is one of the reasons. Another reason is a lack of knowledge, that the criticisms that are leveled against Islam, he may not be sure what the answers are. If he's asked about something like terrorism or honor killings, different things that are attributed to Islam, he may not know the answer. So these are two main reasons. These are fears that could lead an Ahmadi Muslim to not tell their friends or their classmates or their coworkers that they're an Ahmadi, that they're a Muslim. And so they would end up living one life at the masjid, and then with their non-Ahmadi friends and co-workers or schoolmates, they would end up having a separate set of ideals. And when someone has an inferiority complex, he has accepted someone else's superiority complex over them. These two things are two sides of the same coin. They're inseparable. A inferiority complex does not develop within a vacuum. It doesn't develop on its own. Truth and reality exists independently. But when a person accepts someone else's superiority complex over them, that is when they start to feel inferior. And this is not an exclusively religious topic. This is a psychological phenomenon. It is a sociological phenomenon. It is an emotional problem that expresses itself in different ways. Religion is just one of them. For example, these complexes have expressed themselves in history in significant ways. A part of colonization and the history of colonization was cultural imperialism. 
and it was found that an effective way to subjugate a foreign people was to develop within them a feeling of inferiority about themselves. So colonizers who had a superiority complex about themselves, about their race, about their culture, if they could succeed in forming a feeling of inferiority among the people they were colonizing, then they could far more effectively be subjugated. Now this applies and this manifested in many different ways. Just taking the recent history of the United States, and the United States is our country, there were many people in the American history, white people, who had a superiority complex about their race. Now when people of other races accepted the superiority complex, then they developed feelings of inferiority about their appearance, about their race. That's why we see here in American history that there were some black people who would straighten their hair to look more like white people. We see that there were people who were Korean and Chinese who would get plastic surgery to change their eyes to look different, out of an inferiority complex to look more like white people. Now there was nothing objectively wrong with the way they looked. It was only when they accepted a feeling of inferiority because they accepted the superiority complex of someone else that they then started to look down on themselves. They felt embarrassed of their own race, their own unique appearance. Another method of colonizing a people that we've seen here in our history in North America is to take away their language. We see this with the history of, of the Native Americans. But in order to make them feel ashamed and feel that their culture was uh, insignificant or inferior, their language was suppressed. Now we also see in this day and age that there is some feeling of inferiority among people about their language, about the way their language sounds, about their names. Today there are many people who anglicize their names and take on entirely Western names out of, out of an inferiority complex. One study among Chinese students found that the adoption of Anglo names was negatively associated with self-esteem. Adopting Anglo names is also found among many people from South Asia. So when people start to believe that their language and culture is inferior, then they feel embarrassed to be identified by it. These types of complexes manifested in different ways in South Asian culture and the South Asian people here in the United States. Hazrat Khalifa al Masih Rabi Rahmatullah said here in America that, for example, immigrants from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and any Arab country may feel that they are financially better off as compared to the blacks, and further may feel that their color is lighter. Thus, unconsciously, they tend to become a part of the social setup of the whites by making closer relationships with the whites. They feel a kind of superiority over others. So this is one example Huzur gave. And some of us can think of other examples that we have seen ourselves of people who suffer from an inferiority complex about their cultural or racial identity. Now these are all points that are unrelated to religion. When it comes to race or culture, there is no ultimate superiority of anyone over the other. This is why Islam embraces all cultures. This is why Islam does not allow anyone to impose their culture on anyone else in the name of religion. But religion is something where there is objective superiority. The reason a person adopts a religion is because he has found it to be superior. So it is most unfortunate, and it is even more unfortunate if an Ahmadi Muslim develops an inferiority complex about his religious identity. And that is more unfortunate than someone who has an inferiority complex about their racial or cultural identity. <coughs> Now why would an Ahmadi Muslim develop an inferiority complex? As mentioned before, one reason for this is not having the strength to stand up against a largely non-Muslim society. In the society that we live in, the ideals of Islam are looked down upon. Whether it's among liberals or conservatives, there are different teachings and different ideals of Islam that are seen as being incompatible with the, back, with the, with the modern world. They're seen as being backwards. And so, whether we go into one place or another, people look down on the values and teachings of Islam and as a result they look down on Muslims, they belittle Muslims. Now this is not a new phenomenon. Throughout the stories of the prophets that are told in the Holy Quran, we see again and again that the opponents didn't just have a theological disagreement with the believers, but they looked down on them. They saw them as the lowest of people. They belittled them. For example, the Holy Quran says about the people of Hazrat Nuh that they said, the disbelievers said to Hazrat Noah, that and we see that none have followed thee, but those who to all outward appearance are the meanest of us, and we do not see in you any superiority over us. They said, that shall we believe thee when it is the meanest that follow thee. So they saw them as being lower than themselves. 
And the communities of prophets of God have always been belittled and looked down on and outnumbered. The reason disbelievers did this was because they were trying to subjugate them. It's simple. It's the same thing as cultural imperialism that was just discussed earlier. The reason is that if they could form an inferiority complex in the believers about their religious identity, then they could more effectively be subjugated. The reason why someone who believes Ahmadiyyat is true but still lives a double life is because he has accepted this feeling of inferiority, because he wants to fit in, because he was not able to stand against those odds that he faces. He would not have felt that way if he were part of the majority. The United States is a society that has largely rejected Islam. When we leave the masjid, when we go away from Jalsa, then we go back into a society that looks down on Islam. The ideologies that are prevalent in our society are those that were described as Dajjal by the Holy Prophet So when we go out into that society, we have to be aware and conscious of these points. But unfortunately, some capitulate to that pressure. It is not something that is new within Ahmadiyyat, it is not something confined to religion. But we do find that even in the history of Islam, there were many people who unfortunately capitulated. The Promised Messiah salam, himself gave an example of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. He said that dusri qoum ke rob mein aakar aur unki haan mein haan milate hue aakhir yahan tak nobat pahunchi ke aap aakhir ayam mein tasleeh ke manne walon ko bhi najat yafta qarar de gaye mudahina ki intaha yahi hua karti hai ke aakhir usi qoum ka insaan ko banna padta hai quran e sharif mein isliye hai ke lan tarza ankal yahud wa lan nasara hatta tattabiya millatuhum dusre ko razi karne ke liye insaan ko uske mazhab ko bhi acha kehna padta hai isliye mudahina se momin ko parhez karna chahiye that coming into the awe of another nation and being a yes man, he reached the point that in his final days he considered Trinitarians to have achieved salvation. The ultimate result of compromising principles is that one has to become one with those people. That is why the Holy Quran says, and the Jews will by no means be pleased with thee, nor the Christians, unless thou follow their creed. To please others, one has to call their religion good as well. That is why a believer should refrain from compromising principles. After this, a second reason why an Ahmadi Muslim develops an inferiority complex is not having enough knowledge of what Islam is and what Ahmadiyyat is. Out of ignorance, he has accepted the superiority complex of those who mock Islam. And again, like mentioned before, this is not like race or culture where there is no absolute superiority. With religion, on each point of difference, where our American ideals and our American cultures conflict with Islamic ideals, on each one of those points, Islam can be proven to be superior. It is objectively superior. So again, there it is unfortunate when an Ahmadi accepts an inferiority complex. There are many examples of this. Just as a few examples, there are some Ahmadis who would feel ashamed to tell their co-workers, to tell their craftsmates, to tell their friends that they don't drink alcohol. They never told their friends that they're a Muslim. The result is that when a time comes at a social gathering when someone hands him a drink, then he doesn't know what to do because now he has to tell them either that he's a Muslim and then explain why he doesn't drink alcohol or just go along with the flow. So this is despite the fact that he has teachings of truth where Islam has taught that alcohol is harmful, the harms outweigh the benefits. And this is something that experts today have accepted also. Again, this is an objective truth that Islam has always been right about. It was only a decade ago or so when scientists were saying that some amounts of wine are actually good for health. And these findings were presented as evidences against Islam. But only recently, the World Health Organization said that when it comes to alcohol consumption, there is no safe amount that does not affect health. So there should be no room for an inferiority complex when an Ahmadi has always been established on teachings of truth. Another example is that some Ahmadis feel ashamed to tell their non-Ahmadi friends that they don't date. They're afraid that their friends would think it's backwards or out of touch with the modern world to do arranged marriages. And so for that reason, they would maybe hide this fact, or maybe they would live a double life. And this is despite the fact that arranged marriages, again, are objectively better than dating. In any society where dating is prevalent, it is inseparably linked in all these societies with premarital sex. And this causes the plague-like spread of sexually transmitted infectious diseases. The state of affairs here in the United States is that one in five people here, the CDC has said, have an STI. 
and almost half of new STIs were among youth aged 15 to 24. So this is the ground reality. Those people who put forward a superiority complex about their ideals, this is the filth that they're hiding under a thin veneer of advanced culture. This is the ground realities of the spread and the plague-like spread of infectious diseases in our society. So those who have that superiority complex, they fit that definition of Dajjal that the Holy Prophet ﷺ described. That what they have is inferior, but they present it as if it is superior. The Holy Prophet ﷺ said that Dajjal will appear, and with him will be water and fire. That which people consider to be water will in fact be a burning fire, and that which people consider to be fire will in fact be cool and sweet water. This same situation is even worse among those involved in homosexual sex. While anyone who exposes themselves to premarital sex can get a sexually transmitted infectious disease, but the CDC says that sexually active gay and bisexual men are at greater risk. So this is the consequence of their behavior. This is the ground reality of those who think their ideals can contend with Islam, but think that their ideals are superior to Islam. So how can an Ahmadi have a complex about these issues? It would be one thing if our American ideals and our American societies following those ideals led to actual stable homes. But the reality is that in our society, the divorce rate has been above 50% for so long that the majority of children today are being raised in a house where they are not being raised by both of their biological parents. So this is how fundamentally broken the family structure, the, the family unit he is here in the United States. This is the result of the American dream that has led to a permissiveness that has destroyed the most basic fabric of our society, the home, the family unit. So those who believe in these American ideals are in no position to give advice to anyone on ideal relationships, let alone contend with the teachings of Islam. If an Ahmadi could have any complex, if Islam allowed a person to have a complex, a complex is a weakness, whether superiority or inferiority, Islam does not have any room for that. But if an Ahmadi was going to have a complex, then it would be a superiority complex that would have been justified. Then there is transgenderism. This is a raging debate in our society. Some Ahmadis feel embarrassed to go against the grain, despite being established on simple truths, reality, absolute truths. Those same truths that our society, having deviated from those basic Islamic ideals, common sense ideals, when our society has deviated from them, our society is now struggling to identify basic realities. Huzur was recently asked about what young children are being taught about transgenderism in schools, and he explained that now these people themselves have started to speak out against these kinds of things, and calling out the absurd things people are saying. So these people are becoming the laughing stock of their own absurdities. Here Huzur described that unfortunate and pitiable state of confusion that our society is in. How can an Ahmadi have an inferiority complex despite being established on reality and absolute truth? And we should zoom out for a moment and look at how history will look at this unique era that we're passing through, this unique era and its absurdities. These passing ideals of the present American culture are not made to last. The unfortunate reality is that it's not just the family structures in our society that are deteriorating. Unfortunately, our country is headed towards a civil war. The world is headed towards a world war. It's not just Huzur who is saying that now. Now everybody is starting to see it on the horizon. So these ideals that are prevalent in our society, they're going to disappear as quickly as they came. They're going to go out of fashion as quickly as they came into fashion because they're not made to last. The teachings of Islam and the ideals and principles of Islam are made to last and they stand the test of time. So we have to think of how it is that we will be looked back on in history when the people of the future look back on the passing fashions of ideals that have gone through our time and how we reacted to them. The way that we react to them must be in the same way that the communities of prophets of God have always faced those passing ideals of their time. The communities of prophets of God have always stood in one place because they are established on truth. An inferiority complex is a reaction, but truth is not a reaction. People react to the truth. People react to reality. So an Ahmadi who is established on the truth, people around him react to him, but he does not react to them. And this is the characteristic of true prophets of God in their communities. That they came and they stood against those passing ideals and fashions of their time. And it made no difference to them. But eventually, they prevailed. Huzur Ayyadawullah said that no Ahmadi Muslim ever needs to become victim to any form of inferiority complex because we have reason, logic, evidence, and above all truth on our side. 
Hazur said that rather than falling into any complex, instead you should feel pride in your religious beliefs and be confident in the expression of your faith. Certainly there is no Islamic injunction or restriction that is without reason or logic. Each Islamic teaching is based upon human nature and the means for ensuring societal peace and harmony. Be ever willing to go against the grain by giving precedence to your religious convictions. Here in our society, taking pride in one's convictions and beliefs is considered a quality. Even those people who have clearly wrong beliefs, who have no business taking pride in their beliefs, even they take pride. And it's seen as a quality, it's something that's to be respected. So this applies to us as well, that when we have those beliefs and convictions that are based on truth, then it would be a sign of weakness and unfortunate if a person was not able to stand by them. So we Ahmadis are, Huzur said that, so we Ahmadis are fortunate to have accepted the promised Messiah salam. After accepting him, if we still have an inferiority complex or show weakness in giving precedence to our faith over this world, then it is a cause of great concern and a point of embarrassment. Always remember that the word of God will prevail and it is without any flaw. As we said that accordingly, no matter what allegations or criticisms are leveled against Islam, you must never feel any embarrassment or complex over your faith. There is no allegation and no criticism that cannot be refuted. You should never hold any form of inferiority complex about your religion. Never entertain the thought that your religion is somehow backward or out of touch with the modern world. Conversely, the more you take pride in your religion, and the more you live your lives according to the teachings of Islam, the more others will respect you, and this is how your honor and dignity will be established in the world. Surely, there is no Islamic teaching that should cause any complex or apprehension to emerge in your minds. Never worry for a second that others might taunt you or consider you to be a laughingstock because of your religious beliefs. If they mock, let them. Some people, as we said, some continued that some people criticize or deride barda and hijab, while also disparaging our way of offering namaz. Unfortunately, some young Ahmadis, particularly teenagers, develop an inferiority complex or feel humiliated and rejected by such ridicule. However, if you are ever mocked for acting upon your religion, you should never take it as a personal humiliation. Rather, you should consider it to be a badge of honor and feel pride in the knowledge that you have stayed strong in your faith in the face of adversity. Showing patience and keeping your head held high in such circumstances is the true means of establishing your honor and self-respect in the world. We are the fortunate ones, as we have not forgotten our values. Now, as Hazur said, that we must take pride in our religion. And the more that we take pride, the more and the more we live our lives according to the teachings of Islam, the more others will respect us. So how is it, what are practical ways that we can do this? One example that Hazur gave is that starts with just the observance of prayer, salat. He said that when we are out, for example, on family outings, then we should observe prayers punctually at their set time. And Hazur advised that a person should not feel any kind of complex about publicly observing their prayers in congregation. Rather, Hazur said that people who do this, not only is it a source of good for them, but it has a positive effect on others as well. When people see that these are people dressed like us, but they're concentrating in prayer, then they're moved. Hazur continued and said further about this, and he said this here in the United States, that بس کسی قسم کے احساس کمتری میں ہمیں مبتلا نہیں ہونا چاہیے نہ بچوں کو نہ بروں کو ہمارا دعویٰ ہے کہ دنیا میں دینی اور روحانی انقلاب ہم نے پیدا کرنا ہے تو یہ دینی اور روحانی انقلاب وہی لوگ پیدا کر سکتے ہیں جو ہر قسم کے احساس کمتری سے آزاد ہوں اور اپنے اندر سب سے پہلے دینی اور روحانی انقلاب پیدا کرنے والے ہوں Hazur said that Ahmadis should not fall prey to any kind of inferiority complex. It is our claim that we will create a spiritual revolution in the world. Only those can create that revolution who are free of every type of inferiority complex and who first create a spiritual revolution within themselves. Another way that an Ahmadi who is living a double life, who is suffering from a complex, another way that he can overcome this, as we explained, is simply by doing tabligh. That is one of the basic obligations of a Muslim, flyer distribution. As we explained that at a United States ijtima, there was a plan made for flyer distribution, but some of the khudam were feeling hesitant because of that feeling of um, inferiority, that they were afraid about um, expressing their religion publicly. As we explained one reason for their hesitation, that you can know کیونکہ نوجوانوں میں اسلام کے نام پر جو دوسروں سے غلط باتیں سنتے ہیں ان میں ہمارے نوجوان بھی ایسے ہیں جن کو اسلام کا پوری طرح علم نہیں جانتے نہیں تو ان میں احساس کمتری پیدا ہو جاتا ہے حضور ایکسپلین دو دیٹ ون دے ون آؤٹ فار دیٹ فائر ڈسٹریبیوشن دین دے گین کانفیڈنس ایز حضور ایکسپلین ون کین اوور کم دس کمپلیکس بائی انکریسنگ نالج Hazur said elsewhere that so it is essential that you read the Holy Quran and its commentaries and you study the hadith and books of the promised Messiah 
By doing so, you will gain knowledge of your faith and it will remove any lingering traces of an inferiority complex. Another simple example is related to personal boundaries, shaking hands with the opposite sex. This is another point when it comes to being consistent in our ideals when we're at the masjid and when we're away from the masjid. Here, Huzur explained that when we have external functions and we explain to guests that we have these personal boundaries, we don't shake hands with the opposite sex. And Huzur explained that at one function, a guest said to an Ahmadi, he said that your Khalifa is an elderly person and he is the Khalifa. So he might be following his teachings in this regard. But in reality, we will know when you will follow these teachings of Islam. We will know when young men and young women act upon these teachings and refrain from shaking hands. Only then will it become clear, and only then will I know that you are following your teachings. Huzur said that this person has given a big challenge to those Ahmadi men and women who are living here. Now it is your responsibility to act upon even the smallest injunction of your teachings without any sense of inferiority complex, and show to Europeans that we don't have the slightest doubt in the superiority of Islamic teachings. Now people who believe in their principles don't compromise on their boundaries. Take religion out of the equation. People maintain their boundaries. For example, there's some cultures where kissing on the cheeks is the norm. Now somebody who comes from a culture where that's not normal, they're not going to bend just to fit in. They're not going to let somebody kiss them on the cheeks just to fit in. Nor if they're not comfortable with kissing somebody else, they won't do it. They'll respectfully and politely stand by their principles of their boundaries. So when an Ahmadi Muslim has been taught these points of boundaries, then it is all the more our responsibility to stand firm and politely on our principles. Now these are just a few examples of complexes. As mentioned before, a complex is an emotional problem, it is a weakness. Whether it is a superiority complex or an inferiority complex, it's a weakness. Islam does not allow any room for it. It's not permitted in Islam. So an Ahmadi Muslim would rise above all of these because an Ahmadi does not react. He acts based on the truth, based on the teachings of Allah Almighty. So when we preach and teach the message of Islam to others, we have no room to do it with arrogance. Even though what we preach is superior, but we do it with a sense of humility because we are doing it out of sympathy for others. We are doing it because they are suffering the consequences of not following the teachings of Islam and their lives are a testimony to that. They're an example of that. So when we preach the message of Islam to others, despite being established on that which is superior, we convey it with that humility and that sympathy and for the benefit of others. Hazrat Khalifa al Masih Rabi Rahmatullah explained what the ideal is that we should stand for. And he explained this here in the United States. And I'll just summarize briefly what he said in his address that he said that we should develop a grandeur of character within ourselves. He said that the people of Hazrat Noah salam, were not so oversensitive to feel bad because of how other people treated them, how others looked down upon them. They had this grandeur of character within them. They knew that they had belonged to God and God was theirs. And Allah Almighty destroyed an entire nation just because of that small group of people. So Huzur said that we should adopt that grandeur of character within our, ourselves. Huzur explained that leaving aside religious values, I can say on psychological grounds that it is imperative for a nation to prosper, that it should get rid of its inferiority complex and should advance on a straight path. So Huzur said that therefore it is imperative that each and every Ahmadi should get rid of all sorts of inferiority complex. So may Allah Almighty enable us to stand firm on principles and those who may be living a double life, may they overcome those weaknesses. And may we be able to spread the message of Ahmadiyyat and Islam in our country. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَا وَنِي الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نَعْرَى يَتَّبِّي نَعْرَى يَتَّبِّي نَعْرَى يَتَّبِّي Next speaker is Madil Abdullah Sahib, Sadar Khudam Al-Ahmadiyya. He's going to talk about modesty and embarrassment or a distinction. Madhir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika lahu. وأشهد أن محمدا نبده ورسوله أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
You might not see what I'm holding up, but this little thing destroyed people's lives a few centuries ago. In the 16th century, tulips were introduced in Holland, which at the time was Europe's most advanced society. Because tulips were foreign and exotic, the wealthy took to them. Pretty soon, tulips and tulip bulbs, like the one I'm holding, became a status symbol. And it wasn't long before the middle and lower class also started getting into the tulip game. But after a while, something strange happened. Because everyone loved tulips so much, people started buying tulips not to keep them, but to sell them for huge profits. This practice of buying just to sell became so intense that eventually one person even traded his house for three rare tulips. Despite this mania, for a while, everything was fine. Until one day in 1637, the tulip auction opened, just like it always had. A few bulbs were offered up at a crazy price, but unlike every other day, no one bid. People thought it was weird, but no one said anything. The price was lowered a bit, but again, no one bid. Everyone was looking at everyone else to figure out why no one was buying the bulbs. No one knew what was going on. As time passed, the bid got lower and lower until finally the tulip sold for 5% of the original price. And that's when people panicked. Across Holland, the price of tulips crashed and some people lost everything. What took nearly a century to build vanished in four days. The irrational excitement and attachment towards tulips ended abruptly. This pursuit of wealth and status came to an end when the Dutch realized they were simply trying to fit in and were recklessly following a trend even when it came at a loss of total material wealth. Like this bulb centuries ago, many of us think that ignoring haya, modesty, is a little thing. But we are too dumb to see that it's going to destroy us. Today, in the name of modernity, many fashion trends promote immodesty. The clothing is often revealing. Movies, songs, and TV shows regularly show inappropriate dialogue and graphic scenes which are indecent and vulgar. To follow these trends and abandon one's values is a recipe for disaster. Unfortunately, many fall victim to the idea that participating in these trends and activities is of no real consequence. Many are not only complicit in adopting these fashion trends, watching and listening to indecency and vulgarity themselves, but also encourage others to do so in the name of fitting in, feeling that by not doing so, their material progress or societal acceptance is compromised. An example of this is when some of us encourage our wives to discard the hijab, or when we ignore ghade basar by not lowering our gaze, watch pornography, lewd dancing, or listen to vulgar lyrics. By doing so, we lack the conviction of faith and are unable to withstand the perceived pressure and think that it, hamper, it hampers our acceptance and progress in society. In reality, we lose our moral compass, resulting not in a loss of material wealth, but in a total destruction of our religious and moral values. Homes have been wrecked because of this ignorance. Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih, the fifth Ayatollah Ta'ala bin Asal Aziz, even had to address it during the final khutbah of his 2018 USA tour. So it's crucial we understand why it's happening and what we can do about it. 
Part of the reason tulip mania happened is because of a phenomena called temporal discounting, which basically means people value immediate happiness rather than waiting, even if that means we're worse off in the long run. Shaitan thrives on temporal discounting because a lot of times we don't realize how sin can hurt us until it's too late. But look at the data. Su studies suggest that the more you watch pornography, the more likely you are to engage in risky, violent, even deviant sexual behavior, to be vulnerable to depression, to experience physical changes to your brain, and to experience erectile dysfunction. Hazrat Khalifat al-Masih V himself said that such people suffer because when they try to perform naturally, they are unable to do so. Right now, everything may seem good, but that's because the Quran, that's because the world, like the Quran says, is a gurur, an illusion. The root of the Arabic word dunya, or world, means that which is near while the root of the Arabic word akhir or afterlife means that which is distant or delayed. So it makes sense that if you're indulging in these vices, you may not immediately see the harm. Temporal discounting is built into the system. But if things get bad, and if you continue on this path, they probably will. Don't be so naive to think that those who follow Islam will bail you out. That day the tulip market crashed, everything was okay for that person trying to sell his bulb, until it wasn't. When the market crashed, the courts refused to take on cases, forcing people to figure things out for themselves, and some were destroyed. So if you're indulging in these vices, or encouraging your spouse to discard her hijab, really ask yourself how much hope you have that when the time for your rishta or your kid's rishta comes, you won't get a partner just like you. That such a marriage will last. That one day you or your kids won't come home to a broken home. That your kids won't copy you, making your legacy one of behayay, of immodesty. Who here would risk bidding on that? And just to be clear, the Khulafa's views on this subject are even more sobering. Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih the fourth, rahmullah said the prayer of a woman who discards her parda has no value. And he added, worry consumes their every moment. Similarly, Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih the fifth warned that people who ignore ghadi basr don't reach God. And if none of this shakes you, then just know that Hazrat Masih Maud salam, likens those who can't control their libido to kutte or to dogs. Hearing this, some may say, look, you've got it all wrong. We know the risks, but we still do it because it's too hard because of the optics, because we are afraid of how people will look at us. Tulip mania happened and other similar trends keep happening because of this type of thinking. Because we care too much about what others think. Remember with tulip mania, people wanted to be accepted by high society. A society that would never accept them. That inferiority complex eventually caused their financial ruin. All because of something that only existed in their minds. We are also suffering from an inferiority complex. We conflate the modern world with what's refined and haya with what's backwards. Some of us so badly crave the approval of our peers that we tell our wives to not wear the hijab because people will stare, because it'll hurt our chances of a promotion at work. And these fantasies are so powerful that we ignore how this is compromising our wives' honor. We ignore the very real disease in this society 
that the more uncovered a woman is, the more likely it is that she's inviting lewd comments from men. As far as worrying what other people think, I wonder if that crowd has ever questioned if the people they're putting on a pedestal really deserve to be there. Just as one example, there's an American woman whose books have sold more than 13 million copies and about whose life Hollywood has made two movies, grossing over $300 million. Time magazine named her one of the 100 most influential people. Most would look at her and say she's high society. This high society lady said that there was a time in her life when she was divorced, depressed, and lost. She starts traveling the world and ends up in a remote fishing village. One day she becomes violently sick with food poisoning. Now you have to appreciate her frame of mind at this point. She's halfway around the world, she's got no one, she doesn't speak the language, she's all alone. All of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. When she opens, she sees a hijabi standing in front of her. The backstory is this hijabi and the American woman would see each other in morning walks. The hijabi would put her hand on her heart, smile, the American woman would do the same, and they'd both go on their way. But that day, the American woman didn't show up for a morning walk, so the hijabi got worried. The hijabi knocked on every cabin in the village looking for her. Eventually, she got to the American woman's cabin and seeing how pathetic she looked, made a gesture to wait. This hijabi, herself poor, uneducated, and a widow with three young children, came back in one hour with fresh water and fresh food. The American, the high society figure says, I just started crying and she held me in her arms like I was her child. That was the most grace I have experienced in my entire life. I didn't know her name, I still don't, but she is my face of Islam. This is the reality of the lives of the people we put on a pedestal and the power of Haya. But somehow we just can't see that the status we afford them exists only in our minds. And just like this supposed high society, we also fall victim to these trends because we misread the signs. Tulip mania happened to a society that unlike much of Europe, had a thriving merchant class, where the rich weren't just people who sat on land their families owned for centuries. Some mistook this exceptionalism for invincibility, thinking this next venture in a tulips was also a sure shot. One way to underscore this is to note that the Dutch liked striped tulips the most, because the stripes made the tulips look beautiful. But what they didn't know is that those stripes were the result of a virus that made the tulip sick and less likely to reproduce. Sadly, we are also afflicted with this disease of misreading the signs. And just like the Quran says, Shaitan has made it. Fazaina lahum, i.e. appear beautiful to us. We tell ourselves, we pay our janda, we love hazur, we even do nafo. It's okay if we don't do ghade basar or our wives don't wear hijab. But we ignore or probably don't know that the verses of the Quran about ghade basar and parda in chapter 24 verse 31 to 32 are from Surah An-Nur. Surah An-Nur is unique in the sense that it's the only surah in the entire Quran that says every verse of the surah is farz, is obligatory. The Quran at the beginning of Surah An-Nur says, we have made this surah faraznaha, obligatory. Don't be a fool, ghade basar or parda are not optional. 
Are we reason? Well, if watching something I shouldn't was really that bad, or telling my wife to not wear hijab was bad, why am I living a good life? By that logic, every billionaire is way more pious than you. Even those at the top whose sins have become known to the world. Again, the Quran warns us to not misread the signs. As to those who believe not in the hereafter, we have made their deeds appear beautiful to them, so they are wandering blindly. So you don't have to experience that crash in this life. Everything can look fine, but on Qiyamat, you'll be asked about these furs that you rejected. And in a way, it makes sense that even though it's the biggest sign, we don't see what will happen on Qiyamat. It's understandable if we can't see that far. That's exactly how Iman bil Ghaib works. You don't see the effects of accepting or rejecting the belief in the unseen for a while. Regardless, if you are in doubt, about the second life, the Quran in chapter 22 verse 6 says to look at your present life, the one you can see. The basic idea is that there was a time when you were just a fetus with no idea of your existence or even that anything existed. And even though your parents were conscious, a barrier between the two of you made it impossible to communicate. Why can't you see that this can happen again? In closing, the biggest lesson of tulip mania is that many people just don't learn their lesson. People today discredit tulip mania as something marginal and something that happened centuries ago, even though they lived through other failed trends like cryptocurrency or metaverse. Experts once projected Facebook's virtual reality project metaverse would generate as much as $13 trillion, but it's lost $25 billion in just two years. And those same experts now consider it a failure. Just like those people swept up in these trends, we try to find excuses, some loophole, to indulge in, in what we know we can't. We tell ourselves whatever the case may be, it's too hard to start over now. What will people think if my wife starts wearing hijab all of a sudden? It'll be too awkward. The fact is that even if it's hard, it'll only be hard for a short while. Or you may learn that the people you've been shaping your lives around never cared whether your wife was wearing a hijab or not. It's like a joke that says, when you're 20, you care what everyone thinks. When you're 40, you stop caring what everyone thinks. And when you're 60, you realize no one ever cared enough to think about you in the first place. Or we make the excuse that we're not guilty of anything serious because we're faithful to our spouse. About such thinking, Hazrat Masih Salam says, you would have a point if you could prove that a lack of Ghade Basar or Parda fostered chastity in this society. But the fact is the opposite is true. And you should know that Islam considers watching dirty movies or masturbation as adultery. Hazrat Khalifat al-Masih V said that the promised Messiah would call this behavior an adultery of the mind. Balil insanu ala nafsihi basira Walau alka ma'azira Nay, man is a witness against himself even though he puts forward his excuses. Other times, if we realize it's bad, we make the excuse that we're so far gone that there's no point in trying to repent and fix ourselves. There's no way that Allah Ta'ala will forgive us. The good news, by the way, I know what we've discussed so far has a harsh tone, but that's because the nature of the conversation demands it. But the good news is that the door for forgiveness and new life is almost always open. 
It reminds me of a story about a group of people that prayed to end a drought. After praying, Allah revealed to one of them that their prayer was rejected because a man in that group had sinned for more than 40 years. Until he left, their prayer would not be accepted. So an announcement was made that so-and-so sinner must leave. Naturally, the sinner starts to worry. He looks left and he looks right, hoping someone would leave. Because if he gets up, everyone is going to know that he's the sinner. But no one gets up. Eventually, he realizes there's no way out. So he quietly prays, bitterly weeping for Allah to forgive him. He then covers himself and leaves quietly. Soon after that, it begins to rain. This surprises the group's leader. So he asks Allah, how could this happen when the sinner didn't come forward? Allah says he accepted the group's prayer precisely because of the sinner's repentance. That reply fascinates the leader, so he asks Allah to identify the person. But Allah doesn't do that. Instead, he says, I did not expose him when he was disobeying me and had covered him when he was a sinner. How then do you expect me to expose him when he has returned to me as a sincere repentant? Notice that every time today we discussed an action involving behayay, immodesty, the end result was more anxiety. And that's because aside from modesty, one of the meanings of the Arabic word haya is literally freedom from worry. There's a reason that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, every religion has an innate character. The character of Islam is modesty. It's through observing haya that you get the peace Islam promises. And it's by rejecting haya that your life becomes a mess. So if you're not married and want to be worthy of having a pious spouse, make haya your source of distinction. And until you get married, do voluntary fast as Prophet Muhammad wasallam instructed. And whether you're married or unmarried, if you've slipped, turn to Allah Ta'ala. Beg Him for help, beg Him for forgiveness, and beg Him to grant you haya before it's too late. Or don't learn the lesson so many others also refuse to, and face what Hazrat Masimah said specifically about those who discard haya, a life that is haram or talkh, grievous and bitter. Jazakallah. Jazakumullah. Jazakumullah. So our last speaker is Sahib Zada Usman Latif Sahib and uh, he's going to talk to us about Khilafat holding fast to the rope of Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh amma ba'du fa'uzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim وعد الله الذين آمنوا منكم وعملوا الصالحات ليستخلفنهم في الأرض كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم 
ولیمک نن لهم دینهم الذي ارتضى لهم ولا يبدلنهم من بعد خوفهم امنا یا بدوننی لا یشرکون بی شیعا ومن کفر بعد ذالکا فولائکا هم الفاسکون اللہ has promised to those among you who believe and do good works that he will surely make them successors in the earth as he made successors from among those who were before them and that he will surely establish for them their religion which he has chosen for them and that he will surely give them in exchange security and peace after their fear. They will worship me and they will not associate anything with me, then whoso is ungrateful after that, they will be the rebellious. Chapter 24, verse 56. May 26, 1908. The sad day when the promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, alayhi salatu was salam, passed away. The enemies of Ahmadiyyad became more ferocious and blatantly announced their plans to end the mission of the Promised Messiah. One paper named Wakil from Amritsar on June 3, 1908 wrote, If anyone asks us, then we are ready to truly say that if it is at all possible for Muslims, they should throw the books of Mirza not into the book portions, but into a burning furnace. They should not end the matter here, but see to it that in future no Muslim or non-Muslim historian mentions his name in the history of India or that of Islam. They mocked the establishment of Khilafat after the demise of the Promised Messiah and one paper, the Kurdan Gazette wrote, now nothing is left in the Mirzais. Their head has been cut off. One man who has been elected as their Imam is not capable of doing anything except that he would teach you the Ahmadis Quran in a mosque. Dear friends, the time of the demise of the Prophet of Allah is indeed a very challenging time and perhaps the most challenging time for all the believers. The enemies are happy and overjoyous at the possibility of the entire community of believers to falter and go astray. The shaitan and his accomplices declare a premature victory and the forces of darkness sense an opportunity to dethrone the reign of Allah that had been established by his prophet. And the people of faith are in a state of fear. It has happened since time immemorial, the Promised Messiah salam, says, that is also what happened at the time of Moses salam, when he died on his way from Egypt to Canaan before taking the Israelites to the intended destination in accordance with the promise. At his death, Israelites were plunged into deep mourning. It is written in Torah that with the grief at this untimely death and the sudden departure of Moses salam, the Israelites wept for 40 days. The same happened with Christ salam. At the time of the incident of crucifixion, all his disciples scattered and even one of them apostatized. Now most of us all know what happened at the time of the demise of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam. The Promised Messiah salam, says, when the demise of the Holy Prophet وسلم, was considered untimely and many an ignorant Bedouin turned apostate. The companions of the Holy Prophet وسلم, too, stricken with grief, became like those who lose their senses. But Allah the Rahman, Allah the Rahim, won't just let his creation and especially those who believe in him at the mercy of their enemies. The vulnerable souls who are already being tested by anxiety and fear at the departure of their beloved are consoled and comforted by Allah himself. And he extends to them 
his rope to hold on to in order to protect them from the mischief of the surroundings. The rope, which is referred to by the promised Messiah as the second manifestation of God's grace, and a rope which is the lifeline for the community of the believers and the ultimate source of comfort, satisfaction and protection for them. And this very rope, as we all know it, is Khilafat. And that, my dear friends, is the topic for my today's speech. Khilafat, holding fast to the rope of Allah. Respected Naib Amir Sahib and my dear friends, Hazrat Masih Ma'ud alayhi salatu wasalam says, غرض وہ دو قسم کی قدرت ظاہر کرتا ہے اول خود نبیوں کے ہاتھ سے اپنی قدرت کا ہاتھ دکھاتا ہے اور دوسرے ایسے وقت میں جب نبی کی وفات کے بعد مشکلات کا سامنا پیدا ہو جاتا ہے اور دشمن زور میں آ جاتے ہیں اور خیال کرتے ہیں کہ اب کام بگڑ گیا اور یقین کر لیتے ہیں کہ اب یہ جماعت نابود ہو جائے گی اور خود جماعت کے لوگ بھی تردد میں پڑ جاتے ہیں اور ان کی کمریں ٹوٹ جاتی ہیں اور کئی بدقسمت مرتد ہونے کی راہیں اختیار کر لیتے ہیں تب خدا تعالیٰ دوسری مرتبہ اپنی زبردست قدرت ظاہر کرتا ہے اور گرتی ہوئی جماعت کو سنبھال لیتا ہے پس وہ جو اخیر تک صبر کرتا ہے خدا تعالیٰ کے اس معجزہ کو دیکھتا ہے دس ہی مینیفیسٹ ٹو کائنڈ آف پاورس First, he shows the hand of his power at the hands of his prophets themselves. Second, when with the death of a prophet, difficulties and problems arise and the enemy feels stronger and thinks that things are in disarray and is convinced that now this Jamaat will become extinct and even members of the Jamaat too are in a quandary and their backs are broken. And some of the unfortunate ones choose paths that lead to apostasy. Then it is that God for the second time shows his mighty power and supports and take care of the shaken Jamaat. Thus one who remains steadfast till the end witnesses this miracle of God. And my friends, true are the words of the Promised Messiah As we see the Jamaat of the Promised Messiah flourish and thrive under the banner of Khilafat, while the opponents like the ones whom I quoted at the beginning of the speech are nowhere to be seen or noticed. But it's only the steadfast and the resolute souls for whom Allah Ta'ala has made the promise amna. That is after the fear we shall firmly re-establish you. Fear be it at a communal level or at a personal level, the answer is hold fast to the rope of Allah, the Khilafat. Communal fear that the sacred mission initiated by the Prophet of Allah might begin to stall. The answer, hold on to the rope. Personal fear that our children or ourselves might go astray. The answer, hold on to the rope. Communal fear. Who will be the arbitrator in cases of our disputes? The answer, hold on to the rope. Personal fear. Who will interpret the laws of Allah in cases of confusion or deliberation? The answer, hold on to the rope. Communal fear. How should we as a community respond to contemporary issues like parda, jihad, blasphemy, apostasy, gender identity, homosexuality, social media, etc. The answer, hold on to the rope. Personal fear, what career path to choose? Where to find a good rishta or a match for marriage? Travel-related anxiety, fear of exam, health-related concern, and even what to name one's newborn child? The answer, hold on to the rope. Communal fear, how to display 
and restrain and maintain composure under extreme oppression, like the recent incident of banning of Qurbani on Eid al-Adha in Pakistan. How to react to global unrest and market instability? How to utilize social media in a meaningful manner and not for other time-wasting shenanigans? And how to react and respond as a responsible community when an unfortunate event like the burning of Quran in Sweden happened, the answer, hold on to the rope, the Khilafat. And we have seen it time and time again, when in response to the unfortunate events of Danish cartoons, or Charlie Hebdo, or the publication of satanic verses, the rest of the Muslim world was busy disgracing and defaming Islam by protesting with burning tires and effigies, blocking roads and destroying properties, and even issuing fatwas to kill the opponents. The people adhering to the rope, they were the ones who were guided by their Khalifa and responded in the most meaningful manner by waging a jihad with pen and defended the Islam and its Holy Prophet wasallam by their actions and deeds. Alhamdulillah. And why do we need to hold on to the rope? Because Allah Ta'ala says, وَاتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَاسْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ مِسْكُنْ تُمْ آدَان فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ كُلُوبِكُمْ فَاسْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ يَخْوَانَا وَكُنْ تُمْ عَلَى شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ فَانْكَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ آيَاتِهِ لَأَلَّكُمْ تَحْتَدُونَ And hold fast all together by the rope of Allah and be not divided. And remember the favor of Allah which He bestowed upon you when you were enemies and He united your hearts in love. So that by His grace you became as brothers and you were on the brink of a pit of fire and He saved you from it. Thus does Allah explain to you His commandments that you may be guided. Chapter 3, verse 104. Hadha Khalifatul Masih Rabe, Rahimullah Ta'ala, in his commentary of these verses say, Yahaan jamaat ka mazmoon bayan ho raha hai, Ke Allah ki rassi ko thame baghair, Tumhari jamiyat kaim nahi reh sakti. Meaning, that this verse is laying emphasis on a collective effort on holding fast to the rope of Allah. La Allah kum tahtadoon. So that you may be guided. The verse also refers to an incident as it says, And remember the favor of Allah which he bestowed upon you when you were enemies and he united your hearts in love. According to some researchers, this basically refers to the Jewish tribes of Oth and Khazraj residing in Medina, which were sworn enemies of each other for a very long time. But after the divine message of Islam came, and those tribes came under the fold of Islam, they turned into Ansars, and the epitomes of brotherhood, and were saved from the imminent disaster of tribal wars and bloodshed. So my dear friends, is it a mere coincidence that now when we claim that Khilafat Alam and Haji Nabuwat has been established, meaning that Khilafat on the precept of prophethood has been established in jamaat e that we see the same brotherhood amongst the members of Jamaat like the Ansars of Medina. Why is it that a person like me with a background from Afghanistan and with no connection to the far-flung areas of interior Punjab or Sindh or Western Africa or Europe or America or for that matter anywhere in the world is always welcomed by my Ahmadi brothers with an open arm and smiles on their faces. Why is it that we living in the comforts of the Western world feel restless and spend sleepless nights and shed tears before Allah? and pray in the wee hours of the night when we hear about the hardships faced by our brothers and sisters in Burkina Faso or Pakistan or Bangladesh or Indonesia or elsewhere. It is the miracle of the rope, the rope of nizam khilafat that has bound our hearts with love and care for each other regardless of our race, our country of origin or our skin color. 
We are all united and kept together like pearls in a necklace by this very rope, the Khilafat. Alhamdulillah. Allah Dear friends, in order to understand how truly blessed we are to be the part of the Jamaat with a divinely guided Khalifa and how big of a blessing Khilafat is, let's briefly look at the history of Khilafat in Islam. The Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is reported to have observed, Prophethood shall remain among you as long as God wills. Then Khilafat on the pattern of prophethood will commence and remain as long as he wills. There shall then be a tyrannical despotism which will remain as long as God wills. Then once again, Khilafat will emerge on the precept of prophethood. Masnad Ahmad bin Hanbal. This hadith precisely identifies and lays out the future events of Islam where the khilafat e rashida or rightly guided khilafat was established upon the demise of the holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it lasted for 29 years. This was followed by monarchy and tyrannical rulers in the form of 14 Umayyad rulers of Damascus, 36 Abbasi monarchs of Baghdad, and on the sidelines, the title of Khalifa was also used by the Umayyad branch of the rulers of Cordova, Spain, and the Fatimid rulers of Egypt between the 7th and the 12th century. And finally, the Ottoman monarchs who all acquired the titles of Khalifa, and this so-called Khilafat lasted until the beginning of the 20th century. A careful analysis will confirm that even though caliphates have emerged sporadically and in different pockets since the time of the Holy Prophet wasallam, but none of them could sustain and none of them could withstand the test of time because none of them were established on the precept of prophethood. It's only the khilafat e ahmadiyya which was established on the precept of prophethood. Just as prophesied by our master, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa wasallam and therefore has remained intact and has flourished and has thrived and is inshallah going to stay till the day of judgment as prophesied by Promised Messiah and we must hold fast to this rope and safeguard it dearly. Hazrat Hakim Malvi Nuruddin, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih Awal ta'ala anhu said, your state in the hands of the Imam of the age should be like a dead body in the hands of a ghassal, one who bathes the body for burial. Huzur farmate hain, your state in the hands of the imam of the age should be like a dead body in the hands of a ghassal. All your aims and wishes should be dead and you should attach yourself with the imam as carriages are attached with an engine. Then see for yourself that you emerge out of darkness or not. We have been granted this age of Khilafat after 1300 years and if it is not safeguarded, it will never come again in future till the day of resurrection. Thus be grateful for this blessing because thankfulness increases the blessings. Further stressing the importance of this point, Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad, Hazrat Khalifatul Masisani ta'ala anhu said, Is baat ko khub achi tarah yaad rakho ke khilafat hablullah hai. Huzur farmate hain, is baat ko khub achi tarah yaad rakho ke khilafat hablullah hai. Or aisi rasi hai ke isi ko pakad kar tum tarakki kar sakte ho. Isko jo chhod dega, wo tabah ho jayega. Be exceedingly mindful of the fact that Khilafat is the Hablullah. It is such a rope of God that holding fast to it alone will lead you to progress. The one who will let go of it will be destroyed. Dear friends, the blessings of Khilafat are day clear and are manifest before our eyes and well established. But let me also highlight the immense impact 
of the physical presence of Khalifa in our spiritual progress, reaffirmation of our faith and growth. Recently, the USA Jamaat was blessed with the visit of our beloved Imam when Huzur Hazrat Khalifa al Masih al Khamis, Sayyidullah Ta'ala bin Nasr al Aziz, decided to come to the US for the inauguration of a couple of mosques, including the Fatih Azim mosques, Mosque in Zion, Illinois. This was a visit that was much awaited, and we were all eager to have our beloved Khalifa among us after a long time. The excitement and build-up was unprecedented. And then the day came when our Huzur finally reached the city of Zion. The chants of Nara Takbir, Allahu Akbar, filled the atmosphere. The love, affection, and respect were of such a magnitude that would make any worldly leader only envious of the stature of this man of God. Khuddam, Ansar, and Lajla worked tirelessly to make the arrangements and yet were beaming with joy for they were able to serve the Khalifa and his Jamaat. The spiritual transformation experienced by many and especially our youth by the mere presence of Huzur was astounding. Reported in the Huzur's travel diary was the experience of a young Nigerian couple who traveled from Florida to meet Huzur in Dallas, Texas. Speaking about their mulaqat, the wife said, Now I feel a deeper connection with Khilafat after meeting Huzur. The love in my heart for Khilafat has increased, and I'm certain we will see a lot of positive changes and blessings in our lives because of this mulaqat. After listening to his wife's reflection, the husband added, I already feel that being in his presence has purified my mind and soul, and it has motivated me to do more Jamaat work and to ensure the moral training of our children. Another person fortunate to meet Huzur in Dallas was our brother from Pakistan, who had moved to the U.S. a few years ago. This gentleman had endured significant pain and challenges over the past 13 years, including religious persecution, loss of his father and young siblings, and the pain of leaving behind his family in Pakistan. He was extremely emotional and reflected on his mulaqat as follows. He said, honestly, Today I can say that the last 13 years of struggle and hardships were wiped away when I met Huzur. Alhamdulillah, after meeting him, I feel so much relief in my soul and the burdens and pain of the last 13 years have been lifted. I feel that Allah has given me an even greater reward to all of the challenges, hardships and struggles I had faced. I gained peace of heart today when I met Huzur. A young Khadim who met Huzur for the first time said, the mulaqat and Huzur's guidance have had a profound impact on me. It has rejuvenated my interest to study and to serve Jamaat. Huzur's sagacious and thoughtful advice made me realize how much he cares about me as an individual. The spiritual elevation I felt during Huzur visit is something I have never felt before. And then there was an Arab brother who after meeting Huzur said, Whilst meeting Huzur, it felt as though God has descended from heaven. My prayers and worships were different in his presence. I felt a special energy entering my body and the concentration, pleasure and humility I felt in my prayers after meeting him were extremely special. Dear friends, this love and affection has got to be divinely instilled. For no worldly power can enchant one's heart to such a degree. But the most important thing is that this love is mutual. Our beloved Imam says, Before sleeping at night, there is no country of the world that I do not visit in my imagination and no Ahmadi for whom I do not pray while sleeping and whilst awake. I'm not doing any favor because this is my duty and may Allah enable me to ever increase in assuming my responsibilities. The only reason I have said this is to make it clear that there can be no comparison between Khilafat and the other worldly or secular leaders.
Dear friends, in the end, let me reiterate the importance of holding fast to the rope of Allah, the Khilafat. And how else better to highlight than in the words of our Imam, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih al-Khamis, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Nusri al-Aziz. In a special address to Jamaat at the Khilafat centenary celebration, Huzur Anwar instructed the Jamaat as follows. Huzur said, بس اے میرے پیاروں اور میرے پیاروں کے پیاروں اٹھو حضور فرماتے ہیں بس اے میرے پیاروں اور میرے پیاروں کے پیاروں اٹھو آج اس انعام کی حفاظت کے لیے نئے عظم اور ہمت سے اپنے عہد کو پورا کرنے کے لیے اللہ تعالیٰ کے حضور گرتے ہوئے اس سے مدد مانگتے ہوئے میدان میں کود پڑو کہ اسی میں تمہاری بقا ہے اسی میں تمہاری نسلوں کی بقا ہے اور اسی میں انسانیت کی بقا ہے فار آس ٹو بی دا بینیفیشریز آف دا بلیسنگ آف ایور لاسٹنگ خلافت حضور سیٹ سو او مائی بلوڈ اینڈ دا بلوڈ آف مائی بلوڈ رائز اپ رائز اپ فار دا ڈیفینس آف دس باؤنٹی دا خلافت وتھ ڈٹرمنیشن اینڈ کریج ٹو فلفل دا پلیج باؤنگ بفور گاڈ آل مائٹی سیکنگ ہز ہیلپ مارچ فورتھ Because in this alone lies your survival. In it is the survival of your generations and the survival of humanity. May Allah enable us to live up to the expectations of our beloved Imam. And may we be the beneficiaries of the immense blessings associated with holding fast to this rope of Allah, the Khilafat. Rabbana la tuzikh kulubana baada is hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma. ان کا انت البہ جزاکلا حضرت خاتم المبیا غلام احمد کی غلام احمد کی خلافت احمدیا خلافت احمدیا خلافت احمدیا Jazakum Allah. <clears throat> My gratitude to all the presenters and the speakers for a job well done. May Allah bless all of you. And my thanks to all of you for being present and being patient and listening carefully. May Allah guide you and protect all of you. So before we adjourn, there are a few announcements. Please listen to those and then we'll adjourn. we see that God Almighty sends the teachings because those teachings were confined to specific for a specific people or nation and those teachings were not complete teachings those teachings were for the specific group of people but through the Holy Quran and Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he was Rahmatan Lil Alameen and that he was a prophet for, for the all of mankind So that's why there was a need for a complete teachings. For example, if someone has done any harm, we have a right to take revenge, but if we forgive, that is better. So this is the middle path that uh, Holy Quran or Allah Almighty asks us to follow. Whereas when we see the secular or the philosophers, their teachings are on one extreme. But when we look at the Holy Quran, we find that the teachings of the Holy Quran are complete. So that's why we say that the, this is a complete book. That's why Allah Ta'ala said in the Holy Quran that today I have perfected your religion for you. So this book is perfect book and these teachings are perfect teachings. So that's why we say that this book is a superior than any other scripture that we find today. And by following the Holy Quran, we can always stay on the right and the middle path. 
کلام پا کے رحم ہے السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ ویلکم بیک ٹو دا اسٹوڈیوز ہیئر ایف ایم ٹی اے انٹرنیشنل یو ایس اے ایم شیور یو آل انجوائنگ دا اسپیچز آف دا فرسٹ سیشن of the morning session of day two of Jalsa Salana USA 2023. And I'm here with Mansoor Qureshi Sahib. Mansoor Qureshi Sahib, we have enjoyed those speeches and I'm sure our viewers have enjoyed those speeches. Let's give them a glimpse of what it is that uh, highlights of what it is that they heard in that first session. Yes, yes, Imam Sahib, uh, Jalsa Salana is the same way with your love and love. Now, there is another speech that is the second 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 speech. بہترین موضوعات بہترین تقاریر اور مقررین نے بڑی خوبصورتی کے ساتھ اپنی قرآن کریم کی تعلیمات کی روشنی میں ان مضامین کو بیان کیا ہے سب سے پہلی تقریر جو کہ امریکہ میں احمدیت اسلام احمدیت کی شروعات سے متعلق تھی حبیب شفیق صاحب نے حضرت مسیم عدد علیہ السلاۃ السلام کے وقت سے شروع کر کے اور پھر جس طرح مفتی صادق صاحب یہاں تشریف لائے اور جس جس محنت سے جہاں فشانی سے انہوں نے کام کیا اور بے شمار لوگوں تک اسلام احمدیت کا جو پیغام ہے حضرت مسلم السلام کا پیغام پہنچ رہا ہے اس کے اوپر روشنی ڈالی اور جو چیز تھی جو کہ ظاہر تھی اور کہ کئی جماعتوں جماعتیں بنی شروع کے اور یہاں کے بہت سارے افریقن امیریکن جو احباب ہیں وہ اس میں شامل ہیں سینکڑوں کی تعداد میں تو مربی صاحب آپ اس بارے میں بیان کریں گے کس طرح سے اس وقت جوش و خروش کے ساتھ یہ احباب جماعت میں شامل ہوئے Absolutely, it's important to know the history because Ahmadiyyad actually started in the United States, as the speaker said, in 1897 when Alexander Webb Sahib had uh, communicated with the Prophet Muhammad So that's where it started. But I should cause that message to reach the corners of the earth. Hazrat Muslim Muhammad Talan who says he was sending Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Sahib in fulfillment of that prophecy to establish the Jamaat in the USA. And of course, the first people that accepted Ahmadiyyad right in that beginning in many, many numbers as the speaker said, were well, the African-Americans. And those were difficult times yes. in the history of uh, African-Americans in this country too. But to see them embrace true Islam of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, enlightening to hear the speaker highlight all of those. Absolutely. And this is Allah's fuzzle, which is what Allah Ta'ala has given us. At that time, their hearts were ready for this program. And they also did it and did it and did it. And in a very powerful way, they were still in the Islam of Islam. And after that, Habib Shafiq Sahib has اس تقریر میں جو بعد میں آنے والی مشنریز تھیں ان کا بھی ذکر کیا اور جو خوبصورتی سے انہوں نے بیان کیا وہ مفتی صادق صاحب کی جو جو خواہشات تھیں تین بڑی خواہشات تھیں کہ ایک جماعت قائم ہو ایک رسالہ جو کہ مسلم سن رائز کی صورت میں ہوا اور پھر ایک مساجد کی تعمیر کا موقع اللہ تعالیٰ عطا کرے کس طرح خدا تعالیٰ نے ایک حضرت مسیم صاحب کے صحابی کی دعاؤں کو قبول کیا اور وہ ساری ان کی خواہشات جو کہ ان کی ذاتی نہیں تھیں اسلام اور احمدیت کے لیے تھی وہ اللہ تعالیٰ نے قبول کی اس کے بعد دو تقاریر جو کہ ہوئی ہیں بیک ٹو بیک آگے پیچھے پہلی مربی رضوان خان صاحب نے جو ہماری احمدی ہے ہونے کی حیثیت سے جو آئیڈینٹی ہے اس کے بارے میں اور بعض دفعہ نوجوانوں میں یہ مشکل پڑ جاتی ہے کہ ہم اپنے آپ کو احمدی بھی دکھائیں اور امریکی سوسائٹی میں بھی شامل ہوں وہ جو ایک چیلنج ہے اس کے بارے میں ذکر کیا کہ کیسے یہ ایک احساس کمتری کی وجہ سے ہو سکتا ہے کیونکہ جو سچائی پہ ہو اور ہمیں معلوم ہے کہ اسلام احمدیت سچائی پر ہے تو اس پہ ہمیں اس چیزوں سے گھبرانے کی ضرورت نہیں ہے کسی قسم کی کمتری کی ضرورت نہیں ہے تو مربی صاحب آپ سے میں اس تقریر کے حوالے سے بات کروں گا کہ کس طرح آپ نوجوانوں کے ساتھ بیٹھتے اٹھتے ہیں تو رضوان خان صاحب نے اس اینگل کو بھی بتایا کہ کیسے نوجوانوں کے دل میں سوال آیا یس یس مرب رضوان خان صاحب اسپیچ ایٹ واز پاورفل بیکاز دی چیلنجز دیٹ یوز آر فیسنگ مین اینڈ ویمین یونگ بوائز اینڈ گرلس ان دس کنٹری اینڈ سم ٹائمس دی ٹرن اراؤنڈ لکنگ فار اینسرز ٹو ٹیکل دیٹ ہیڈ آن ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ ہومو سیکچولیٹی ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ دی ڈرگس ان دی سوسائٹی ان الکوہل اینڈ کڈس گو ٹو اسکول اینڈ دے ایکسپوز دے گو ٹو شاپنگ اینڈ میٹ پیپل So to kind of empower them is really important because these questions are everywhere Milkul. on social media. So to be able to come to the Jamaat and again, Huzur giving missionaries that training and that confidence to tackle these. And Huzur himself had said that um, no allegation or criticism can't be addressed. So everything has an answer. So for people to come here and hear these 
words of confidence in the teachings of Islam again in light of the Holy Quran as the theme yeah, is beautiful yeah. and of course viewers watching at home as well. Yeah, and in this talk, there is a very important thing for the young people and for all of us that these trends that are coming today are the things that are coming. In the world, there are also some of the things that have come to this world that have come and gone. There is no relationship with them. But the world understands that this is the relationship. لیکن جب تک کہ ہم اصل حقیقت جو کہ اللہ تعالیٰ ہے قرآن کریم ہے اور احمدی کی اسلام کی تعلیم ہے اس پر عمل کریں گے تو یہ ٹرینڈ آتے جاتے رہیں گے اور ان سے ہمیں گھبرانی کی کوئی ضرورت نہیں ہے اور اس کے بعد جو تقریر تھی صدر قدام الحمدیہ نے وہ موڈسٹی کے اوپر کی اور یہ بھی بہت اہم موضوع ہے آج کل کے حساب کے ساتھ اور صدر صاحب قدام الحمدیہ اس چیز کو نوجوانوں کے ساتھ ہر وقت اس کا سامنا کرتے ہیں کہ بعض دفعہ خدام یا بڑے بھی شرم محسوس کرتے ہیں کہ ان کی بیگمات ان کے ساتھ جب جاتی ہیں کہ تو وہ حجاب پہنتی ہیں پردہ کرتی ہیں تو انہوں نے تفصیل کے ساتھ اس چیز کو بیان کیا کہ یہ شرم کی بجائے ایک فخر کا مقام ہے کہ خدا تعالیٰ نے ان کو اپنے اصول پر عمل کرنے کی توفیق دی ہے تو آپ بھی اس چیز کو فیس کرتے ہوں گے یس 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 ایسی دیس ان مائی فیلڈ آف ورک ایس ای مشنری ورکنگ ویس پیپل تو گیو دیم دیٹ کانفیڈنس دیٹ اسلام ہے انسور تو آل کوئیشن ووریور دی تیچنگ آف اسلام ایس 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 But you can always be assured, and again, Rizwan Khan Sahib and Madil Abdullah Sahib, and in the end, the speech by Sahib Zata uh, Suman Latif Sahib about the rope of Allah and Khilafat. So I'm sure you enjoyed all of those speeches, and for those who might have missed anything, you can go back and watch these on the MTA USA YouTube channel yesterday and today's speeches. And of course, Mansoor Qureshi Sahib spoke yesterday as well. You should go back and watch his speech. But for now, we'll end this segment. We'll let you hear the interviews and the feelings and the thoughts of attendees of Jalsa Salana in a short video. And we'll continue to bring you more programs for the rest of the day and of course for tomorrow as well. So this is day two, tomorrow will be day three. Until I see you again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jalsa to me is a platform that helps me get closer to Allah. During those three days, everyone from across the country gets together for the same goal in mind. And we listen to all these amazing speeches that help us gain knowledge to get closer to Allah. We volunteer together that helps to build brotherhood. And at the end of the day, it helps us get back to the roots and the, learn the teachings of the Promised Messiah. <laughs> My favorite Jalsa experience is volunteering. Ever since I was a kid, I've been volunteering in, in various duties, and uh, it helps me get a sense of duty, and I feel like I'm helping in any way that I can. Beauty and Perfection of the Holy Qur'an I call Allah to witness that the Holy Qur'an is a rare pearl. Its outside is light and its inside is light, and its above is light and its below is light, and there is light in every word of it. It is a spiritual garden whose clustered fruits are within easy reach and through which streams flow. Every fruit of good fortune is found in it, and every torch is lit from it. Its light has penetrated to my heart, and I could not have acquired it by any other means. And Allah is my witness that if there had been no Qur'an, I would have found no delight in life. I found that its beauty exceeds that of a hundred thousand Josephs. I incline towards it with a great inclination and drink it into my heart. It has nurtured me as an embryo is nurtured, and it has a wonderful effect on my heart. Myself is lost in its beauty. It has been disclosed to me in a vision that the garden of holiness is irrigated by the water of the Qur'an, which is a surging ocean of the water of life. He who drinks from it comes to life. Indeed, he brings others to life. All of so. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back. Again, it's an amazing Jalsa experience today. Everybody is just, you know, really enjoying all the various speeches that we heard today. The Holy Quran is a constant theme that's been coming up. In fact, it's a theme of Jalsa Salana 
and really when you listen to these speeches and you hear the words of Hazrat Khalifa al Masih about the love of the Holy Quran, even the Friday sermons that we've had, so many different instances in which we understand and we're reminded of the beauties of the Holy Quran. And that's why today, Alhamdulillah, uh, we are blessed to have two individuals in our studio today. We have Mulana Shamshad Ahmed Nasir Sahib and we have Mubarak Kukui Sahib. Both, mashallah, have uh, an amazing, um, you know, experience in serving the Jalsa Salana for many years and serving also in, the, in various capacities throughout the many years in the United States. And so I really want to get started with both of you. I would like you to introduce a little bit about yourself. Of course, we have Mulana Shamshad and Nasir Sahib. He has been serving in uh, Jalsa Salana for many, many years, alhamdulillah. Um, so if you can just share a little bit about the different duties and responsibilities that you have uh, here in the United States. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah. By the grace of Allah, Allah Ta'ala has given me the opportunity to serve Jalsa Salana. I think uh, almost uh, 56 or 57 years now. Mashallah. <laughs> and when I was in Pakistan, Rabwa, uh, during the study of the Jami Ahmadiyya, seven years uh, there, then Ghana and Sierra Leone, eight years there also, I served uh, there for Jalsa Salana. And for the past 35, 36 years, Alhamdulillah, I'm serving uh, Jalsa Salana uh, in the U.S. also. And currently, you are a Naib Officer Jalsa Salana, correct? Jalsa Ga. Jalsa Ga, my apologies. So, I'll share a little bit about what that is, and then we'll go to Kukoi Sahib, inshallah. Uh, you know, in Jalsa Salana, there are three uh, kind of services or officers with the approval of Al Khalif al Musiyyah, Talab bin Asal Aziz, Officer Jalsa Salana, Officer Jalsa Ga, and Officer Khidmat Khalq. Officer Jalsa Ga. Uh, there are a lot of things come come under him like uh, facilities and program speeches and all that uh, what is going on in the jalsa jalsa ga facility so this year with the approval of his khalif musi ayatullah bin aziz mukarram mirza nasir ehsan sahib is the officer jalsa ga and i am working under him um, uh, there are four departments under uh, that we are serving uh, for my area, like program, first is program, then stage, backstage, and announcement. These are four Nazmin are working with me, and by the grace of Allah, the things are going very well. Alhamdulillah. We'll get yeah. back to more information about that, inshallah. Mubarak Kukoi Sahib is here, he's our National Secretary, Talimul Quran and Waqfi Arzi. So, Mubarak Sahib, please share a little bit more about, you know, your department. It runs in this massive country, Alhamdulillah. Please share, how do you run a department and trying to instill the love of the Holy Quran and people who live, you know, three, four thousand miles apart? And that would be the best way to get you started, inshallah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is uh, Mubarak Kukoi. I'm originally from Nigeria and I've been in the United States since 1992. And since then, by Allah's grace, I've been given the opportunity to serve in the Jamaat as a teacher or somebody who teaches the Quran. I'm also an ha I'm a Hafiz and also a medical doctor. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, since I've been in the United States, I've always served the Jamaat in the capacity of a Quran teacher. And also, by Allah's grace, six years ago, I was elected to be the secretary of Talim al-Quran and Waqfi Ardi. And also, our duty in the department is mainly to teach the people how to read the Quran. The goal is to teach the people how to read the Quran, also understanding of the Quran. Because it's one thing to know how to read it, it's another thing to understand it, it's also another thing to live with it, to live with the rules of Allah. So the purpose of our department is to make sure that every member of the Jamaat, both the new and old, both young, and also male and female, to make sure that they know how to recite the Quran by the rules of Tajweed. So our purpose is to teach the Quran, and by Allah's grace, even before I came to the department, by the Dr. Zahiruddin, he has already created a very, very big team whereby we have a lot of volunteers who are actually helping. We are professionals who are teaching the Quran according to the rules of the Jewish. And they're scattered across this country. They're scattered all over the 50 states of the United States. <laughs> and Alhamdulillah has made it easy for me because, you know, we have people who are very, very dedicated, who are serious. A lot of things, actually, I don't have to actually do it myself. I have people who are actually doing it. All I have to do is to make sure it's done. So you are also a Hafiz of Quran. Yes, I am a Where Hafiz of Quran. Where did you Quran, become guess. a Hafiz of Quran, if you can share with the audience? Well, like I said earlier, I'm originally from Nigeria. My father sent me to Pakistan at the age of 10. Even then, I was a little kid, you know, like any, any little kid. 
you know, you miss your parents, you know, want to be around there, you don't want to go over there. But when I go over there, by Allah's grace, was the third caliph at the time. He basically told me that I'm your father now. So while I was over there, I was there from 1976 to 1980. I had a good time, I enjoyed and also memorized the Quran. You know, I, due, my, due to my being in Pakistan, a lot of other African countries were also encouraged to come. I was the first Hafiz, Jamaat Hafiz in the whole of Nigeria. And Alhamdulillah, by now if you go to Nigeria, you see a lot of people, more than 300, you know, in, 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 in the Jamaat where they are Hafiz. And also here in the United States, we're trying to build our own hip school. You know, Alhamdulillah also, Huzura has given us permission to do so, so we are working on it right now. Hopefully, inshallah, in the next two, three years, we will be, we'll be able to have our own hip school. Inshallah, that's beautiful. Inshallah. That brings me to Mulana Shimshad and Nasir Sahib. Alhamdulillah, you've also served in Jalsa Salana in Pakistan when you were a student in Jamia and even in Ghana. And as he mentioned already, Khalif Musi Salis. Please share some stories about Khalif Musi Salis' visit when he came to Ghana while you were there, Alhamdulillah, serving. You know, this is very faith-inspiring uh, incidents uh, during the visit of uh, any Khalifa, any time. Uh, as you said, the, the Jamia Ahmadiyya, when I was a student uh, there and uh, uh, um, late uh, Hazrat Sayyid Mir Dauda Masai was the principal Jami Ahmadi as well as Afsal Jasa Salana also. Sure, sure. And all the students of the Jamia were working under him in other departments um, in different capacity. Uh, of course, Jasa Ga also and Khidmat Khalq also that time. But uh, uh, there, uh, the first duty I had there for Nazim Istikbal, na, sure. under Nazim Istikbal on railway station Rabwa <laughs> and, and the bus adda where the b buses come. So that was really very faith inspiring during the Jalsa Salana when the people are coming and our Khuddams are there to help all these people to, to, to take their luggages on their on their head and taking them to the, their uh, where they were residing. So in, in America, in, in, in fact we cannot imagine how that faith inspiring things was because there was no roof like that, there was no, and the weather is very cold. And uh, Jalsa Salana was taking place under the sky. There was no tent, no roof, uh, no yeah, tent, nothing. There's no. But when Khalifatul Musi, especially, is delivering the speech, you heard already that has Khalifatul Musi Sani Razila Talano delivers it five or six yes. hours more than that. Yes. And sometimes it is raining, people are just sitting there. And enjoying the speech in this video. In 1980s, when Khalifatul Musi Salis Rahmulatala visited the Ghana, mm. it was not just a Salana, okay. but uh, he just visited, and we were there. Our present Khalifatul Musi also Shabbat that Shabbat. Uh, happened to be there by the grace of Allah. And uh, I remember that when he arrived uh, in uh, Accra um, uh, um, uh, Airport. Okay. More than 20,000 people were there for welcoming him. For 20,000 people. And when he came in the Accra Mission House, where members were uh, waiting for him, it was started heavy rain. And all the people were listening him under the heavy rain. There was uh, no tent for that. So I think that faith-inspiring thing, that people want to listen to the Khalifa, whatever circumstances there, there is no Nothing can prevent and this amazing, day. amazing. And Kukoi Sahib, please share, you know, beloved Hazrat Khalifa Tul Masih al Khamis Sayyidah Messages came to America very recently. We're very blessed. After the pandemic, the first country that beloved Hazur graced was our country. And throughout his tour, I saw very young children going for the Amin ceremonies. And I know that your department was behind the scenes working on coordinating. Please share some maybe faith inspiring or just what goes behind it and what are some of the impressions that many, some of these youngsters maybe even have. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum again. Our Jamaat is very, very blessed for the fact that we have a department whereby our children can learn how to read the Quran. And living in this part of the world, you know, children, they are learning some other things and also the parents are very, very busy to teach their uh, children the religious knowledge. At least what our department can do is to teach them how to read the Quran and also it's as a reward for them. For those who have not done the Amin ceremony, when Huzur came here, it was very very inspiring, inspiring. Whereby, in fact, Huzur took out of his busy time to attend to our kids and to celebrate the Amin, uh, um, celebrate the definition and the completion of the reading of the Quran with them. And also, our department, what we are doing is we make sure after the Amin ceremony, 
they continue to recite the Quran. Yes, because true. a lot of times, most parents, once the children are done reading the Quran, yes, once done. they think their job is done. So I'm going to use this opportunity to tell our parents, once your child finishes reading the Quran, the having ceremony is done, that's when actually the job starts. Because now, at this point, they read the Quran without having any idea what they are reading. But it's important the parents to make sure these children are encouraged to continue to read the Quran. So that way, when they grow up with the Quran, as we all know the benefits of reading the Quran, it's a guidance and also even it's, it's a blessing itself for the person that teaches and the person that is learning. Like the Holy Prophet ﷺ said, Khairukum Quran wa ilamahu. The best among you is who learns the Quran and teaches it. So the children are already becoming the best when they are learning it, and when they continue reading it, when they start teaching it, and according to the Prophet they are also going to be the best when they start teaching it. So that's what our department are doing. So we're trying to teach those children, at the same time, encourage them to also teach it. Beautiful. And by the grace of God, this year, because of, uh, as uh, uh, Hafiz Sahib has mentioned, this year our theme of Jesus Lana is also yes. following the teaching of Islam teaching of the Holy Quran and uh, really this is one of the sixth condition of death also right. where the Prophet and, and shall completely submit himself or herself to the authority of the Holy Quran and shall make the word of God and the saying of the Holy Prophet Muhammad so Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the guiding principles in every walk of his or her life. So this is what the one condition of the bath is that Quranic teaching will be followed. Please share about the program. As you mentioned, you know, the theme is now set, but now you have to make an entire program, <laughs> the speeches, the topics. Yeah. And Alhamdulillah, this morning session was absolutely fabulous. Each speech built on each other, almost like it brought it to a climax at the end. It was very beautiful to just to sit there and enjoy all the different topics and the way they covered it. Please share with you know the audience. Do you know, uh, maybe... People are thinking we have done it in one week or two weeks. No. <laughs> it is a preparation of months. Under the guidance of respected Amir Sahib, uh, there is a committee to select the topics and theme. Then uh, guideline is provided to the speakers as well that what we need under this topic, under this speech. And uh, with the guidance of respected Amir Sahib, then Afsajal Saga, Program Committee, and there is another committee who pick all that things. So almost two to three months it takes, and then when the speeches come, the committee reviews it. Two times, three times, sometimes four, five times. And uh, because those guidelines uh, we provided for them, they work under that. So this is not a one day, even Azan, even the Nazm, Talawat, translation, everything they are carefully selected to the topics, times, and the session by the grace of Allah. Jazakallah. Thank you so much. This was such an amazing uh, discussion that we just had. Allah bless you both. Um, again, this is a conversation we're going to continue to have. We're going to go to Jalsa Connect uh, from the social media handles to really get a feedback from all of you who are watching. Continue to send your clips in different programs as well, inshallah. We'll continue. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. As mentioned by Murabi Saab, welcome back to another Jalsa Connect segment. So this morning we got some messages and we got some tweets. So from our Instagram DMs, we have some messages to share from around the world. Our first one is from Rizwana Salim Saib. Best arrangements we have seen, mashallah. So she's referring to the arrangements made for the guests of the Promised Messiah who have come from across the country and around the world to hear the messages and hear about the speeches and the different things and the themes of this year's Jalsa. So she's mentioning the accommodations as well as the lunger food that was made. Our next message is from Rabbi Tahir Chaudhry Saib from Honduras. He writes, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, watching Jalsa Salana USA with the family in Honduras, South America. Great start to this year's Jalsa lineup. May Allah bless all Amadis all around the world. Ameen. So as you can see, yesterday we had messages from Switzerland, from the UK. Today we have some messages from South America. So as you can see, from around the world, people are tuning in to hear about the different speakers. You know, yesterday's lineup was fantastic. We had Fahim Yunus, I talk about different ways where we can 
you know, do better in terms of their beauth. Today we had Southern Side of MKUSA talk about how young Amadis should focus on their dean instead of the various trends that, you know, come across to us on social media and other things. Our first tweet of the day is from at Muslim Youth USA. Our Muslim youth amongst the congregation sacrificing their sleep to come pray at the U.S. Jalsa site. They prayed voluntarily at the Hajjat, followed by morning prayers, as well as realizing the purpose of the convention is to become closer to God. So as mentioned in Murabi Rizwan Khan Saib's speech, it is far better to pray in congregation and amongst your fellow brothers and sisters to gain additional blessings and swaps. As you can see, we have a very large group of people who came out for the Hajjat prayer at 4 a.m. this morning, followed by Fajr, mashallah. Our next message is from at Jalsa Lunger. While we are asleep at night, the breakfast team are hard at work. Here's the work they do. We don't see them. We just see the wonderful results of their work. So another big theme, and that was mentioned in one of the earlier studio segments, is there are countless volunteers, hundreds of Qadam, Ansar, Lajna, Atfal, and Nasarath working around the clock tirelessly to ensure this works smoothly. So as you can see, the Jalsa team for the Lunger they worked you know, throughout the night to make sure the breakfast was there, we were all served and we were accommodated for. So please keep these people in your prayers as they continue to make sure this Jalsa is possible. Our last message from the day is just a simple picture from at Ashaz B7 showing yesterday's Hutva leaded by Murabi Saib where you can see a very packed audience and it is full to the brim. Mashallah, many people came out for this year's Jalsa. And as today, Saturday is the main session, inshallah, we will see a lot more people here as well. That is all the messages we have. Keep messaging us at Jalsa Connect USA on Twitter and on Instagram. And make sure to use hashtag Jalsa USA so we can see your tweets and messages. And inshallah, we'll have more to share later in the day. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back to the studio here where we have a very special topic to talk about and that is the fulfillment of a prophecy of the Promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam. Something that began in his lifetime and we saw the victory of it that started. But today in Zion, and I'm joined by two gentlemen here who work diligently to make sure that this beautiful prophecy of the Promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam that happened in Zion, in the United States, to talk about it. I have Anwar Khan Sahib who was uh, serving as National Tariqa Jadid Secretary for USA Jamaat and he led that project in Zion in terms of the research and all the other things. And Abu Bakr Sahib, who is from Zion, he uh, served as the President of Zion Jamaat for a long time and they work hand in hand. Anwar Khan Sahib, let me start with you. Zion, what comes to mind when you think about Zion of all the work that you've done and the victory of Islam Ahmadi up there? Actually, to tell you the truth, uh, Zion was uh, an unknown place. Uh, it was not there in uh, 19, uh, 1899, it was not there. But uh, the person who created it was buying land for many years. And uh, 6,000 acres land he bought. And he has a, this dream to create a, a Christian uh, society or Christian city, so to say. And he named it Zion. He unveiled it on uh, uh, January 1, year 1900, mm. and named it as Zion. And he c claimed himself to be the Messiah, uh, or Elijah, if you will. Okay. And uh, he was very abusive of Islam and Holy Prophet And Masih received this information. So he said that instead of uh, annihilating the whole Muslim Ummah, you focus on me, I am the representative of God. Mm. And pray to God that between us two, whoever is a liar dies first. Okay. This is known as Mubaila. Alhamdulillah. So this and, challenge was present. And, and, and I'm sure, you know, many people have, have heard about this, know about this, but the Jamar started a project to make sure that this fulfillment is shown to the whole world. Abu Bakr Sahib, you served as the president then to see this project and a small city like Zion that you moved to. First of all, tell us why you moved to Zion and what sense of responsibility did you feel in taking part in this project to make it um, fulfillment? Okay. You know, my wife, uh, Dia Barker, which is she's the uh, solder of uh, Lajmia Miller here. Uh, She's the one that talked to me and uh, discussed to me about relocating uh, to Zion. 
And but when, cause when I first moved here, I moved was living in Racine, Wisconsin, which is about 45 minutes away. And my whole attitude was to make a design Jamaat the best Jamaat in the United States. You know, the the prophecy and those things was not really on my mind, but my wife placed it on my mind, and it is a a responsibility of the American Jamaat to care for that blessing in which Allah gave us. So it flipped my attitude uh, about the whole thing. And when Emmy Muhammad said that he wanted to create a, Zion, a city in Zion, uh, the, the first Amity city in Zion, that was his vision. And um, uh, when he said that, me and my wife said, okay, well, let's just move to Zion and help make that, that vision become true. So we were very singly focused mm -hmm on making that vision come true. Uh, I always think it's a responsibility of the American Jamaat mm -hmm. because we have been blessed with the fulfillment of, of that prophecy and not only have Allah touched the Zion with that prophecy or United States, the promised Messiah as well. His, some of his children are here, his grandchildren and, and other children that are here, relatives of the promised Messiah is here in the United States. And I just feel it is a responsibility of the American Jamaat to make sure that we care for that, that thing to happen. Yeah, and then part of the history is Zion, we know, like you mentioned, Dawi was wiped out in the Promised Messiah's victory. Tell us a little bit of the highlight of that when Hazrat Khalif Tumasi visited. The Zion visited. project, uh, actually, it so happened. It all started, uh, uh, to tell you the truth, in the recent history by Hazrat Khalif Tumasi III. Mm -hmm. When Khalifa Masih III uh, came to Chicago many years ago, so he asked the then president, Dr. Slaudin Shams, that uh, in Haqiqatul Wahi, Huzur has mentioned uh, the sign of uh, John Alexander Dwayne, mm -hmm. and he has presented 32 clippings. So have you found those clippings mm -hmm. of U.S. newspapers? So he said that we are trying to find it, but we couldn't find them. So he assigned the task to MMM to find those. So I was National Secretary that he uh, tabligh them. Mm -hmm. So MMM Sahib gave me the responsibility that you go ahead and find it. Wow. So this we found 24 ago. of them then, and we printed a book in the Messiah 2000 Conference. And Messiah 2000 Conference was attended, by, mashallah, by 1,500 people. And nine children of prominent Messiah Islam were present in that conference. And it was the start at that time, as Brother Abu Bakr is saying, MMM said that this should be the first city to turn into Ahmadiyya. Sure. That was his vision. We are working on it. Yeah. So at that time, we decided to have a mosque. So that mosque project started then. Wow. Then when our we present Amir, uh, took charge, he carried that baton, if you will, mm -hmm. and he created the Zion project. And uh, I was given this responsibility to collect funds. So we collected $5 million wow. for this project, mashallah, over a period of two or three years. And then we uh, uh, constructed this beautiful mosque. We wanted to give a name to that mosque, so we wrote to Huzur. Mm -hmm. So Huzul suggested three names, and Fateh Azim was one of them, and two other names. And asked uh, uh, Majlis Amla to pick out of those three. Hmm. So Majlis Amla picked Fateh Azim. So Huzul named it Fateh Azim Mas. So this is how the, it is, Fateh Azim Mas. Which, which means the great victory, of course. Uh, Abu Bakr Sahib, give us a little bit of a, a hint of Zion Jamaat is a small Jamaat relatively. To have such a responsibility and to work diligently in terms of the construction of the mosque and building that. Tell us a little bit about, about those feelings and, and the expectations well, of Huzur. Well, one thing that. I'd like to say is it's a victory for me and my family. Uh, it's been a 20-year project. Um, and I think in the background is sometimes you have to win people over. Mm -hmm. you know, And also in the background, you have to have belief. 
you know, we were having problems uh, getting some things approved and stuff, and I was saying, dang, this is taking too long. And the Holy Quran said, you should take things to a higher authority. So I wrote Hazur, and Hazur wrote me back and said, may Allah remove all obstacles that may come in your way. At that point, I knew that all it took was effort from us and consistency, and things will begin to, they begin to move. And you have to believe. That's the thing. You have to believe in this institution of Caliphate, mm -hmm. in this institution of the prophet uh, prophecy that uh, and the Messiah that said he would spread this message over the world. If you don't believe that, mm -hmm. then things are not going to be happening. You're not going to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. But we stay true to the project. Allah says that you should focus on a project, and that's what we did. And now that we have victory, uh, the people that have worked on it, uh, Anwar Khan, Lajner and Miller came through big, big for us uh, with the, with uh, with their donation of uh, one point uh, seven million. Yeah, came so, from Lima. Oh wow! So and, that's, that's and you know in the background, two things were happening. Like you were in Philadelphia. One of the things that kind of stopped our project was Philadelphia, right. because they wanted to wrap up all these other things <laughs> they had open out there right. before they got concentrate <laughs> on uh, Philadelphia. Oh, but but, you, but, but you got the support. But, but the thing about us is we kept on reminding national headquarters That's of true. the responsibility of this mosque here. And mm -hmm. then they fully took uh, the reins yeah. and began to uh, make yeah. things move inside the Jamaat. Yeah. Uh, I think mm -hmm. they uh, brought some people in to help uh, complete the project. So, uh, so, so, uh, so we have put together a documentary, just so our viewers know, which we will show them as well, short clip about, about the whole Zion project. But Amr Khan Sahib, something that people may not be able to see especially the hand of Allah behind all of this. That's it. Could you kind of give us highlight in a, in a, in a briefly about yeah, what are some I, of the things that you I, saw? I'm glad you asked that question because I'm an Ahmadi, Alhamdulillah. But this sign, working in this sign, made me so strong in my faith, mm -hmm. which I could not achieve without working on this. Because I have seen the hand of God behind prominence of Islam at every turn, I give you a couple of examples, three examples I will give you. We collected 160 clippings, which talk about the mobile around the world, right? Mm -hmm. One night I was, uh, we were about to wrap it up, and I received a call from my son, who is an attorney, that there is a copyright law, have you sought permission uh, from the newspapers mm -hmm. to produce it? And I said, we will look into it. I have not done that. We did that in the year 2000, but I didn't do it now. Few minutes later, I received another call from my another son, and he said, I have looked up and found out that copyright law was created in 1909. Wow. And Hazul passed away in 1908. So it doesn't apply. Wow. So this is a small thing. Yeah. But these small things, the second thing is, uh, government of the United States created an endowment uh, agency for humanitarian work. And their job, they took the job of uh, tracing the history of cities. So they picked Illinois. Of all the states, they picked Illinois. And when they came to Chicago, they said, they saw something. They said, no, we are interested in this John Alexander Doe stuff. Mm. So they went to Zion. When they learned about the Mubahila, they said our focus would be Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadjian. Wow. We are going to investigate this through the newspapers. Mashallah. And they found 24 newspapers, out of which we didn't have six. Mm. So we gathered 160, the six of them we got from them. Alhamdulillah. That's so how Allah Ta'ala is preventing? The last thing I want to say in this is, Leaves of Healing is a uh, the weekly newspaper he used to get create. Now he died, so that that weekly newspaper is done. But there is a organization in Oregon. The name of the organization is Occult uh, Newspapers, mm -hmm. preserving the occult newspapers. Right. And Leaves of Healing is one of the newspapers. Mm -hmm. On the front page of that, they send us the information. They write a little history of John Alexander Roy. They mention in the end, during his last years, John Alexander Roy confronted Islam 
and he had a prayer duel with Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Wow. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad won the contest. And John Alexander Doe died in his life. Allahu Akbar. This is indeed the same turn, leaves of healing. Yeah, every turn of the of the way we see that the victory of the Prophet Sallallahu is being highlighted. But the highlight of this whole the great victory, and as you will see in the documentary that we will show you, is how Hazrat Khalifa Tumasi visited and he was given the key to the city of Zion. That's, That's right. just an amazing way of just all seeing it. But uh, I know the segment is very short. We could have talked about more and more stuff, but uh, I'll let you watch that, that documentary that we put together. And please continue to do your research. And I know Anwar Khan Sahib is writing a book, which is going to be a 526-page book that you will soon see, inshallah, when it's published within the next uh, few weeks or even a couple of months. But we'll get back to you to show you more stuff from MTA. And please enjoy watching the proceedings of Jalsa Salana. Until I see you soon, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Zion, Illinois. Once founded as a Christian utopia by a bitter opponent of Islam, it now serves as a testament to the truthfulness of Islam, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Messiah of the age. Let's turn back the pages of time as we observe God's support and favor of his Messiah and see what makes this town special and its brand new mosque so historic. Now go back in time, the faith that Dawi stood to annihilate. It will be a worldwide sign, countless newspapers around the world, advertising it. Who got defaced? We'll see the reaction of the media at that time and also look at how the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA is memorializing this mighty sign for the benefit of generations to come. We are not celebrating his death. What we are celebrating is a sign of God. The year is 1888. On the western shores of USA arrives a new face. His name is John Alexander Dowie, a Scottish-Australian evangelical minister who claims to be a faith healer. He was born in uh, Scotland in 1847. When he was young, he became a preacher. And he also claimed that he is able to heal the people those who believe in the atonement of Jesus. And then in 1888, when he was 41 years old, he arrived in uh, uh, San Francisco, California. And that's where he started his preaching in America. It won't be long before he turns his healing practice into a successful national business. From this point forward, his unbridled aspirations would only grow. And from Los Angeles he took a train. And I went to see that uh, train station where he took the train in Pomona. He went to Chicago, Evansville, and then there he established church for himself known as Christian Catholic Church. But the word Zion he was using from the very beginning. So he rented a house and he gave the name Zion Room to his rented house. He assembled people and at night he uncovered the blueprint or map of this vast city he is about to establish known as Zion. In this time, Dawi begins to accumulate large amounts of wealth, but he's not satisfied. Beguiled by his apparent success, he now sets his eyes on power. So he selected a city, uh, land, it was just a land over there, uh, more than 6,600 acres of land uh, next to the Michigan Lake. Important thing was that he had claimed the name of the city to be Zion, and he said that no 
sinful action would be done and only Christians would live in that land, in that city. And among the sinful actions were uh, amazingly drinking of the wine, which was very popular in America, and uh, smoking even, and things like that. So that's how Zion became very famous and he established the city and slowly and gradually start growing real fast. The city he founded began to flourish. By this time, he had his own publishing company and printed a regular newspaper called the Leaves of Healing, and by means of which he was able to spread his messages across the entire world. Gathering all nations together under the banner of Zion, in this assembly of God's people, it is probable that more than 50 nations are represented. His beginning was in the name of God, and he adopted healing or prayer as a weapon to attract people. But what went into his mind is beyond our scope. So Dawi is no ordinary priest. He's seen three continents. He's born in Scotland, then goes to Australia, comes back to Europe, then San Francisco, North America, then Chicago, also goes to Mexico. This man has lived over three continents. He owns millions of dollars. He boasts that he has 100,000 funders, not followers, people who can fund his campaign. He's only 50 years old, healthy, and he has a global influence. On a recent occasion in the city of Zion, I found there were 66 nations represented. This is no regular run-of-the-mill priest. This is a person who then, on top of all of that, claims to be Elijah. He claims a worldly success and then links it to divinity. He says, God speaks to me and I'm the forerunner of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is as big as it gets. He warned all the nations of uh, America and Europe that Islam is not a dead religion. They should not take it lightly. It's a very powerful religion. He denounced Holy Prophet Sallallahu He used abusive language about him. But again, he claimed that the Catholic Church cannot uh, uh, destroy Islam. He is the person who is going to completely annihilate Islam and all the Muslims will be dead. He had everything, power, wealth, health, and a large community. Yet his downfall was just about to begin. The echoes of his hate and challenges had reached a far off town from Zion <laughs> Little did that we know, his challenges and claims had reached the real Messiah and second coming of Jesus, all the way in Gadian, India a little known town at the time. And Hazrat Masih Mawda have no idea how he's keeping track of it in that tiny hamlet of Qadian in the pre-Google, pre-internet, pre-aeroplane era. It just baffles my mind. He very carefully and pleasantly told him, refrain from it. But he didn't refrain. He carried on his uh, clumsy accusations Hazur says that a couple of his writings have come across me where he is he wants death upon all Muslims and he is abusing the holy name of Hazrat Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that Masih Madhulah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I stand for all the Muslims. And Hazrat Masih Wasallam being a lover of Holy Prophet so much so that he would give his life for it began to address him little strip sharply. He had enraged the line of Allah, for he laid curses upon the beauty of Islam and its holy founder. 
the lover of Muhammad, peace be upon him, could not stay quiet any longer. The gist of my mubahala was that Islam is the true faith and the Christian doctrine is false. And I am the same Messiah from God who was to come in the latter days and was promised in the scriptures of the prophets. I also wrote that Dr. Dawi was false in his claim of prophethood as well as in his doctrine of trinity and that if he accepted the mubahala he would die within my lifetime in great pain and misery. Even if he did not accept the challenge, he would still not be able to escape divine punishment. When you are talking about mubahala in spiritual terms, essentially you're saying, my source of strength is God. In wars, you will see small countries getting supported by superpowers. Here, the superpower is Allah, because the conditions of mubahala cannot be controlled by a person. Before Christianity, there were two prophets which have been mentioned to have a prayer duel. Jeremiah was one of them in the Bible and uh, uh, Elijah. Same course was adopted by Holy Prophet Sallallahu When the Christians from Najran came and he gave them uh, the teachings of Islam and asked them to denounce the Trinity of God and uphold the unity of God, they did not pay attention. At that time, the verse of Mubaila was revealed. فَمَنْ حَجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْا فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْا نَدَعُ أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ and that's what leaders do. You think of any story with a hero. Who's the hero? The one who's going to walk in front of danger. Hazrat Masih Madhra walks in front of these millions, hundreds of millions of Muslims and says, you come after me. You claim to be divinely guided. I claim to be divinely guided. So let's have a prayer duel. The challenge was thrown that you have to pray to your God. And I'm praying to my God that that person who is false and wrong should die in the life of the other person. He also says the death will occur by disease, lightning or snake bite. He goes to that level of specificity. And the amazing thing was that Hazrat Masih Maud Islam was like 12 years older than him. So you can imagine an older person telling a younger person that you pray who dies in the life of the other person. Hazrat Masih Madal Islam also says this in Nazul, Nazul Masih in Haqiqatul Wahi. Hazur says, I recognize that I'm 10 or 20 years older than him. And I recognize that he's healthy and I have diabetes and I have other ailments. But this is a decision that's going to be made by God. There is no worldly force here. The promised Messiah's challenge had now become widely publicized across the U.S. and Europe, the world had now taken notice. Dawi intensified his hateful rhetoric against Islam and the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. He, first of all, he just didn't reply at all. But later on, when the pressure was that you have to say something to this man. And finally, Dawi is frustrated because the letter is now getting published in newspapers. Newspapers are picking it up. Once again, we have no idea. This was the divine hand that how Allah Ta'ala wanted to use Dawi as a catalyst for the message of Masih Ma'ala Dawi was the claimant of being Elijah and claimed to be the harbinger to the second coming of Jesus. Though he was a false claimant, yet God made him a sign to spread the message of the real Messiah to the farthest corners of the earth. Countless newspapers around the world, advertised it. 32 such clippings uh, Huzur al-Islam received in Qadiyan. 
he named them, he published their excerpts in his book, Wahriqatul Wahi. Will Dawi come out for this contest? Prayer duel between Christianity and Islam. Mubahala between two claimants of prophethood. And he said in that Haqiqat Wahi that there are hundreds more. Right now we have received only these 32. A time will come when they will be in hundreds. Lo and behold, that prophecy has come to fruition as well. Today we have gathered 166 clippings around the world. One needs to realize that newspapers were the social media of the time. There were the news networks. And we see really, really catching titles like Don Alexander Dawi now has a rival in India. Ghulam versus Dawi. New way of determining true creeds from false. Ahmad's challenge is much like that of Elijah to the priests. And whether the founder of Zion, Illinois, is in error as to his own identity will be determined. A Messiah in India. The War of the Prophets. The Indian Prophet's name is Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, commonly called Mirza Sahib. One cannot but fear that we are going to lose our only dowi. And the U.S. newspapers actually say that the Mohammedan, these are the words of New York Times, the Mohammedan is generous rather than fair because he's more than 10 years older than Dawi. He lives in a place where 673 people died of snake bite last year compared to zero snake bite deaths in Cook County and where the risk of disease and mortality is way higher than Chicago. So they are making this comparison that from a worldly standpoint, there is no chance for this claimant in India to win, but that's the power of Mubahila. And then after some time, and he was very insulted to the problem of Messiah, because newspapers uh, uh, in America picked up this news that this man is advising him. He said about Prophet Messiah Islam, you believe or you think that I'm going to respond to these gnats and flies? I can put my foot over them and crush them out. If I am not God's prophet, there is none on God's earth that is. And this was the moment where essentially challenge accepted. Do you realize that the same words flew back on his face and it was in front of thousands of people, his fate, his zero hour began. And he actually has to be dragged off the stage because he gets his first stroke in front of thousands of people. It, I have to repeat, it baffles my mind how Hazur was so much on top of this news at a time when a letter would take weeks before it could reach, or a newspaper before it could reach from North America to Qadian. And Hazur says that he is now suffering from a stroke. Look at the irony. This man claims to be a healer. This man's periodical is named Leaves of Healing. He can't heal himself because this is a stroke. Played by God's hand. Nishan ko dekh kar inkar kab tak pesh jayega? Arey ik aur jhooto par. And from there on, it's not just disease. When he moves to Mexico, then other things start surfacing. His other scandals with young women in the area. Not only that, he had given thousands of dollars as a gift to those women. So that brought a kind of defame on him. The fact that he's a hidden alcoholic, all those things start popping up. Then, of course, they had to take some action and they just uh, disqualified him to be their leader. And later on, after a little time, 
he had another stroke and that made him so weak that he couldn't even lay down and speak. February 20th, 1907. Azur talks about Alexander Dowie and he says, God has now revealed to me Fateh Azim, that a grand victory is coming. And that sign will come from God, will occur. And it will not be limited to only India. It will be a worldwide sign. Hazur uses those words, Fateh Azim. And not only that Hazur uses it, you must see in the book, they are published as if it's the headline of a newspaper. They're not buried somewhere in the text. And then within approximately two weeks, John Alexander Dowie dies. Khuda karega ik Great is Mirza Ghulam Ahmad the Messiah, foretold pathetic end of Dawi and now predicts plague, flood, and earthquake. Dawi dies in the city he planned. Death finds him with no relatives or friends by his side. Over the decades, the Jamaat has made efforts to keep this great sign alive. Ahmadi Muslims from neighboring cities moved to the town and established a Jamaat with a local mission house to serve their needs. At the turn of the millennium, when the anticipation of the return of Jesus, peace be upon him, again reached society's attention, the USA Jamaat arranged a special conference near Zion known as Messiah 2000. At that time, the purpose was we held this conference in Carthage College because many years ago, 100 years ago, John Alexander Dewey spoke in the same hall. But all the prophecies of the Old Testament and the New Testament, they came to fruition, yet no messenger came. Nearly every objective historian will say that Dowie's own ego was the major cause of his fall. 1,500 people attended that conference. As of the MMM and Saab, and nine other children of prominent Messiah Islam were present in that conference. The promised Messiah, peace be upon him, received complete victory by God. Now, 115 years later, his message has spread to over 200 countries. And each Ahmadi across the world is a living sign of the greatness and truthfulness of the Messiah of the age. To memorialize this great victory, a brand new mosque has now been constructed, the Fateh Azim Mosque, right here in the town that witnessed Allah the Almighty's grand sign. The residents of Zion, they always wanted to have a mosque in their town. Sardar Mirza Makur Ahmad Saab took this as a national project. And he said, we will build a mosque in the city of Zion. The city of Zion being the vital seat of the manifestation of this sign should be remembered and considered live for generations to come. This has uh, been a, a project in the making for the last 20 years, and we're the only Muslim group uh, that uh, sits here in Zion, and the only group that now has a beautiful mosque. The city officials and other church members uh, want to be good neighbors to us. Some of the churches have allowed us to use their parking lot just to show there that they want to be good neighbors. Five million dollars has been spent to construct this mosque, the exhibition center. 1.7 million of that has been raised by Lejna. Amir Saab gave us a target of $1.2 million. And at the time of our Marshals Ashura, there were approximately 26 sisters who stepped forward immediately, writing checks, pulling cash out of their pockets, taking off their bangos, and making this the first contribution towards the building of this mosque. 
However, we succeeded our goal and we uh, reached $1.7 million, and this took place within less than one year. This is hallowed ground, for God showed His hand, His sign for His prophet here to be an eternal testament to His greatness, and as a sign of the truthfulness of the Messiah of the age, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, of Qadiyan, peace be upon him. The fact that Hazrat Khalif al Masih, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asr al Aziz, now names this masjid, Masjid Fateh Azim, if that doesn't give people goosebumps, I don't know what will. Ghulam Ahmad ki jai, long live Hazrat Ahmad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. Alhamdulillah, here in the United States, we have a history that dates all the way back to the time of the promised Messiah Islam. In today's speeches, you've been hearing all kinds of amazing aspects of the history of Jamaat Ahmadiyya USA. And it was at the time of the promised Messiah Islam that he began writing letters and bringing Americans to Islam from the beginning with Alexander Russell Webb or even the prayer duel that happened with Alexander Dowie. And so we see that there is constant attention by the Prophet Muhammad Islam to spread and share the message of Islam. And then of course the Khulafa afterwards, how at the time of Hazrat, Mufti, uh, Hazrat Muslim of Islam, he sent Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Sahab, a Sahabi, and he said that this Darvesh will go to fulfill the prophecy of I shall cause thy message to reach the corner of the year. And then we see of course after that, each one of the Khulafa have been paying special attention by sending missionaries to the United States to really establish the beautiful mission of the promised Messiah And we also heard today in earlier speech that there were three prayers that were made by Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Sahab The first prayer was that he should be given a Jamaat, a Jamaat of Muslims. The second was that a magazine should be established. And the third of course were mosques. These three things we have been seeing over the last hundred years in Jamaat Ahmadi USA, or over a hundred years now, have been established. And so today's discussion we're going to have in this particular program, we're going to talk about Tarbiyat. And, and utilizing these same three resources that have begun over a hundred years ago, established by a Sahabi of the Promised Messiah Islam. But we're going to talk about how they're utilizing a very new, new form in this day and age. And so, Alhamdulillah, I'm joined here with two of my very good friends. Uh, we have Mulana Murabi uh, Tariq Naseem Sahib and Talha Riyaz Sahib, both are missionaries serving in the United States, as well as serving the Tarbiyat Department. And again, that's beautiful. Welcome to both of you. May Allah bless you all. Let's get started, actually. In today's speeches, you noticed that a lot of the topics were social issues, things yeah. that are head-on, issues that maybe our youth are facing on a daily basis. So I don't know what your impressions were, but you know, while I was sitting there and just listening to how the social issues are tackled head-on. I, I think I appreciate that one thing, is when you're sitting in, like, in the Jalsa with the people and you hear people just kind of looking at each other like, oh, and you recognize on people's faces that this is hitting home literally. This is happening yeah. in people's homes. So I really love the fact that uh, Khalafat has really established and trailblazed for us that we need to uh, talk about issues, even to missionaries, as Zura said, talk about these issues with them openly. Yes. When we do that, I really appreciate on Jalsa platforms that the things that people are seeing in their homes, they're being addressed in Islamic light because everyone's going to get an answer from somewhere. If it comes from Jamaat Amdiya, our platforms, I mean, you've taken them to the water well and drinking straight from the source. And in fact, to, even to add to that, each one of the speeches had quotations from Beloved Hazur. Right, Literally right. answering those same issues that we face on a daily basis. It reminds me, of course, of Sufi Bengali Sahib, one of the pioneer missionaries of USA. He said there's a Greek legend yeah. that there's this demon that devours people. But before devouring them, he asked them a series of questions. And so he says in a very beautiful way, he says that the, the, the era of the time is the demon. 
And the mm. questions he's asking the people before him are the religions. And if the religions can't answer the questions, they'll get devoured. But then he adds, he says, but Islam has the answers to every question. Exactly in line with beloved Hazur was quoted today, saying every accusation, every allegation, criticism, Islam can answer it. Right. So in that sense, Talhavai, what do you think that were some of the issues that you felt were very important that were brought up today that you know are the talk of you know, some of the concerns that the youth have today? So as you mentioned, as Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Sahib, the first thing is we have mosque in USA. And Alhamdulillah, we have mosque here. And that's the first step we can educate our you know, young Qudams and every members in Jamaat so we can develop a connection with mosque. Yeah. And we have the main source for Turbiya is our mosque. Right. So in here, in Justice and the U.S., Salem is the best opportunity for everyone to get here and learn something. And then we go back, and the main source after Jalsa, we have mosques. That's right. And to go back and connect there now. Yeah. Actually, that's interesting you mentioned yeah. that. Many of our viewers may not know that America is this massive country. Right. And Alhamdulillah, right. we have over 50, 60 mosques in America now. Right. But they're spread out. So, I mean, uh, uh, Tariq Bhai, tell us a little bit about how the Rabia Department tackles the fact that there are mosques scattered throughout USA. So a couple ways that we look at it, I mean, it's not even us. If we align ourselves behind Khilafat, we're going to see blessings. 100%. So Hazrat Khalifa Masih Rabin actually in the 80s talked about his concern for the America, sure. specifically about Jummah, number sure. one. And he says that I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And kind of almost sharing like how it's the wild, wild west spiritually, sure. where everybody is spread out. It's deserted in that sense. People are in this rat race and not realizing. And Hazur says, if you don't align your kids with Jummah, he said, if you grow up, and you think your kids will be practicing amenities, you are dreaming. Those are exact words. So we try to focus on Jama the basics, but in a way that we understand the landscape of the Americas. If you're telling people to travel from far, they live 45 minutes away, they got to take their kids to soccer practice, they got to finish work, then they got to do things with their family and then repeat. And then if you think they're going to come 45 minutes on a daily way, one way, it's not practical. So Salat Centers is another thing we have a huge focus on because Hazur really shared the number one priority for us in the U.S. When Hazur just did this visit, he said Salat. Yeah, yeah. So if we align ourselves, and that's what we're trying to literally go across, Talasa, myself, yeah. uh, we're all, uh, Amir Sahib, just visiting Jamaats and saying, this is what Hazur left us with. Let's is, focus isn't on it this. amazing though? Because you could go to Bangladesh yeah. or yeah. any other country. Right. And Hazur told them their focus is Salat just the same. Exactly. We may be in America, people may be watching us thinking, oh, this is America. They think they're above everything. Uh -huh. But as an Ahmadi Muslim, we are just like any other Ahmadi Muslim in another part. The only challenge we have, as you can imagine, yeah. is that we are sitting very far from one another. Very real issue. Very real. Yeah. yeah. Like, so in, in addition to that, the basic thing for Salat is your personal connection with individuals. Exactly. Mm. So that's why we have Salat centers now, and that's where we can build brotherhood, sisterhood. Mm -hmm. And that, because we are Jamaat, we are that's only right. Jamaat Muslim Ummah. We have right. unity. Exactly. And that kind yeah. of Khilafat unity, unifies that's, that's all behind on one hand, one leader, and that is Khilafat. You know, you brought up a good yeah. point. When we look at what Hazur says in a statement, beloved Hazur, it has multifaceted blessings. For example, right now, the biggest issue with our kids, how do we get them off devices? How do we get them off their shows, YouTube, all of that? It's hard. Yes. Everyone's facing it. it. Screen times, the kids get cranky once you take them off. But one thing with centers or going to slot centers, the mosque, if they know their friends are there or they're in an accessible area, you've got them Create off of it. Yeah. Now, because Islam think, was a social change, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Think about it now, uh, Kosa Seb, like right now, how many times do we go to someone's house, and we ask that when we go to people, yeah, sure. without a, a formal davat or formally being invited? Rarely. Yeah. But now if you create a touch point, say twice a week, you've met another Amdi family a hundred times a year. Very good. And imagine the kind of like domino effect that goes into relationships, tristas, talks, yeah. concerns, you vent. Absolutely. So there's a lot of brotherhood, sisterhood that yeah, can happen sure there. That, as we see, we always mention that America is different. Right. Yes, America is different. Sure. The Jaliyah. Exactly. The it's Jaliyah everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's even everywhere. more powerful here right. in many ways. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Because this yeah. is the hub of the job. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why we should avoid formalities. Absolutely. And that's why how we can build brotherhood, sisterhood. Yeah. And the key to success that Allah promised to believers is Salah. Salah. Right. It's amazing you mentioned that because, you know, as I was reading some of the history of USA Jamaat, when Mufti Muhammad Salih Salah Reza Lama came to America, he was stopped at the border. You know, right, they didn't let right. him on. And, you know, there's a whole story behind, you know, he said, I will go because my Khalifa has told me to go. Right. Yeah. But the other side of it, we don't realize is that in Qadian, as a Muslim, actually gets up and talks about this fact. He said, they're stopping my 
you know, my servant from going into this country. But know this, that I will send people from the neighboring countries if I have to. And he said, and a day will come when la ilaha illallah will be in every street corner of America. Inshallah. And that's yeah. exactly what this yeah. effort is. Every street corner of America, it's a vast country. Yeah. <laughs> so just to have that as a goal, that one day that will happen, inshallah, that's what we're all working towards. And that's the beauty of it. And I think you brought up a good point. Like, Jalsa is a very good, like, uh, factory reset for us. About Jalsa, yes. Right? And just coming here, like, that brotherhood, seeing each other, us meeting up, catching up, and then it really kind of realigns, like, what is our identities in Ahmadi? Living in the U.S., that rat race is real. Yeah. Fake, facing that and then coming. So there's a reason why Hazrat Muslim yeah. Muslim so established that. Stab- not only that, he said the secondary purpose is for us to connect right, as Jalsa right, Salana. Right. But the other part of it I was thinking was that Jalsa Salana is very powerful even in the aspect of tarbiyah. Imagine a khadim standing outside or at the legend aside and doing duty throughout the day outside. That's powerful. Under a flag. Mm-hmm. Like I could imagine that's probably right. a very powerful tool for tarbiyah as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know, uh, uh, Talasab, you've been helping out with like reminding Jamaats about uh, Jalsa and the reason, I mean, you could share on that. So. On Jalsa Salana, yeah. everything's related to Tarbiya. Of course. 100% it's true. It's and Tabli, both. Yeah, and tabli. Hand in hand, that's absolutely and yeah, yeah. You see a call here, they're serving water. Yes. And then when they put down, they're serving in different capacities. And these are Americans, but these they're doing Americans. the same duties that they would do in other countries. And absolutely. Point, yeah. I, I, want to know, uh, I want the world to know that these are American born children. That's right. Hmm. And they're serving just because of, because of God Almighty and the sake of God and to attain the pleasures of God. Because they inspired by Hazur. Hmm. Hazur visited here recently in the USA. Yes. And what a blessed saw, tour. Can say joke the joke. All people around the USA, they, you know, flew behind Hazur. Wherever is Hazur? They were there. In fact, Blevin Hazur mentioned that. He said one of the things, the salient features of USA. Uh, was that people stood in line for hours. Hours. For yeah. what? For Salat. Yeah. Not yeah. for any mulakat. They were just standing and then, we know we all experienced that as well. That was very powerful. Literally after Fajr, people would line up for Jummah prayer. That was, That's I remember six, people dressed hours. up for Jummah and people confused, like, why are they so ready just for Fajr? Exactly. It's like, no, we're in line for Jummah. For and Jummah. it was like, Yes, eight literally hours. After, exactly, yeah. right yeah. after Fajr, exactly. Yeah, and then, alhamdulillah, powerful. then we saw Khudam come and serve them cake, rust, and chai, you know, giving yeah. them that experience as well. But it was an amazing thing to experience and see. So, then, you know, uh, there's Hmm. So the manners, good conduct. Yes. And on Jalsa, you have a way to apply your conduct around right. your people. Hmm. Right, absolutely. And that's how you can show what are you. You are Ahmadi Muslim. Yeah? I think you brought up a good point in terms of Jalsa. What can people walk away with? Uh, I think one of the speeches covered... Many of them are watching now. Right. Encouraging them to come and join it and experience it themselves. The realest thing, Koster Sahib, I see with youth nowadays, one of the things is, you know, there's one thing if you're connected. Then there's, like, life happens. And you've made mistakes. Yeah. And all of us have made mistakes. But knowing that, there's such a guilt that adds... Acts as an obstacle coming to the mosque, coming to Jamaat events, because they feel like, how can I face Allah Ta'ala? So when we talk about these real issues and say where Allah Ta'ala is Ghafoor Rahim, where His mercy encompasses everything, that's His personality trait. God wants to forgive. And what Jal says, the platform, if you hear that, that's our identity, and that's how we should relate with Him. It was a really good reminder for me, but I was thinking about that, that our youth, when we sit here and listen, it's okay to realize we messed up. The important thing is to kind of walk away and say, be better. Jazakallah so much. This is an amazing conversation that we just had. And of course, we're going to go to Muhammad Ahmed Choli Saab and Abdullah Dibba Saab. We're also outside meeting people and getting their feedback as well. So Jazakallah. Oh, we have them right there. There we go. Dibba Saab and uh, Muhammad Ahmed Choli Saab. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Show us what's outside, going on right? outside. We have more fun. Saga. We're having more fun with the people out here. And uh, getting the heat there. It was a little colder in Zion, but then uh, when we got to Dallas, now it went from 30 degrees Fahrenheit to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The Texas hospitality, not only their the stakes there, but also their hospitality of the government there to escort Hazur from the airport to Hazur taking long outdoor walks. The the experience there was amazing in the sense that everyone got to see a lot of their Khalifa. A lot more time just watching the Zuru walk. And the external event, I know one of the guests was actually uh, one of the founders of Texas Instrument, a big Texas company, his wife. And she had donated uh, some land for us to use during the visit. And all the external guests just had an amazing experience um, there. And then we transitioned to Maryland. 
Absolutely, and a part of Dallas, you know, it's also amazing to see how people follow Huzur around. People take three weeks to a month off of work. Some people even say, I don't know if I'll have a job when I go back, but just the love of Khilafat, and they travel around, and these are long distances for those who may not know, and also Huzur went to Fort Worth. We don't want to forget Fort Worth, but close, not too far from, from Dallas, so there were two mosques that were inaugurated by Huzur. But Maryland is headquarters of the Jamaat in the USA. Huzur goes there, we talk about, he has mulakals in all of these, you know, in all of these places, but Maryland is like home. Everyone is used to, they're used to the organization. For Dallas, it was new to, to host Huzur. For, for Zion, it was new to host Azul for a week. But Maryland is like home. Everyone just comes in and we all, people even from outside of the country came. So I think Maryland was like a jalsa for seven days straight. And I think that made it really, really amazing. Yeah, you know, Maryland is a place where Hazur has been before as well, and all the internal meetings happen. There's a lot of a lot of meetings, a lot seeing Hazur a lot more, uh, a lot more. But also, Hazur went to Joppa Town, where some may not know Hazur has a private residence there as well, as well as 48 other Amadis uh, who are living there. For Hazur to be able to see that, walk in that area, visit some members' homes that are there as well, uh, was phenomenal. Before Hazur came back just that night. That's beautiful. You know, people stood outside of their newly built homes. This is a whole neighborhood where majority, uh, it was actually initiated by the Jamaat. It's called the Ansar Housing Project in Jabba Town. Huzur went to his own house. And then people were standing in front of their houses with banners, waving at Huzur. And he was walking in that whole neighborhood. And he went to some houses. And then he met, people showed them, you know, their houses. And it was just so, it was like a father visiting his children, his spiritual children. So that made Maryland so unique as well. And, you know, those those things. You know, in speaking to the members who were going from place to place or just were able to attend one place, one thing people really craved for after, uh, after COVID or we were almost during COVID was to just pray behind their Khalifa, uh, just to see, have a glimpse of their Khalifa. And some members, as we were hearing earlier from the, the in-studio session was, I know a member from Silicon Valley who stood in line from 6 a.m. for Juma and then came for every other namaz, and the whole day revolved around making sure that they were inside the masjid for that particular prayer, which which goes to show the spirituality of our members as well. This is something that Huzur complimented himself. When Huzur went back to London and he gave that Friday sermon, he talked about how impressed he was. He talked about the people that stood in line for hours. And, and for us, this is not something we deserve. It's Ihsan from Huzur. It's his kindness that he's showing us traveling all these distances. distances. And when we think about it sometimes, how much time does Huzur really get? You know, when Huzur is there doing the mulakats, we're outside talking, getting tea, and, and you know, just chit-chatting. But Huzur's program is back to back to back, leading all the prayers. And for us, of course, five daily prayers behind Huzur every day. I mean, throughout this trip was, was just such an amazing experience, you know, Alhamdulillah. So we can keep talking about it all day. Uh, abs absolutely. Now we're going to uh, transition uh, to some more stories of individuals from around the country who experienced their Khalifa coming for the, his first visit after COVID and visiting the, choosing to visit the United States of America and how they did that. So we're going to record to some, some stories and, and, and watch some stories from, from the visit. Khudai Pak ki ghalib hui takdeer zayin me Khudai Pak ki ghalib hui takdeer zayin me Khudai Pak ki ghalib hui takdeer zayin me Alhamdulillah, I got the approval late July, early August and then right after that, Naib Amir Sahib Nasim Ramatullah Sahib came and told me that the plans have changed from seven hours to seven days and so um, he said he was quite surprised that I was still standing and um, he said have a seat and <laughs> so I sat down and I, then it hit me that um, so it was the beginning of August so which meant we had about eight weeks of uh, preparation and Naseem Ramatullah Saab and his team came and they visited us and they told us that we needed several things. One was the Ziafit cooking, Ziafit serving. We were uh, in a small area of less than three acres and the mosque and the, pro and the house and the parking took up majority of it. So we had to fill, uh, figure out how we're going to get the marquees in. And uh, then it was decided that no cars except Hazur's entourage would be on the premise. So very quick story about accommodation. 
was that there was a hotel, a beach, Zion uh, Beach Resort, uh, that was under renovation, and it just so happens that uh, they were open for business around the middle of August. And Alhamdulillah, we booked about 90 rooms, and uh, we were very blessed. And now uh, we know that was a sign from Allah Ta'ala, but we did, still did not have a area to serve the members. So that was another challenge. And uh, another miracle, another blessing of Allah Ta'ala is that um, that there was a piece, a small piece of land that was available. So uh, we inquired from the city that uh, what's happening with this property, and it was a tax lien property. So then we asked that how can we use this, who can we contact? They said to go to the county. We went to the county. The county said, you know, this is the person that owns the property and you can approach them and it, it's up to them. We did approach that person that owned the land and the land, they said that you can do whatever you like. And um, uh, that was another blessing of Khalafat, alhamdulillah. Then the last remaining piece was the parking. Uh, we had um, a huge challenge with parking. We talked to our churches. Some churches refused right away. And then we just, we were just really worried about parking. We found two smaller lots, but it was only about 300. And they were very specific. They did not want us to use all of it. So but that went down to about 100. And also they would not allow us to use seven days. We found another church that had an 18 acre lot and they allowed us to use their grass and their areas. However, we needed something closer. That was about three miles away. And for our volunteers, we need to go in and out, in and out, very quickly. And Alhamdulillah, literally two weeks before Hazur's arrival, we were able to secure a uh, land just down the street, less than a mile walk, which had about probably five to 700 car parking. It was great for our volunteers. The last piece was just the furnitures. You know, the house, Azur's house residence, was literally last minute details were being done, but then the furniture was an issue. Uh, we were supposed to get the furniture on a weeknight, and this is literally two, three days before Azur's arrival. And the uh, furniture company said they could not deliver it. And then the earliest they could deliver was Saturday. Now Hazur is coming Sunday. We just could not risk that the delivery to be on Saturday. And we don't know if they will actually deliver it. Plus we have to, these were disassembled uh, brand new furniture. So then <clears throat> we decided that uh, Niasa, our national secretary, Property Secretary just made a decision that let's go and find a truck and let's just send Khadams down. And uh, it was an hour and a half away. It was in rush hour traffic. And a lot of Khadams and Ansar were waiting for that December. Uh, we were waiting for that truck, original truck. So we said we'll go down. The problem was finding a box truck. And Alhamdulillah, one company uh, was able to secure us a box truck. However, they made us promise that we have to deliver it, the truck back the same day or same night because that's out for rental for the next day. And so they, we confirmed that when we said, and the truck went down with some other khudams and some other cars and alhamdulillah, they were able to load the truck themselves, to bring it back. And that night and the next day and all the way up to Sunday, we were able to put the furniture together. So these were just... Um, you know, there were a lot of different obstacles, a lot of different roadblocks, a lot of different uh, issues along the way, but somehow, somewhere, Allah Ta'ala uh, opened those up for us. Aye, huzur ghar mein hamare khush amdeed Utre hai aasman se tare khush amdeed it was ecstatic. It was just, uh, we just could not believe that Hazur was staying for seven days. Not even one day. We just had never imagined that. We are such a small Jamaat. Not only that, our neighbors came. Many neighbors came and uh, were congratulating us and were offering flower pots and they were offering to plant flowers for us. And that's a sign of friendship, a, tr a sign of trust. And so that also changed the hearts of our neighbors. 
Um, prior to that, though, I wanted to step back, is that we wanted to inform our neighbors as well in that uh, mosque area because the entrance is not off of a busy entrance now. It's not off of a busy road. The entrance to the mosque is now off of a residential street. So we were extremely worried that our neighbors <laughs> would build this mosque and they won't know about it. So what we did, we did a Meet the Neighbor campaign. We had gifts for the neighbors. Um, and this was uh, spearheaded by Janaid Latif Saab and uh, his family and Al-Fabad. They all went out and met with the neighbors. And then not only that, we also know that meeting with the police, there was going to be barricades. And we did not want to disturb our neighbors to come in and, and then get frustrated. And because they, have, they live in the area, we wanted them to go in and out with ease. So we gave them a, a super pass that we told the police is going to be this color, bright colored, and um, if you see this neighbor, please let them go. And the police were just, um, they were just, um, they were highly impressed with our organization. And the discipline, and the, yeah, the police, by the way, let me complete that also, they were very uh, surprised with the discipline, the organization, and the obedience. When the police was telling us not to go on the street, members immediately reacted and then our neighbors were very impressed in fact we did not receive a single complaint the police we asked the police every day okay how many complaints zero how many complained the next day zero well, by the end of the day of the week there was not a single complaint from our neighbors and that's a, a, a true blessing of love our cleaning crew that we hired and contracted they had covid and they got sick like the second day. So all of a sudden, the next five days, we had to have our own internal <laughs> cleaning. And our members stepped up. It was amazing because they said, what should I do? I need cleaning. And they would go and clean the bathrooms. They would clean. And uh, alhamdulillah, it was just uh, just amazing. With the... Yeah, so the Sadr uh, um, in the U.S., um, Dr. Madil Abdullah Saab, um, was at a restaurant with some Khadams and he was eating uh, uh, breakfast and um, our neighbors in Zion um, came up to him, are you that uh, Muslim group that's uh, opening up that mosque? And um, they said, yes, we are. They said, oh, welcome to Zion. Thank you for coming, blessing us. And what they, that neighbor did is that they paid for their breakfast. And when Madil by Sadr Saab went to go and pay for the breakfast, he was shocked that it was already paid for by our neighbor. So this was just one of three I heard gestures. Like we would go to the coffee shops and say we would like some coffee. And then they sit on the house. Um, then um, uh, Azhar Hanif Saab, Naib Amir Saab, missionary in charge, he walked several miles from his hotel to the mosque. And he was just walking, and he said that I was walking, and many neighbors were saying, were just looking at him, and they waved to him. And then some, he said that some were even asking, hey, you know, do you need a ride? Do you need something? And then he even said the police came and stopped and said, you know, uh, waved to him. And he was just uh, amazed that he said that somehow the angels have descended on your, on the city of Zion and opened up the hearts of the, the members of Zion. And it was a transformal, transform, transformational change of the citizens and our Jamaat. And um, there were a lot of, uh, a few uh, second generation, third generation Amdis that you know, we were struggling trying to have, and they were coming out regularly, alhamdulillah. So it was, um, it's continuing. Hazur's blessings and the blessings of Khalafan and Hazur's visit have blessed us and it's continuing. Uh, it's, you know, it's six months now or seven months now and we, our neighbors still are giving their gratitude. <laughs>
going on here at Jalsa Gah, at the Jalsa Salana in Pennsylvania. People have finished their Salat of Zuhur and Asr combined. Now they're heading to lunch. You're probably getting closer to your, dinner, uh, your lunch tables as well to eat something, but that's part of the whole experience here. People also get an opportunity to meet and, and, and talk to each other and, and, and kind of catch up with what's, what's going on in each other's lives. You've enjoyed Huzur's visit in Zion and some of the things that happened there. The next segment that we'll show you is also a highlight of um, Huzur's visit in Dallas. When he came last year in 2022 from Zion, Hazrat Khalifa al Masih went to Dallas. And then from Dallas, he went to Bat Rahman in Maryland, which is the headquarters of the USA Jamaat. So we'll introduce now the next one, which is a short clip or a short video to talk to you about some of the things that happened in Dallas while Huzur visited and also in Fort Worth, which is also in Texas. So keep tight, keep enjoying these programs, and we'll keep bringing you more and more of what's happening here. आए हुजूर घर में हमारे खुशामदीद उतरे हैं आसमान से We had started making preparations and started planning the visit for Fazal Khalifa al Masih back in 2020 and early 2021 uh, then earlier of course that visit was all uh, disrupted due to covid and early 2022 we learned about Khalifa al Masih's visit planned visit to Dallas, to USA and to Dallas. So that's where uh, preparations uh, were uh, restarted and our um, officer for this preparation on a local level was our Vice President Khaled Karak so Dallas had never uh, in the past held an event, anything close to the kind of event we hosted. Uh, we've had some regional programs, but we never really held even a national program, let alone an international program. So this was obviously very daunting for us. I mean, the mass on the West Coast or East Coast, they had done such, such things in the past, but for us, it was the first time. So along with the excitement, there was a lot of fear as well and um, panic that the Khalifa al is going to come. So will we be able to do it? We don't have this kind of experience. Uh, so that's what we felt initially, but by the grace of Allah, you know, it's really a blessing of Khalifa that everybody came together. Um, our our people were inexperienced from Dallas Samad, but we got a lot of help from national and people who who, who had hosted uh, the Khalifa al Masih in the past. Different teams from the national, they came and visited our mosque and slowly it gave us the confidence that, you know, Allah Ta'ala will bless our efforts and we'll be able to pull it off. <laughs> Our masjid is in the city of Allen. It's a small suburb town in the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex area. Um, and we've been working with the uh, mayor's office and with the mayor. And the mayor is extremely supportive of our uh, Jamaat. And he's, he's been to our events many times. And he assured us of full support during this whole uh, as a South visit. But unfortunately, due to some personal commitments, he could not be available either to receive Huzur and he could not be available even at the uh, inauguration ceremony and he was traveling out of country. But he was available on one of the days and he just wanted to uh, see Huzur uh, walk by. And um, Amir Saab Germany said, why don't you come and stand next to me? And the city of Allen mayor stood by Amir Saab Germany. And when Hazrat Khalifa Masih walked by, uh, he noticed Amir Saab Germany. And he stopped to meet with uh, Amir Saab Germany. And then Amir Saab Germany uh, introduced the city of Allen mayor to Hazrat Khalifa Masih. And they ended up talking. And uh, that was a very memorable moment for uh, the city of Allen mayor. The city of Allen is fortunate that such a peace love and service oriented community has decided to settle down here and build such a beautiful mosque. It is my wish that this mosque becomes a beacon of hope, and not just for the city, but for all those around it. Your Holiness, on behalf of the Mayor and City Council of Allen, as a gesture of our gratitude for your presence and leadership, it is my honor to present to you the key to the city of Allen, Texas. The support that we got from the local government officials and local city officials was really tremendous. And our mosque is in Texas, and Texas is a uh, conservative Christian uh, state. 
and generally people would think that they would not be welcoming of uh, a Muslim Khalifa, a Khalifa of the Jamaat, but when we approach the local city officials, the local police chief, local mayor, Collin County Sheriff, they were on board the very first day and they said that we will treat this as a head of state visit and we will give the Khalifa al all the protocols of the head of state visit and they took it upon themselves how to figure out the logistics of different things and Huzur's motorcade and all those details and they provided us security detail and also provided us with police security, traffic management and all of that they did free of cost and with wholeheartedness they supported us. So I'm, we are really blessed and may Allah reward them for all they did for uh, for us while Huzur was here. Allen Police Chief knew us, but there were 16 jurisdictions between Dallas-Fort Worth and Allen. And so the Allen Police by themselves couldn't do anything. We were just lucky that the Allen police chief had worked as an assistant police chief in Dallas. So he, he had all those connections already. So during the Hazur's trip, he was able to coordinate on his own with all the other jurisdictions, with the Fort Worth police, uh, with Dallas Fort Worth police, which is its own police. Uh, and uh, one of the things, of course, we, we had the trip planned uh, for, for the departure, uh, for the arrival and the departure. But uh, the trip to Fort Worth was Friday afternoon at around 5 o'clock. Peak rush hour, uh, Texas highways, six lanes all blocked and so on. And the police chief said the one thing that we can't do is provide the escort to Hazur's uh, kafla during that time. It's just peak rush hour and state police has to get involved, otherwise we can't. One day before, the person who was leading this whole police uh, uh, kind of entourage, he basically, without us knowing, went to the police chief and said, I don't feel comfortable having Hazur go like this, so we're going to provide the the end-to-end -end escort uh, with all our cars. And so uh, this was just, again, faith-inspiring to see a Texas highway on a Friday afternoon blocked uh, for Hazur's trip, and, and we were just wishing the police came up with the idea themselves. He convinced his boss, and he, when we were able to go without any hindrance, uh, so we didn't have to wait uh, at all, and we just went uh, to Fort Worth uh, with the full escort. <laughs> Parking was going to be a big issue. We were going to expect, we were expecting about three to 4,000 people um, to come, and uh, this is a residential area. So parking was always going to be a big issue. So we had talked to a hotel. Uh, we, had, we, was, we were going to run shuttles. We had uh, reserved several thousand parking spaces and so on. And, um, and, and of course, we had ongoing meetings with the police. And uh, uh, like third or fourth meeting, we, I just walk out with the police chief right next to me, and I said, I wish we could get this piece of land, which was um, uh, owned by uh, a lady by the name of Mary McDermott, who's a philanthropist in Dallas, and she's got 300 acres right next to the masjid. And, um, and, and he, the police chief goes, you know what? I have done security for her, and I know her. I can introduce you to her. And uh, that was just like the first uh, incident of, okay, Allah Ta'ala is here to kind of start helping us. But he also said, you know what? She doesn't usually want any public attention, so I don't think it's, it's, it, you've got a chance, but we'll give it a shot. We introduced uh, the Jamaat. We introduced what it meant for us to have Huzur there and so on. And she listened to all that, and he said, um, I think you guys know what you're doing. Um, I'm going to give you the land. And, um, and the police chief later on told me that the one, that one thing that really impressed her and what she said to the police chief later on was, these people are about others. They're not about themselves. I meet a lot of politicians, I meet a lot of people, and, and they are about others. And that's why I feel that I'm obligated to give them the land because they care about others. So alhamdulillah, that was just a turning point, and that allowed us to have almost on-site parking for as many cars as we wanted. The one day before uh, Hazur's arrival, uh, the of course the parking lot was was dusty and it was windy, so the, there was a lot of dust in the air. 
And uh, we were just discussing inside, sitting in the library, looking at what was going on outside. There's a lot of dust in the air and so on. And we started to figure out if we need to have a tanker there to just water tanker to just get, settle down the water. But then there was a concern that one day, two days before, it's not it's going to make the parking lot really messy. And, uh, and And we were just kind of out of any options at that point. And then all of a sudden, we saw these gusts turn into rain. It rained literally for about 15 minutes, and it was gone, right? So it served what we exactly wanted to do without really making it a mess. So Alhamdulillah Ta'ala just uh, literally uh, brought in rain to, uh, to help us uh, in, these, uh, uh, in a circumstance where we had no answer to that. <laughs> Those still have been very beneficial for the growth of the Jamaat. By the grace of Allah, we keep on hearing that people want to move to Dallas. And uh, not only Ahmadis, but we also started noticing that ever since Al Khalifatul Masih left, there is a lot more traffic or non Ahmadi people coming to our masjid to say their namaz and to say their Juma. And that uh, on, uh, during Ramadan, during Aftari, they were almost on all nights there were a couple of non md people breaking their fast with us and saying their prayers with us so we think that's all because of the presence of the khalifa amongst us that it has really blessed the town and the masjid with uh, that attraction that people are attracted to it as muslims we believe that allah the almighty has granted us the ability and means to build this mosque therefore we must express our gratitude to him and in reality genuine gratitude to Allah is only possible when we are also grateful and appreciative to his creation. The Amadeus came out publicly against extremism and just respect the courage that it takes to do that and to hear his holiness and hear about his efforts I, I see that that he's built that culture in the Amadeus community. So in the end, what I want to say is that um, what makes us really happy as Dallas Jamaat members is knowing that the Khalifa al Masih was happy with the Dallas Jamaat and the Dallas Masjid. That to us is the most precious thing that we could have asked for. Alhamdulillah, now we are at the Langar Khana, and this is the uh, place where a lot of the hospitality takes place, and that is the cooking, making sure that the guests of the Prophet Muhammad are taken care of. A lot of people spend a lot of time preparing food, taking their time off in this heat. It's actually very hot here compared to other parts of Jalsa Salana. So I'm here to talk to Tahir Chaudhary Sahib, who is well known as Mamu. Assalamu alaikum Tahir Sahib. He's in charge of the Langar Khana, Tahir Sahib. You have been working with this work and the Langar Khana is the first time of the Prophet Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. The Prophet Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Wasalam has also said about this work and the Prophet Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Wasalam has also done a lot of work. So, tell us about this work and what is the work of the Prophet Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. 
मैं नायब लंगर जलसा सलाना हूँ और मेरी रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी सारा सेटअप ग्रोसरीज और एवरी ऑल द परचेजेस मैं मैं वो करता हूँ अच्छा सामान की और सर अच्छा माशाल्लाह तो यहाँ पे खाना पक रहा है हमें बताएं आज मेन्यू में क्या है क्या पक रहा है आज आज आलू गोश्त पास्ता और खीर है डिजर्ट एंड वी हैव आल्सो हमारे गुलाबी चाय अच्छा हमें कुछ दिखा सकते हैं कोई किसी को कह सकते कि वो खोल के हमें दिखाएं अगर हो सकता है तो सो ही कैन टेल मी व्हाट्स ऑन द मेन्यू टुडे इट्स वेरी एक्साइटिंग टू सी ऑल दिस वेरी हार्ड वर्किंग जेंटलमैन एंड दे वुड शो अस ये क्या है व्हाट्स हैपनिंग हियर व्हाट इज दिस ये है पिंक टी से कहते हैं इसे कश्मीरी चाय भी बोलते हैं ये दूध से बनाई जाती है और ये मोस्टली हम सैटरडे को लंच टाइम पे सर्व करते हैं सो हाउ लॉन्ग डज इट टेक टू प्रिपेयर दिस कितना टाइम इसके लिए कम से कम छह घंटे लगते हैं पांच छह घंटे वाह सो अबाउट सिक्स आवर्स इट टेक्स टू प्रिपेयर दिस पिंक टी सो लेट्स गो टेल अस मोर अबाउट द यू सेड दिस पास्ता एंड व्हाट एल्स इज देयर जी पास्ता एंड देन चावल और आलू गोश्त है ओके सो देयर इज राइस देयर इज आलू गोश्त इज अ a uh, meat with potatoes uh, it's a very famous dish this this happens at jalsa goat ka hai acha goat ha ji okay what else is here uh, can you show us something ha uh, ji ye actually wo saman sara chala gaya hua lunch ke liye main aapko idhar pasta ka dikhata hu assalam alaikum cream dal pasta bana hai idhar koi so so lunch lunch is going on right now uh, and um, they've they've served lunch and i think uh, you started the preparations for dinner is that right yes, yes. so so how do you measure the amount of guests that are coming and um, the the preparation that you have to do tell us a little bit about that wo jo teen ek pound mein hum count karte hain teen guests to uske hisab se gosht ko aur paste ki bhi isi tarah hi hai wo pound ke hisab se na wo teen तीन गैस पे डिवाइड करते हैं तो फिर उसके उसके हिसाब से हम फिर सारी ग्रोसरी वगैरह करते हैं जिससे हम प्रिपेयर करके तो ओके सो दिस इज दिस द दिस द पास्ता दैट्स बीइंग कैन यू अस्सलाम वालेकुम वालेकुम अस्सलाम हाउ आर यू सर वालेकुम सो टेल अस अ लिटिल अबाउट द पास्ता पास्ता आई मेक अ चिकन पास्ता विद अ नूडल एंड नॉन स्पाइसी एंड ओके सो द पीपल लाइक दिस अ लॉट व्हेन यू डू इट ओवर द इयर्स पीपल लव इट थैंक यू सो मच फॉर फॉर योर योर वर्क हाँ जी करीम दाद है जिन्होंने करीम दाद है जिन्होंने पास्ता शुरू किया था यूएसए में फॉर नॉन स्पाइसी हीटर जो मिर्चों वाला खाना नहीं खा सकते उनके लिए यहाँ पे सबका ख्याल रखते हैं ओके माशा ये यहाँ पे सबका ख्याल रखते हैं क्योंकि लोग बाहर से भी आते हैं जो अहमदी नहीं है जो शायद देसी भी ना हो बस अफ्रीकन अमेरिकन बस जो अमेरिकन नेटिव अमेरिकन सब आते हैं यहाँ पे तो आप आप कह रहे हैं कि वी मेक श्योर दैट एवरीवन एवरीवन हाँ जी वो एवरीवन इज अकोमोडेटेड द वे यू नो द रिक्वायरमेंट्स आर माशा सो डिनर हाउ अर्ली डू यू स्टॉप प्रेपरेशन फॉर डिनर डिनर का जो है हमने वी ऑलरेडी स्टार्टेड कुकिंग डिनर द लंच इज ऑलरेडी बिन टेकिंग वे सो राइट नो वी आर मेकिंग अ दाल लंगर दाल and that's in the process so it should be ready next 2 or 3 hours so there's a lot of uh, people that are here uh, roughly uh, how do you begin to get people to come and commit to work people volunteer hanji mere we have a a team of people who been cooking with me uh, and they are off and on but the, most of them the uh, team is uh, from new york and uh, virginia they been cooking for these parts and with us from years now mashallah so, to ab आप देख रहे हैं कि लोग अपने काम को छोड़ के हजरत मसीम सलाम की मोहब्बत की वजह से यहाँ आके मेहमान के लिए खाना पकाते हैं माशाल्लाह अच्छा हमारे अपना सलीम खान साहब और वो है अच्छा अस्सलाम वालेकुम तो आप बताए यहाँ पे क्या पकड़ा है क्या पकड़ा है और किस तरह किस हिसाब से पकड़ा है ये जो है आज मटन कौरमा बनाया था हमने और देट वॉज अप्रोक्सीमेटली थ्री पाउंड सो हमने अभी तक सारा सब कर दिया ये आखिर में बैकअप में हम बाकी कर रहे हैं अभी ऑलमोस्ट हम जो है ना वो सप्लाई कर चुके हैं सारा ये, ये डिनर के लिए नहीं लंच के लिए अच्छा ये भी लंच का हिस्सा है अभी तक लंच पक रहा है जी जी अभी लंच जो है ना कोई लंच अभी चल रहा है तो ये साथ एक बैकअप है क्योंकि अभी अल्लाह का फसल है बहुत सारे माशाल्लाह माशाल्लाह जितने मेहमान आए हुए हैं यहाँ पे बहुत गर्मी भी है लेकिन अल्लाह के फजल से ये अपना काम में लगे हैं तो आप इनको किस तरह मोटिवेट करते हैं इतनी गर्मी में इतने घंटों में काम कर रहे हैं ये पैशन है अहमदियत का 
और उसकी वजह से ये अपना घर बार और अपनी चापे और सब छुट्टियां लेके आते हैं और वो पूरा हफ्ता ये हमारे साथ काम करते हैं तो जैसे हजूर का ट्रिप भी था उस पर एक ग्रुप था उन्होंने तीन हफ्ते की छुट्टियां ली थी अठारह दिन की बल्कि और उन्होंने बहुत काम किया माशाल्लाह और दे वो सारे तीनों हजूर के विजिट सिटी एरिया को उन्होंने कवर किया था हमारे और जब वो यहाँ पे ठीक है तो ये मैंने देखा है कि मुख्तलि टीम्स हैं कुछ खाना पका रहे हैं कुछ ट्रांसपोर्टेशन के भी हैं कुछ प्याज काट रहे हैं तो काफी सारे आप इनको किस तरह मैनेज करते हैं माशाल्लाह ये ये सारे ग्रुप्स हैं जो पास्ता का है वो अलग ग्रुप है जो चाय बनाते हैं वो एक अलग ग्रुप है और जो आप आलू गोश्त वगैरह या वो पाकिस्तानी डिश बनाते हैं वो एक अलग ग्रुप है तो उन टीमों के फिर उनके हिसाब से मैं डिवाइड करता हूँ सबसे बड़ी टीम मेरी इसकी जो पाकिस्तानी कुकिंग की है वो आलू गोश्त वगैरह की वो है तो फिर पास्ता की जो है टीम है सेकंड और थर्ड जो है चाय की है माशा माशा तो अब हम चलते हैं वो सर्विस खाना सर्विस एरिया तो यहाँ पे खाना पकता है तो आप हमें बताए हैं कि यहाँ से जब हम आगे जाएंगे तो क्या हम देखेंगे हाँ जी आगे हम वो हबीब विरक साहब हैं वो सारे वो फूड सर्विंग का सारा अरेंजमेंट करते हैं तो ये टीम है जो पीछे खड़ी है वो है जो फूड डिलीवर करती है यहाँ से लचना में और उधर मैं माशाल्लाह माशाल्लाह सो व्यूअर्स अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह यू कैन सी दैट टाइम अ लॉट ऑफ ऑपरेशन इज हैपनिंग हियर अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल हैव डेडिकेटेड देयर टाइम टू कम एंड स्पेंड हियर टू मेक श्योर दैट ऑल द गेस्ट आर एंटरटेन द फूड इज बीइंग प्रिपेयर्ड एंड इज फ्रेश अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह आई एम श्योर यू हैव एंजॉयड दैट सो फ्रॉम हियर यू कैन गो अहेड टू द सर्विस एरिया व्हिच इज ऑल पार्ट ऑफ दिस टीम दैट ताहिर चौधरी साहब इज मैनेजिंग एंड आई विल आल्सो गेट अ ग्लिम्स ऑफ व्हाट्स हैपनिंग ओवर देयर तो था सब चल रहा है हां जी चल Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the 73rd annual convention of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, known as Jalsa Salana USA. Uh, I have an esteemed panel with me today uh, at this August occasion, and we will start with the introductions. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum uh, I have with me our respected National Sadr Sahib, uh, Dia Bakr Sahib. How are you, Sadr Sahib? Alhamdulillah. Uh next to her I have Dr. Atiya Malik Saheba who is serving as the um Muawna Sadr for Bagh Fatino. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum uh, assalam. And then finally we have Zuna Ahmed Saheba who is currently serving as the National Tarbiyat Secretary. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah for being here. How are you feeling today? Good. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah. So Sadr Saheba we are gathered here at a very special occasion and this year has been a very blessed year. in many ways uh, especially in light of the recent visit of our beloved hazur could you shed some light on uh, the different activities that we've done and the importance and significance of lajna e maila yes so um first of all i'm i'm grateful for the opportunity to be here uh, celebrating our 73rd jalsa salana but also this is a uh, lajna e maila centenary year So we're happy that we're also coordinating our 100 year uh anniversary with our USA Jalsa Salana. Um the importance of um our centenary is to really appreciate um the again opportunity that Khalifa II Masih II, may Allah be pleased with him, gave us in establishing Lajna e Maila in 1922. And uh since then um we've been very um active our pioneers have um worked very hard to put I'll say Lajna e Maila on the map. Um we've had a lot of activities um that we've been involved with social services to humanity um helping um our students in schools Title 1 schools um during the pandemic helping feeding the poor um also our regular routine of um increasing our knowledge in talim and tarbiyat or you know religious education and moral training um hazur blessed our visit last year i uh, best blessed his visit with us last year um and we were very fortunate to have him in zion illinois and dallas fort worth uh texas also and then at our um headquarters at batul rahman in maryland silver spring and that was a a very awesome experience 
I think he, well, I know he motivated all the members because we just increased our activity. And also he kind of charged us with um, a couple of objectives for our centenary. And I'll let our national Tarbia secretary share those objectives. Mm -hmm. Star class. We move on to, yes, those centenary goals and they're very important goals. Sister Zuna, would you like to talk about those? Assalamu alaikum. Yes. So at the beginning of our centenary year, Hazrat Khalifa Tul Masih, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Nasrah al Aziz, focused our attention, I would say refocused our attention rather, on the fundamentals of why this um, auxiliary was formed, Lajnai Maila. You know, what was the reason? And he um, reminded us that it's what would in a real celebration entail for us. You know, a hundred years we're celebrating, but it also behooves us to uh, self-analyze and see how we are doing. And so we were given these uh, goals. How attached are we to the nizam -e jamaat and how active are we as Lajna? And how are we in the observance of our daily Salat and worship? And how are we teaching our children to be uh, observant in Salat as well? Uh, how are we in the regular recitation of the Holy Quran? And how are we striving to act upon its teachings, which include the observance of Parda for believing women? So how are we in the observance of modesty in our actions and in our in our inner lives? Yes. So Huzur very graciously uh, re-focused uh, us on what we need to do uh, internally, the work we need to do internally and externally as an auxiliary in order to make this a true celebration. Yes, that's beautiful. That's correct. And you know, those goals we need to be working on. Yes. And inshallah, we will try our best to uh, follow them and implement them in our lives. Uh, in light of the discussion we've had so far, Dr. Atya, what, has, uh, what are some of your sentiments? You know, this was Azur's first visit uh, after the pandemic. Um, and you as a Moana Sadr for Wak Patino had a great responsibility. Uh, you had several classes. Would you like to talk a little bit about your department and what activities you did? Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it was a tremendous blessing that Hazur Aydhullah Ta'ala bin Nasr al uh, dedicated some of his precious time to meet with the Vakfat. And we held two classes. One was in Dallas, Texas, and one was in Silver Spring, Maryland. And alhamdulillah, they were both very successful meetings. The Vakvat were so appreciative and grateful afterwards that they had that opportunity to meet with Hazur. And um, before, I remember that they were very nervous, nervous, excited. Um, and then afterwards, they were very emotional and still reeling from the experience. Mm -hmm. Would you uh, uh, just mention wh where the classes were held across the country? Because as we were visited a couple of places, would you like to talk a little bit about where the different classes were held? Uh, gee, so one class was held in Dallas, Texas at Bethel Ikram, and then the other class was held in Silver Spring, Maryland at Bethel Ramon. And you said that Vakfat really enjoyed it. Is there any specific message that you might have for Vakfat uh, that you would like to share? Um, just that it's it was a tremendous blessing and that we should not uh, take those moments for granted and take the wisdom and the guidance that he gave us and remember that as we move forward in our daily lives um, to fulfill his expectations, inshallah. Yeah, that's true. Shakala. So this is a this has been a special year. There's been a lot of activities, you know, with Hazur's visit and the centenary uh, celebrations. What are your personal sentiments, and what is it that you would like for Lajna and Maila uh, to hear today? Well, I, you know, I think our beloved uh, Hazur, may Allah strengthen him with his mighty help, really laid that foundation when he um, clearly uh, reminded us what our objectives are. And over the centenary, um, at least since 1922 for Lajna Emela USA, we've been striving to live up to some of those expectations, mm -hmm. which our National Tarbiya Secretary has mentioned. Um, we're trying right now to um, drive our uh, Lajna members to making collective prayers in the mosque mm -hmm. or in the Salat centers in their neighborhoods. 
Uh, we're trying to empower them with self-esteem uh, to observe their purda because our beloved Hazur has said constantly over and over that we should not have an inferiority complex with the way we appear in this society. So, you know, we're definitely trying to encourage women to stand up and be counted as an Ahmadi Muslim woman. Um, we also um, have uh, very uh, blessed to have 74 new uh, certified Holy Quran teachers Mashallah. within Lejna and mm -hmm. Maela. Um, we're also trying to meet an objective to increase the number of Wasiyats, Musis, mm -hmm. within Lejna and Maela, starting with uh, Amla at the national, regional, and local level. Um, and the rest of the things that we're doing is just um, trying to reflect back uh, and again looking at the hard work that our pioneers have done and lay a good path for our future. You know, our young people like the Walk the Nall who are coming up, Hazur has stressed that, you know, that the careers that they choose, they should write letters to Hazur and seek his guidance. Um, and a lot of our young people are going into medicine, but also being a teacher and engineers and social workers are just as beneficial to our society as being a physician. Um, we're trying to motivate people to, you know, go into like walk the RZ, uh, dedicate their time and, um, you know, their skills and everything for serving humanity at large. Mm -hmm. so. Good. Um, is there anything you would like to shed light on that we haven't? We um, do have a special feature this time around um, at Jalsa Salana, um, and uh, this, we're the Lajna has organized a centenary um, centenary exhibition. Uh, would you like to share about that? Yes. So um, this is our very first exhibition, and that we've had a team of uh, Lajna members who work very hard, and they've gathered a lot of photos and. Uh, information and um, our, our old archive, the Tallinn magazines, and um, again, trying to show a timeline of Lajna Emaila in the USA starting from 1922, but actually one of our first uh, American converts, uh, she joined Ahmadid in 1921. Mm -hmm. So we're showcasing this timeline of events and activities. Um, we're also showing that our beloved Khalifas over the time, uh, their messages that they've given to Lajna Imaela to inspire them and to keep them on the right track and guide them through, um, you know, the secular uh, world. And um, we also have uh, brought to light some of the contributions that Lajna Imaela have made to the Jamaat and society, one being the um, construction of the Zion Mosque, mm -hmm which um, is named Fateh Azim, which means the great victory. It's great victory for Ahmadid in regards to um, the Mubahala between um, Dr. Alexander Dowie, the founder of Zion, Illinois, and our um, promised Messiah, Lewa Salaam, um, where, you know, in Zion, the whole objective there at that time was to annihilate Muslims. Yes. And we really feel that the construction of this mosque is showing that Ahmadiyya thrived and they're continuing to thrive and the community is recognizing Ahmadiyya um, more Zakal. and more in their progress. Zakalasa the Saiba, that's very helpful, alhamdulillah. Uh, and we're very blessed to belong to um, such a blessed community of the Promised Messiah, Salam. Uh, we just a, a quick thing. So you, we had a we had our, this is the first time that we had uh, Dajna members attend the international volleyball tournament. Would you briefly talk about it? Just very briefly. Yes. Um, so that volleyball tournament was um, very inspiring. Uh, and to just be brief, uh, if it was not for our beloved Khalifa, may Allah strengthen him with his mighty hand, giving us the opportunity. Um, besides just playing a sport, it brought the young people together from Australia and Germany and Canada, um, UK, of course, uh, France, and they really bonded. And the teamwork in the individual teams, but also us collectively worldwide as a Lejna Imaela 
that was more thrilling than watching the game. Yes, alhamdulillah. Uh -huh. That's good to hear, yes. And I'm sure it was very good for the young people. Yeah. Yes. Jazakallah, Sadr Saba, Sister Atya and uh, Sister Zuna, uh, we thank you so much for your time and we hope and we pray that Allah enables us all to uh, fulfill the vision of uh, Hazrat Muslim al Ta'ala Anu, who uh, founded the Auxiliary of Lajna Imaila, and we truly meet the purpose when we celebrate 100 years of Lajna Imaila. Jazakallah so much, sisters. आए हुजूर घर में हमारे खुशामदीद उतरे हैं आसमान से तारे खुशामदीद अस्सलाम वालेकुम रहमत अल्लाह माय नेम इज नवीद मलिक एंड आई एम करेंटली सर्विंग एज द प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ द मेरिलैंड जमात आई मीन इट्स नॉट अ सीक्रेट एनीमोर बट यू नो वी हैव सीन इट सो मेनी टाइम्स ऑन दिस वीक विद हुजूर वी हैव आल्सो सीन इट एज एन आर्टिकल इन अल हकम अल फजल इंटरनेशनल बट द वे यू एक्सपीरियंस सर्टेन थिंग्स कैन नॉट बी ट्रांसलेटेड इनटू एन आर्टिकल सो आई एम ग्लैड दैट आई एम गेटिंग दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू टॉक अबाउट दैट स्टफ ऑफ कोर्स द एक्साइटमेंट लेवल वाज ऑफ द रूफ एंड वी वी वर वेरी एक्साइटेड व्हेन वी हियर अबाउट हुजूर कमिंग व्हेन यू रियलाइज दैट इट्स actually going to happen uh, that's when the excitement level uh, shoots up as well but it also uh, that's when you want to gear up for the preparations too uh, so whenever a, a visit of this magnitude happens uh, the first thing uh, we like to focus on is uh, what are the numbers we are dealing with what are what is our expectation from the surrounding jamaats um, not just within usa but also uh, internationally um because whenever it comes to us um of course uh, canada uh, is close by uh, they they of course get excited and they want to come to um so we started the groundwork talking about what the expectation is so uh, we uh, the rough number that we had in our mind was uh, close to 7000 plus on a on a jumma if azur is doing jumma here and about noor e furqa hai jo sab नुसरत के लिए एक आसमां पर शोर है दी की नुसरत के लिए एक आसमां पर शोर है अब गया वक्त In this school such a reformation should take place that scholars and missionaries should graduate from it and take the place of those who have passed on you should consider that this school should produce such persons who have deep and comprehensive understanding of the holy quran exceptional missionaries and scholars who should become a source of guidance for the world उस मेरे महबूब के 
chehre kya dikhlane kya din over 100 young Ahmadis from across the USA, along with some parents and organizers, are making their way to Toronto, Canada, where they will be introduced to a seminary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Jamia Ahmadiyya Canada. They will get the unique opportunity to explore what life could be like if they choose to attend the seven-year program at Jamia. As we prepare to embark on this journey, we can't help but feel the excitement in the air. The energy among the participants of the trip is palpable. For many of them, this will be their first time outside the USA. They're not sure what to expect, but the prospect of exploring new avenues and possible life of service is too enticing to pass up. Let's also take a look at what's happening up north in Canada right now. The anticipation is building here as well. North of the border, preparations are underway to welcome and accommodate the American guests for the next three days. We spoke with some of the organizers here to get an inside look behind the scenes. This is actually one of the most important events for the Vaccino Department in Canada throughout the year when we, for a total of three days, host our vaccine. As we arrive at the Canadian border, everyone is trying their best to recall their briefs from the various preparatory meetings held throughout the previous few months. The planning started almost six months ago. Uh, we uh, had our kick-off meeting where we discussed various uh, logistics of the tour. And as we get closer, then, I mean, if we used to have a meeting once a, a week, and then sometime twice a week. The guests arrive in Peace Village late at night and get ready for bed, so they're fully rested for the following day's activities. I'm excited beyond belief. I'm not even sure how to explain it. It's very... Delightful to be here. The pillar activity, obviously the objective and the pillar activity is a visit to Jamia. Show them what Jamia is, how the Jamia students uh, live, what they do, their activities, their classes. So that is the main purpose. But to create an interest, we then combine other things along with this. One of the main activities that we had planned was a visit to the recently and newly acquired Jamia Ahmadiyya Canada property in Innisfil. It's about 40 minutes north of where the current location is. They're not just a bunch of balloon structures. They have a higher meaning. They're meant for something better. You're going to miss out on a lot if you don't pay attention. Sometimes it's, it's not worth going off a group that that's, that's not bringing you no benefit, right? And that's just a future reference. Even outside of just events at the so July, but also in life. Alhamdulillah. How wonderful is that? The participants' motivations vary. Some grapple with their faith, while others seek a sense of community. However, they all share a common aspiration to find something more a profound sense of belonging and direction. So we wanted to come up with programs where we can introduce Jamia Ahmadiyya to our youth at an earlier age, like age 11, 12, when they're really making their mind in terms of which career they wanted to go. The students had the wonderful opportunity to attend a full day at Jamia, absorbing what it is truly like to walk and sit in these halls and classrooms. Roll call. And let there be a body of men among you who calls towards good. Further states that remember that you are now included in that special army, that special spiritual army of the promised Messiah, alayhi salam. Once the students of Jamia returned to their classes, the American guests were divided into groups and they received a guided tour of the facilities and classrooms.
before Jamia, you know, I was just like you guys, you know, uh, coming to Jamia, coming to these tours, you know, meeting other senior Jamia students just like me. And now I'm in that position now. So, Alhamdulillah, it's been a long journey. It can be a challenge. Um, you know, I remember for me, first coming, it was a challenge, like just living with different people. You're going to have differences, you're going to have similarities. It's just finding a way to, like, um, you know, live in the same place together and in harmony. To make the experience even more immersive, the American Waqifin were able to sit in mock Jamia classes and receive instruction from various professors alongside Jamia students. Wait, if you stop me, the letter with sukun. So how will you pronounce it? Al-Qari'ah. al This uh, grammar. So uh, this, this one, Baiti, my home. Yes. Most of uh, these boys, uh, they are uh, in the blessed scheme of uh, Waqf now. Therefore, they want to come and join Jamia Ahmadiyya. And before coming to the Jamia Ahmadiyya, they want to have, uh, want to get more introduction of Jamia Ahmadiyya. So this is uh, one way they get the experience and they get more uh, information about Jamia Ahmadiyya and uh, this helps them to come and join Jamia Ahmadiyya and become missionaries. I felt this was extremely engaging from the time that all the Jamia students get up for assembly and say Labak from that moment until the final bell rings. I think the entire process was really refreshing for our youth. The event's jam-packed program also allowed the participants to interact with other Jamia students during lunch and dinner, leisure activities, and formal sit-downs. I realized that the best way I could help someone is get them closer to Allah and get them closer to faith. Over time, I realized that astronomy may not help Jamaat as much. It could help, but um, I realized that Becoming a Madabiyan or becoming a Madabi itself would probably better benefit the Jamaat. I tell you, it becomes easy. It needs only a complete devotion and uh, determination for it. The atmosphere is pretty amazing. Uh, it makes me remind me of um, Rabwa. It's really, really nice. I, I'm very fascinated by them and uh, the way they're trained. I really want to become a movie myself. I already started thinking about it a little while back, but now I've been here. And now I'm saying to myself, yeah, Qasim, man, you got to do this. you got to do this. You can't miss out on this opportunity to serve the Jamaat this way. You can't miss out on this. It's definitely pushed me forward in that aspect. Jamia Ahmadiyya Canada provides a nurturing and inclusive environment that allows these young minds to explore their faith, strengthen their relationship with God, and cultivate a deeper understanding of Islam and Ahmadiyya. Together, they engage in religious studies, communal prayers, sports, and acts of service. Through this process, they find themselves. Although the program presents its fair share of challenges, like requiring students to temporarily leave home and loved ones, as well as make personal sacrifices, those who decide to embrace this opportunity often find it to be truly transformative. The decision to join Jamia Ahmadiyya Canada marks a pivotal moment in the students' lives. A chance to uncover their purpose and make a meaningful impact on the world around them. For many of the participants, it marks the initial step towards a lifetime of selfless service. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Abdul Hanan. Um, I just had my interview for Jamia Ahmadiyya Canada and um, it was a very nerve-wracking experience because I've been preparing for this uh, for a long time. 
I decided that I was I wanted to go to Jamia when Huzur came last year. I saw the Jamia students over there and I saw the the way they were. It truly inspired me and I was just thinking what could be what's the best way that I can please Allah. Having completed the first phase of inception and resolve, the students see being accepted into this prestigious institution as a grand honor and responsibility. And as a child I never knew what a marabi was. So and when I was in high school, in ninth grade, initially I wanted to make my own business. I wanted to become a CEO. But then after I took a business class, I realized, you know, all these finances, all of these things, all, everything you got to pay, you know, you either become a slave to the dollar or you become a slave to Allah. I was raised in Las Vegas, and a lot of people refer to it as Sin City. And my parents, before they moved to Las Vegas, they were speaking with Khalifa Rabir. And Khalifa Rabir said, it doesn't matter where you raise your children. The only thing that matters is how you raise your children. Earlier, I was talking to the uh, young gentleman, inshallah, who may or may not come to Jamia. I asked them, I said, if any of you would fight alongside the Holy Prophet in war, raise your hand. Everybody rose their hand. Now I said, there's no difference today. And those of you who have your hand raised ought to pick up the pen in the time of the Promised Messiah as that should be easier for you than picking up a sword during the time of the Holy Prophet there are many students from different backgrounds who are attending Jamia in their Canada. And the amount of sacrifices they are making at this time and their parents or their families are making, they're actually preparing them for the actual vaqf, the sacrifice that they need to make. As an Ahmadi Muslim youngster, you need to be able to personalize and internalize that feeling. Don't let that just become something of history for you. Promise Messiah says, right, that our faith should not just be based on bygone stories of the past. That's not what our faith should be based on. It should be based on real life examples and stories that are unfolding today. This is where we do the initial work to prepare and guide them to say that you are, you are uh, getting ready to serve Jamaat. It's a process until our last breath. I think the process of where Jamia teaches them is the value of hard work. The soul of being a Waqfino is that you derive your happiness and satisfaction out of service, out of the very idea that the work you are doing has itself a higher purpose. <laughs> Dozens of American students have graduated from Jamia Ahmadiyya Canada and now serve in accordance with the guidance of Hazrat Khalifatul Masih in various offices and field. I think one of the, the biggest challenges we face is trying to see how relevant our faith is in the society. I absolutely agree that uh, you know for someone to hold Ahmadi beliefs or you know beliefs of the Muslim and then grow up in a society that goes against everything that we stand for. Uh, that is a huge contradiction. So that was one of my motivation is that of course the victory of Allah Almighty is going to happen. Eventually our message will spread. So dedicating my life is essentially that you want to be that person, you want to be that individual that is in that position to guide those people. There are two aspects of Jamia or my time in Jamia that I enjoyed very much. And that was the time and opportunity that I was given to spend with my classmates, with whom I developed a great and strong bond of friendship and brotherhood. Another aspect which I enjoyed and hold very dearly to me is the opportunities and time that I was able to develop a relationship with Hazrat Khalif Tumasi. So while we were in Jamia, we would have visits by various missionaries who were serving in the field. And um, they would come back and tell us how blessed, um, you know, the experiences were that they were having out in the field. But since graduating um, in Jamia and since having been assigned to, uh, you know, to Jamaat for, for service, 
these experiences have now, you know, become my own. In one of his speeches or one of his addresses to the graduates of Jamia Amdiya, Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asil Aziz stated that when, as murabiyan or as missionaries, when we are serving the Jamaat, we are serving in line with what Khalifa Tumusi wants or desires. And our heartbeat should be as one. A uh, life of service to me is living your life with this mindset that what does Allah want from me? And to me, a life of service is actually a life of freedom. You live your life for the sake of Allah Almighty. And when you do anything, just trying to gain His happiness and trying to gain His pleasure, then that is something that brings you more joy and more peace than chasing after uh, any other form of worldly success that you thought might have been better for you. As the journey comes to a close, we reflect on what we've experienced and learned in the last three days. The American Waqifin have gained new perspectives, made new friends, and been inspired by what they've seen. The idea of dedicating their lives to serve the faith is now a real possibility. The students at Jamia eagerly await their opportunity to serve. It's, a, it's not a seven-year course, but rather, as Hazur al Aziz also says, it's, it's a course of your lifetime. You're, you're going on a lifetime journey and not a journey of seven years. So you always start that journey with prayers. And armed with knowledge, prayers, and the guidance of Khilafat, the missionaries in the field continue to be a source of guidance for the world. Alhamdulillah, I think any moment where I have a chance to interact with anybody younger and be a source of, of, of guidance for them, then it's something that, that I'm personally thankful for. <laughs> By Allah's grace, in the heart of the materialistic world, the Jamaat of the Promised Messiah salam emphatically stands as proof of the visionary words written by its holy founder himself. Do not think that God will waste you, for you are the seed planted in this earth by God's hand. God tells me that this seed will grow and prosper and its branches will sprout in all directions and it will grow into a magnificent tree. The Promised Messiah once stated, Whenever Islam has been confronted with any other religion in consequence of some new condition of the age, the sharp and effective instrument that has immediately come to hand is the Holy Qur'an. In the same way, whenever philosophic thought has been given publicity in opposition to it, the Holy Qur'an has destroyed that poisonous plant and has so humiliated it as to provide a mirror to its students which shows up the true philosophy which is contained in the Holy Qur'an alone and nowhere else. In the modern age, when Christian missionaries started their propaganda and made an attempt to draw away unintelligent and ignorant people from the unity of God and to make them worship a humble creature and employ every kind of sophistry for dressing up their doubtful ideas and thus created a storm in India, it was the Holy Qur'an which repelled them so that they are not now able to face a well-informed person and their extensive apologetics have been folded up like a piece of paper. Izala al-Ham, Rohani Khazain, Volume 3, pages 381 to 382. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Which is now establish yourself as a very beautiful, beautiful and, important and important part, part of Jalsa Salana USA. It started uh, with Khudam al Hamidiyah and is still owned and run by Khudam al Hamidiyah. I have the two big brains behind the MK Hub. 
um, on my far left is Ibrahim Chaudhry Saab, who's serving as uh, Muhtamim of Khudam al Hamadiyah. That's the National Secretary for Tarbiyah, the spiritual training of, of our youth between the ages of 15 to 40. Um, and then right next to me is uh, Rahil Tayyip Saab. He's also serving in the National Amla of Khudam al Hamadiyah. But today, you're here every year, you work at the hub. So, Ibrahim Saab, I'll start with you. What's the idea behind the hub and, and what is it about? So last year was the first year at Jalsa Salana USA that we introduced this idea of MK Hub. And essentially what MK Hub was that Sadr Saab Khudam al had uh, brought up to me that, you know, we should have a space for Khudam to connect in, especially during the off Jalsa sessions. So this, this way they can connect more and they see Khudam and they can build that camaraderie more. So last year we start, started this idea and it was really something that we felt um, you know, just took off. And we thought that it was a really good idea for to have this space. So this year, inshallah, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, uh, we were able to improve on what we started last year. Um, you know, of course, we had some activities and some of the other items, but we wanted to make sure that the focus was that we continue to focus on increasing our spiritual spirituality by uh, some in faith inspiring discussions, some the environment that we can create at the hub is really the overall atmosphere of the Jalsa. We don't want to take that away. So even though we will have activities and other items, the purpose is that Khudam can come while they're enjoying, they can also do that. And this year the few other items that we had started is we started the theme the theme that was given to us and the Jalsa theme, which is the Holy Quran, an exhibition dedicated for uh, Khudam to go through. And in addition we had two, three talks, and even we just got done with one talk, uh, a meet and greet session with respect to Amir Sa, which we truly enjoyed for the last one hour. It is very attract attractive um, uh, thing to have, MK Hub. The Khudam know that this is their space. But you mentioned something important. It's to connect them to the entire Jalsa experience. And I think having that balance is what MK Hub has been doing. So, Rahil Tayyip Saab, uh, you can tell us about what actually happens here. Yeah, so we have a lot going on today. We had a full session and we're going to continue throughout the rest of the day. So from last year, we had a start where we had a few activities and we'll take a look a little a little later on. But um, we can see here, we have some activities going on, some kids enjoying foosball, some arm wrestling competition, which were... Did you, did you take part in arm wrestling? I, I didn't, but I know you're an avid arm wrestler, <laughs> so we'll definitely have you on. Uh, and we got some kids in the back enjoying the arm or the hang challenge. And we got to see and uh, whoever the strongest Qadam are and see how they can show off their skills. Behind us, we have this exhibition, which is a beautiful showcase of the Holy Quran. So Alhamdulillah, this year we took on that theme that Motam Saab was explaining. And we really, really said that we need to show Qadam uh, that um, this theme that was given by beloved Hazur, what the importance of it is. And we, we put together this exhibition, which is the first year we've been doing that from the Qadam side. Additionally, we talked about the programs a little bit. We had Amir Saab join us, and it was an amazing session where Khadam had the opportunity to see what and meet Amir Saab and really have a uh, conversation face to face, which is really rare, but it's a really, really good opportunity. And Alhamdulillah, we've already received really good feedback, and, and we're really happy for that. Alhamdulillah. And you know, despite the business schedule of Amir Saab, you're able to pull this off all the time and getting a visa in your events. It, it's amazing. Uh, how do you how do you do that? And how important is it for the Khudam table to connect with the Amir, the national president? We know he's very busy, but but you're able to pull it. What do you think makes that very important? Well, you know, this shows the importance where we go back to the saying of Hazrat Muslim Abdul who was the founder of Masjid Khudam al Amdiya, that the nations cannot be reformed without the reformation of the youth. And when we look at Amir Saab, he shows us by example how to truly follow the words of Hazrat Muslim Islam Khulafa in its true sense and to truly take us back to the roots of what Majlis Qudam al is about. So he's just Amir Saab's graciousness and his, his attention to the youth and their reformation. So we this can truly become the future of the Ahmadiyyad. And that's why Amir Saab is so kind and gracious to just come spend time with us, talk to Khudam. Also, you know, just help them understand the issues and how to talk when they go outside this environment and really interact with the, the you know, the world outside. How do we handle? You know, in this environment, we're all protected. But Amir Saab gives us a perspective that how can you go out? And he's done this time and again, and even in today's talk, it was very nice to see how Amir Saab answered some of these questions uh, to, uh, to our Qadam. We can hear the we can hear the cheers, uh, Rahil Tayyip Saab. I think that's from the arm wrestling. Uh, but you also yesterday there was a session about acceptance of prayers 
and Khudam share their experiences. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that. As there's play time going on, there's pull-ups and, and, and all these other activities, you're also talking about uh, importance of um, prayers being accepted. And that's, again, at the end of the day, it's about that spirituality that you talked about, that experience by Khudam. What inspired that? And what are some of the things that you heard? Yeah, no, as Multiman Saab mentioned, the, the first and foremost is connecting our Qadam to our faith and really digging deep into that. So the session we had yesterday was part of that where we said that we wanted to really hear from the Qadam themselves. What were their experiences? How did they feel? And what were the real life experiences of the acceptance of prayers? And Alhamdulillah, Qadam opened up and it was an amazing session. Really, it was emotional as well. Some Qadam sharing how they, you know, the sacrifices they made and how really prayer was the answer to a lot of their problems. And you know, that really brings it back home. That's, that's what we're trying to connect this to. It's always the connection to Allah Ta'ala. And this is, all of this, it, it was really experience, that experience of yesterday was a showcase of that and it was beautiful. So coordination, I'm sure, is a big part here uh, with, all the, with all the Jalsa program that's being made. So you say you look for those gaps when there's free time. How do you get the Khudam to come in and enjoy this and then go back? And it's all coordinated well. No, it's trial and error. Um, we learned that, you know, how the, what schedule will fit best. Obviously, there's time, that downtime that Khudam have between sessions. We want to use it in an effective way. So we find ways that where they can be fed in the langar of Hazrat Masim al-Islam and they can come here. And I actually will show something that's going on at the cafe, very large, uh, I think, the operation here. And if I just show um, some of the things that our Khudam are doing back here. And uh, you will see that um, and I will, you know, some of the things that making coffee, some mango lassi, some of the bakery items that we have here. So we can see that it's a wider range of uh, uh, assortments that are available for Khudam to choose from. And mashallah, Khudam are very talented trying out some new I drinks. Can, I, can, I can see that. As well. Tell us about these beautiful things you have here. So right now we got some chocolate chip cookies, some muffins, we got cupcakes, pastries. Um, basically anything that you want at a regular coffee shop or a cafe, it's all right here. Where, where are the, which one is the healthy choice here? So the healthy choice, uh, uh, the apple pastry because it has apple in it, it's probably the healthiest thing you can get. Uh, maybe the, the almond pastry as well, but yeah, nothing too healthy right now. We've got the mango lassi though, filled with Greek yogurt, so lo low fat options. Um, and then our barista right here, Shamir Khan. Shamir, if you want to come up, he's a master barista right now, he's learning the game. Mashallah. Come on, come on, give us your uh, your final thoughts before we end this. Segment. Yeah, um, just doing what we can the best way we can. For what's your, what's your expertise? Is it chai or lassi or pastry? Coffees. I'm experimenting on the side, trying to find the best way, most exciting things I can create on the menu. Just researched it today. So now we're about to put some new items on the menu, see how they like, how people like it. Keep it going, keep bringing the joy. Rahil Taibsa, what are your final thoughts, final words? As this hub is, is buzzing, you know, it's, it's a lot going on. You're managing all of this. What are your final thoughts and what do you look up to uh, for next year at the hub? No, I think we made a big improvement from last year. And one thing I really want to say is the volunteers are incredibly dedicated. And all these guys, it took a lot of effort to set up. And Alhamdulillah, these guys are amazing. And I think it's a really, really great opportunity for Gadam to connect back and really take full opportunity of every minute of Jalsa. So Alhamdulillah, please keep them all in your prayers. And it, Inshallah, keep this in your prayers as well, that we're able to improve next year and make it even better and a bigger experience for everyone. Inshallah, Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for your time. And now we're going to end our segment from here we have my colleagues who are in the studio uh, that are waiting to tell you more about what's happening up at the, at the end of this Jalsa Salah at the end of this session and what's going on in the next session and other parts of Jalsa Salah as well inshallah stay tuned hashtag is Jalsa USA on Twitter and all the social media handles and keep keep watching what's going on on YouTube and if you've missed anything go back and watch them but I pass it on to Mahmoud Kausal Saab who will tell you more about uh, what's happening in the studio Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah this is our color so much, Dibasab. Amazing. You made us all very hungry. Um, the very interesting interviews, the coffee, the pastries. Um, but obviously, we're back in the studio and we have a whole other discussion lined up. And that's the beauty of this Jalsa Salana. We get to have all these live discussions back to back from pastries. We're going to go to a very important topic, which is basically about the Promised Messiah Islam. He established the Jamaat of Ahmadiyyat. He established, or he made the efforts to share the message of Islam and Ahmadiyyat around the world. And we know that the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam predicted that at the time of the Messiah, his job would be to break the cross. 
And so we see that constantly, whether it was Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Razi Tarhan, the first missionary who came to America, he was stopped at the border. And although he was stopped at the border, what happened? We know that they gave him an ultimatum. They even said, why don't you just go back on the ship? You don't need to come here. And he said, no, my Khalifa has sent me here so that I can establish Islam because there are people who are looking for Islam in this country. And that is exactly what we're about to talk about now. I have three very esteemed guests from different parts of America. We have uh, Niall here from Chicago. We have Alejandro from Puerto Rico. And we have Julio who's also from Puerto Rico but has also lived in the United States for quite some time. They are all three newly members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat here in the United States. And what is beautiful about it is two of them are very young. The third looks young, but Julio is much older now. He is retired. He is over 50 years old now, right? 50 years old. 50 years old now, alhamdulillah. So let's really talk about their stories because when you talk to them, you, will get a, you, you get an experience about hearing about the inspiration that you have, the journeys that you have. Because you are all part of that prayer of the promised Messiah that they should be sincere hearts that will eventually end up here in the Jamaat, who will end up close to Allah Almighty through the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. As the promised Messiah had said, that Allah has revealed to him, I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. In fact, even above that, we know that the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, predicted that the sun will rise from the west. You are those, those gems that are fulfilling that prophecy of the promised Messiah So just to get right into it, Julio is the most recent I believe you and Niall are both very recent who have joined Islam in Ahmadiyyat in the United States. Julio, please tell us a little bit about what stumbled, you know, how did you stumble into the Jamaat, into Islam in Ahmadiyyat? Well, uh, I started as a, as a, how you say, uh, I went to the Muslim for uh, Arab, Arab, uh, Arabic class. Arab class, yeah. yeah and, uh, and I got them with the mission. I started on, um, how you say, uh, I started like uh, lessons and learning. And, yes. and I got like, a, like the intention of going to the Quran and start reading the Quran. Beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. And I got to the, to the point that I accept the Islam. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Bless you. You're welcome. Of course. Now we have over here. Now please tell us a little bit about. How did you get from the streets of Chicago into a mosque in Zion? Well, how did that even happen? Yeah, so um, I grew up in a Christian household. Um, basically, long story short, I felt myself separating from it. Um, I felt like, you know, I wasn't being the person that I really wanted to be. I started doing research on Islam. I saw, um, you know, the different sects, and then I saw Ahmadiyya. Sure. I read their beliefs, you know, the differences with, like, uh, you know, Jesus. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and it all made the most sense to me. Sure. Um, I was on YouTube, and uh, my recommended was an MTA video called This Week with Hazur. No way. And um, you know, it was like two weeks old at that time, though. But I saw that he actually went and inaugurated the mosque in Zion. Wow. Uh, Zion was about an hour away from me. Sure. Uh, that weekend, I went straight to Zion uh, to ask for you know more clarity. Sure, information. And, just, yeah, just yeah, what's get going on, right? What I you know the answer the questions that, that I had it answered sure. um, so I went to Zion right away that weekend and I ended up converting in the Zion mosque Gosh, in March Alhamdulillah what an amazing how it, you know beloved Hazur came and blessed Zion and as a result became a this week with Hazur and then you ended up stumbling on it yeah. and Allah brought you there an amazing story of course we have Alejandro here also he is of course from Puerto Rico and initially you had joined Islam through the Sunni mosque there yeah, correct that's right you also learned from them yeah, I did. Tell us a little bit about that experience initially and what made you again redirect towards an Ahmadi mosque. So in the beginning I would go to the masjid over there in the Arab community and uh, I would just look at them, listen to the recitation of the Holy Quran or the Azan and I would just try to imitate what, what I was hearing. Uh, the main issue I had is that uh, compared to the Ahmadiyya Jamaat, uh, they don't have translators. So whether they give the khutbah in Arabic or in English, if <laughs> you understood, it, it's, it's a mess. It's sure, chaos. Sure. <laughs> so that was one thing. The second thing is that they don't go, uh, they don't usually go out in the streets and, and, and do tablik like we do in the Jamaat. 
So those things kind of got me uh, a little bit bored of the community because in, on YouTube I would see different communities and different Muslims groups uh, go out, preach to people, and I wanted to do that as well. You know, I wanted to bring this message, message to people as well. So that's what... Uh, that's how you stumbled slowly. Yeah, that's how I uh, slowly stumbled. And uh, actually I met one uh, local brother over there who used to go to the masjid. I didn't know he was Ahmadi. So I remember he was being sneaky on the community and <laughs> one day he told me, uh, look, I, I have confidence in you. You seem to be very neutral about stuff. So I'm an Ahmadi. We believe in this and that, you know. So we believe the Mirza Ghulam Ahmad is the promised Messiah. And you know, the whole story. So from there he convinced me and then he gave me some uh, material books and he introduced me to who was a missionary in, per in charge of Puerto Rico, who was uh, Salman Sheikh Sab. So fast forward though, because I know and many you know the viewers may remember, yeah. 2018 you had yeah. a very interesting experience. That was what was that experience? Oh, that was uh, when I called the Azan uh, for Juma. It was on November 2, 2018. Uh, I was in front of Huzur and uh, Maybe people think it's an easy thing to do, but when you're standing in front of Husur and Husur is looking straight <laughs> to you in the eye, I'm like, what am I doing here? You know, I wouldn't expect that. Sure. So Husur just kept looking at me uh, while doing the asan, and it was it was an amazing experience. Up till this day, I just cannot forget about it. Absolutely, it was amazing. <laughs> no, just like for that. Just and like Niall, what is your most recent experience? I believe you've been reading books as well. So what yeah. has really piqued your interest in terms of the, the so, books? And you know, when I like reading, I like studying about things. I like when it really relates to me. So I started reading the book, and I'm not finished. I'm just at the start um, of the philosophies of the teachings, the teachings of, of Islam right. by the Promised Messiah. Yes. Um, literally, the first chapter is about the three stages of humans. Okay. The first stage is the human that incites the evil, yep. which I feel like that's what I was doing. You know, unfortunately, before, I felt like I just wasn't who I should be, who I should model, um, and I was doing not the best things. Um, the second stage is the reproving self stage, and that's the stage where you're kind of remembering what you did, right. and not only that, and you're like, on yeah, it, you're reflecting, and then you're disgusted with what you've done. I feel like that's exactly where I am at in my life, and you know that's why, like when I read that, I was like, yeah, I know I'm at the right place. I'm learning the right stuff because he. The, the, the promised Messiah. He's literally writing about how he, how I exactly feel. And then the third stage, which is you know something that I do want to accomplish, is achieving you know the the beginning of your spiritual life. And it's amazing. It's amazing. No, absolutely amazing. Jazakallah again to all of you. As we know that you know you're 20 years old, even though you're 50, you look like you're 20. But a lot of our history in the USA Jamaat was exactly this. You know, Abed Hanif Saab, Yusuf Latif Saab, Rakib Ali Saab, so many of our pioneers, they were 20, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, yeah. and they left this legacy for us to continue. And so it's very beautiful to see that that has continued, even with you and, you know, with many others who are joining Islam and Ahmadiyyat every year. And again, we thank you and we hope that you continue to share that message with more people. And again, this will bring us to the next element of how the promised Messiah alayhi salam um, explained religion. He said to love God and to love humanity. So let's go ahead and talk about humanity first and what is happening there as well. But we're going to have some fillers first. Go ahead. Basically what we do with exterior security is just to make sure that everyone inside of the Jalsa is safe. Right, so we have strategic positions throughout the site that we try to man. We make sure that we have personnel at each and every entrance to the facility. So we have a lot of people from different parts of the country who are coming to serve on the, our department. Some of them are flying in, some of them are driving for over 10 to 15 hours coming in. <laughs> There's nothing better, bro. There's nothing better to do at this time than serving the Jamaat of the Promised Messiah of Islam. One thing that we're constantly reminded is that the people you serve at Jalsa are the guests of the Promised Messiah. And there's no greater honor 
that is serving the guests on the Prophet's Messiah. The Promised Messiah once stated, The clear miracle of the Holy Qur'an which can manifest itself to every people and by presenting which we can silence everyone, whether an Indian, Persian, European or American, is the unlimited treasury of insights, verities and wisdoms which are expounded in every age according to its need and stand as armed soldiers to refute the thinking of every age. If the Holy Qur'an had been limited in its verities and insights, it would not have amounted to a perfect miracle. Beauty of composition is not a matter the miraculous nature of which can be appreciated by every literate and illiterate person. The clear miracle of the Holy Qur'an is the unlimited insights and fine points which it comprises. A person who does not admit this miracle of the Holy Qur'an is altogether deprived of the knowledge of the Qur'an. He who does not believe in this miracle does not estimate the Qur'an as highly as it should be estimated, and does not recognize God as he should be recognized, and does not honor the Holy Prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him as he should be honored. Bear it in mind that the miracle of unlimited insights and verities which are contained in the Holy Qur'an has accomplished more in every age than has the sword. All the doubts that every age raises according to its circumstances and all the claims of superior insights that are put forward are completely refuted by the Holy Qur'an. Welcome to another segment in the studio still, the proceedings of Jalsa Salana. And the topic we have for you, this is now a household name. This is something that's been, Ahmadis talk about this all around the world for years. Non-Ahmadis benefit from this. I'm sure you began to guess it. It's about serving humanity. And when we say serving humanity within the Jamaat and now on a global level, the name pops up, Humanity First. A vision of the Khalifa al Masih, and it's been going on for many years. Many people have benefited from it. But I want us to focus on the two main aspects of it for which we have guests. And on my immediate left, we have uh, Dr. Mahmoud Qureshi Sahib, who uh, lives in Connecticut. He's Global Director of Disaster Relief for Humanity First. And right next to him, on my far left, is um, also a common face that a lot of people know, Majid Khan Sahib. Um, he's serving as on the Humanity First Healthcare. And I think a highlight on my personal level was the great hospital that's been inaugurated in Guatemala. But I'm sure there's many other things. So why don't you start with telling the audience, those who may not know, what does Humanity HF Healthcare, what is it and what do you cover? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, HF Healthcare, uh, Many people ask this question that Humanity First, is, everybody has heard about Humanity First, but what is HF Healthcare? HF Healthcare is actually a subsidiary of Humanity First, which was incorporated in 2017 to build and manage hospitals for them globally in the underserved community. So that is the single mission we have to build and manage hospitals for them. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for making it clear. Uh, Dr. Saab, Humanity First is closely tied with the disaster relief. I think it's, if one description can be given by the layman of Humanity First, we all know that disaster relief. But what does it contain? How, how broad is this? So, uh, restoring communities, that's the key, that's the, that's the bottom line. When disaster hits, communities are impacted in many different ways. And the main, main one word would be restoring those communities back to as uh, close to normal as possible. You know, I've seen that when disasters happen, people think about escaping. People think about finding refuge, food, water for themselves, even those who are directly affected. But your team focuses on getting people there, on the ground. And Humanity First is one of those organizations that gets on ground first, in many cases. Yeah. How do you inspire people to do that kind of cycle? I think it's uh, all volunteer driven. And uh, the service to humanity, many of our volunteers come from the Andhya Muslim community. And the ninth condition of BAP uh, for becoming an MD is the one where you want to serve humanity unconditionally without any distinction of race, religion, ethnicity, or anything. And you want to be there first, you want to be, and your reward is going to come from Allah Ta'ala. And that's the main you know, motivation for many of our volunteers that serve humanity. Alhamdulillah, Maji Khan Sahib, uh, when it comes to the health sector, 
I mean, I know that Guatemala is probably the most recent, as far as some of us know, to those visit. But tell us some of the projects that your department has been taking care of, as far as um, age of healthcare is concerned. You see, five years ago, uh, when Hazur came to Guatemala, it was a historical moment for Central America and, of course, for humanity first as well. That was the first project Hazur has ever inaugurated of humanity first anywhere in the world. Oh, wow. And it was also the first uh, occasion when Hazur hosted humanity first flag anywhere in the world. So that is, you know, that was very emotional. Uh, uh, a thing for us and uh, obviously very motivating uh, uh, also and there's one uh, before I take your question there's something which uh, Azur had mentioned in the in his speech mm -hmm. he said that this hospital is for everyone this hospital if ever we make any money out of it will be spent on Guatemalans wow. so that was that has been our focus Guatemala has a national health care system and uh, of course with most of the national health systems there are some issues. So to, to cover that and to fill in the gap, the private hospitals come in. Mm -hmm. Humanity First through HF Healthcare decided that now it is time for them to invest in the infrastructure. So that is how it makes the difference between uh, medical missions being sent or investing in the infrastructure which gives jobs to locals which helps the skill set and also help the locals through the local doctors mm. so that is what uh, we are doing in Guatemala and also elsewhere now uh, obviously basing on this right. uh, the template was so successful mm -hmm. that another edge of healthcare was established in UK Okay, that's uh, through Humanity First International. That's right. And that organization is now uh, building another hospital in, uh, in Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm. So that the, the same successful template is now being put oh, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. So, so um, uh, Dr. Saab, as far as your most recent activities are concerned in the disaster relief, highlight some of the uh, sacrifices that were made and volunteer activities. So last year has been very busy with disaster relief. Uh, you know, the main highlight was uh, relief efforts in uh, Turkey uh, and Humanity First globally was involved where USA, Canada, UK and Germany put their efforts together uh, to help the people who were uh, affected by the disaster uh, and earthquake. As a result, we did a medical camp, we had physicians uh, go over there from all over the globe. Um, we had, uh, we provided food. Uh, warm meals, about 1.25 million meals to 50,000 people over a period of eight weeks. And this was done in a very efficient way, where if you uh, relate that to monetary uh, equivalence, it was equal to $5.5 million being spent. We did it in $550,000, providing the medical care as well as the, the food uh, to that disaster. And uh, the local governors uh, in Turkey have been so appreciative and have been uh, thankful to the work that we've done there. Alhamdulillah. In, in the last few words, um, Raji Sahib, uh, the vision of Hazrat Khalifa al Masih in, in serving humanity and driving all of us to focus on that, how has your interaction with Khalifa al Masih been in terms of the drive that he has, the spirit that he instills in you leading these kind of projects? So, all our vision comes from Hazrat Khalifa al Masih. Everything what we try to do is what he wants us to do. Mm. We try to do whatever he wants us to do, but I mean, many times his vision and his expectations, you know, would be much more. We humbly try to do whatever we can. Uh, so, uh, something I would like to tell uh, of what we have been able to do in the last five years, given his vision, uh, we have seen more than 50,000 patients in Guatemala. We have done more than 1,000 surgeries, including uh, surgeries like kidney transplant. Mm. Now, there is no other place of owned by Humanity First, even by MDM Muslim Jamaat, anywhere in the world, which has done a transplant surgery. So we were the we are the pioneers in that way. More importantly, 
out of these 50,000, mm -hmm. we have been able to give financial help to more than 10,000 patients. Alhamdulillah. That is what that's, uh, Hazur's vision is. That's, that's beautiful. Yes. Thank you yes. so much for shedding light on this. But we're not even just going to keep it in the studio. We have uh, Muhammad Ahmad Choudhury Sahib who will show us some of your work that you've been doing around the whole world in the Humanity First booth where there's action going on and people are being inspired by the volunteer services of Humanity First. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, uh, uh, Muhammad Sahib. Mohamed Saab will be joining welcome, us shortly. Welcome back. Uh, and and now you just heard about on, disaster please. relief and healthcare. Now we are at the HF booth and I'm with the chairman of Humanity First, Munam Naim Saib. Munam Saib has been the chairman of Humanity First for over 19 okay, years okay, and has good. garnered Zabunullah. over a thousand volunteers yes. that work with Humanity First USA. And Humanity First, as a reminder, is a global organization. Absolutely. It's a global organization. First of all, Asalaamu Alaikum to the viewers. You know, thank you for coming. Yes, now 62 countries, you know, our inspiration is coming from Hazrat Kifat al -Masih. and by the grace of Allah, you know, with motivation to the Jamaat members, and he praised the Humanity First that we are doing a great job, but that is the inspiration now in 62 countries serving. Uh, so what's, what's going on in the booth? We're showing a lot of the various programs that Humanity First has, right. uh, and then how is how's that going? It's going wonderful. By the grace of Allah, six, we'll, we'll six programs, we will start with the program, but our global impact is significant collectively. So I think whether it's Water for Life, whether that is our Feed the Hungry program, whether it's our education program, or, you know, medical, global health, or, you know, all of these gift of sight programs, are, by the grace of Allah, is going very well. So what is in the Water for Life uh, program, and what, what are the key components of the Water for Life program? Water for Life program basically is, um, you know, providing safe, clean, drinkable water. We do all kind of hand pumps to draw large water wells, and we have done so far globally about 5,000 water wells. But from America's perspective, we are almost 15, 1,600 hand pumps that we have done in East Africa, West Africa, part of an Asia that, you know, people can give donation, people can put their family, elders' names and their, on, their, on their behalf. Asad ka jariya goes on. That's so amazing. That, and water, water is an incredible uh, resource that m not enough people have in the world. And then there's health, uh, HF uh, Global Health. HF Global Health is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, is basically building hospitals to, uh, from healthcare services to running clinics, taking out the medical missions. Those are the most important things, the capacity building mission. We have a visit going on to Ghana just tomorrow. So that is the capacity building of the hospitals, taking the youth of America, the students, medical students to go out, carry out the camps. And we are doing it in uh, Central America, South America, Guatemala, and these countries we're taking out the medical missions. That's, right. that's incredible. What about in the area of education? What What do you have going on in the area of education as, as health care is an incredible component of this? Right. So in education, first I will start out with um, within America. Right. We, we have started out with the education project. We are giving uh, tuition to the poor students who cannot afford paid tuition. Uh, so that is education project. Youth have started that. We have 400 tutors right now that are on in the United States, in United States, teaching, uh, helping the students in United States. Then we have the our uh, knowledge for life program. Uh, total 87, uh, 82 schools that Humanity First is running. From USA uh, alone, we have built 23 schools, and we have been given a target of 25 more schools. 25 more schools around the world. 25 by 2025. 25 by 25. Right. And now, what is this digital 3D booth? Okay, before you do that, it's our 20 for 20 drive. Next year is our 20th anniversary. Yeah. We are looking for 20,000 supporters of Humanity for us. We are right now about close to 9,000. Our goal is by our anniversary next year in April, we'll have 20,000 supporters from outside the Jamaat, all as, as uh, you know, Azur guides us that everybody needs to come and help us. So from that perspective, you know, it, we are signing up all of the volunteers. What is this? This is a, a beautiful thing that we have tried this year. This is a hologram. This is a hologram. hologram right. So what this is providing. I am re I'm real. <laughs> you are real. I think technology is evolving that you'll be able to show your hospital's school in three dimensional or four or five dimensional, whatever that is. But, you know, this is uh, attracting people to come here and look at all the programs we have, what they can do to donate, how much donation will help how many people. So this is another way to bring people here. When they come in, we bring them into the booth. They get convinced. They give up money for the gift of side surgery or they are ready to sign up for the medical mission or, or some in some cases building a school or water pumps. All of these programs are displayed here as well.
We, so can we transition uh, to how can I or individuals who are learning about Humanity First, the right. thousand that have donated to Humanity First, right. how can they give? How can they give their time, their talent, their treasure? Right. Let's start with treasure. Okay, the treasure is, I think, you know, their, their online donations. We have the QR codes. People come and scan with their phone. They can become a member. They can donate. Or, you know, the online they can go. And we have outside, when we go outside, we'll see there are dip jars. People, what, what, what about people at home who are watching, not, who aren't physically here right now? Let's go to uh, www.usa.humanityfirst.org. www.usa.humanityfirst.org. Right. And that will take you to our website. And uh, I think this is a blessed time of Jalsa. I urge that who, those, of, those of the people who are not, have not been able to come, get the blessing of a Jalsa, do a gift of side surgery for $120 or, or, or you know, uh, donate for a you know, classroom or something. Uh, we, we, were, we stopped by building the schools. Educate, help us educate those students there, you know, just give donations. So it gives beautifully that small donations can help a lot here. So Every dollar matters. Jazakallah for your time. I mean, I think this is an incredible mega booth at U.S. Jolsa that allows us to understand the various ways Humanity First is changing the world and how we can all engage with Humanity First, whether with our time, our talent, or our treasure financially uh, to be able to give give back to not only in our neighborhoods in the USA, but also all around the world. Thank, thank you for joining us, Manam Saab, and we will be now. That has been Humanity First USA. Please give generously, and we'll be going back to the studio now. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah so much, Muhammad Amin Jawi Saab. It's amazing because our beloved Hazrat Khalifa Tul Masih Al-Khamis, Ayat al Aziz, gave us a special message for our USA Jalsa. There he re, you know, repeated what the Promised Messiah has taught us about love for God and love for humanity. And so in a way we're seeing the beauties of the work that we're doing around the world, especially in America as well, under Humanity First USA. But now I want to bring you back to another aspect of the same message, which is the love for God and how it's our love for humanity that brings us brings us outside on the streets so we can bring people towards God Almighty. And so here, Alhamdulillah, I am with uh, three amazing panelists as well from three different places uh, around the world, all working uh, as missionaries, mashallah. We have missionary Mulana Matiullah Joya Sahib from Hawaii. Uh, we have missionary Azhar Guraya Saab, and we have our missionary here also from Dominican Republic. Yeah. And so in this way, all three of them, mashallah, are serving in very different places, all three islands, by the way, and we want to exactly talk about that. We want to talk about the different islands that we're talking, you know, we're, we're, that we're sharing the message of Islam and Ahmadiyyat. What are some of their challenges? What are some of their trials? And especially, what are some of the experiences of those who are joining? So let's start it off. The first part of this conversation is we're seeing in America there's an uptick of people who are joining from the Latin world, from you know, from different uh, Latin countries, and especially in America, they have an interest towards Islam. So to the two countries that are here representing, Rasulullah Sahib is here as well, what is your experience? Are people more inclined and, you know, towards this idea of Islam? Is it you know, foreign to them in these countries? Alhamdulillah, you, you talk about um, the Hispanic population that is now coming towards Islam. And I think uh, we had our, I know in my case, the wake-up call was when Azur came to uh, Los Angeles a few years ago. And he gave a very his very famous sermon. And he said that I see from this part of the world, you know, uh, you know, a wave of Lat uh, Latinos coming into Islam, and that we have to be ready to accept those people. So that's uh, where you know we received that instruction, and after that, the Jamaat has been actively uh, reaching out to the Hispanic population. I know here in the USA, in mainland USA, there's a lot of work being done, and part of that effort has also been to send missionaries out to other countries where there are you know, large numbers of people that are speaking Spanish. Uh, personally, in my case, um, for the last um, seven years almost, I was in Mexico. Right. Okay. So the Jamaat was established there about eight years ago in the city of Merida, Yucatan. And Alhamdulillah, uh, we got there. There was a huge mission. Many people came for Bakhtarazi. We distributed over a million flyers in that city. And now, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, uh, we have two missionaries. We have some Walimin. We have over 200 sure. people in that. And, that and now you're in Puerto Rico. Yes, so recently I was sent to Puerto Rico. Alhamdulillah, the Jamaat in Puerto Rico was established about six years ago, six, seven years ago. And we have an active Jamaat there. Uh, we have people that are very interested in Islam. Unfortunately, 
uh, the only information that they have received about Islam is through the, the media. So many people, even if they're interested in Islam, they find it very difficult to find correct information. Sure. But uh, we're there, we're working with the population through our message of peace, through our message of love, through our, mes through our message of true Islam. Uh, we're drawing the hearts and minds and souls of this population towards Islam. So, well. Sagar Bhai, tell us a little bit about Dominican Republic. You've been there only about a year now, right? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Khaasad ki jo hai takarri June 2022 mein saab ki manzuri se Dominican Republic mein hui thi. To Allah Taala ke fazal se Dominican Republic mein jo Latin Latinos log hain, unka mazhab ki taraf rujan bol jada hai. Like, aur ab wo jaise Christianity se na. and just for the viewers to understand, you know, this is a missionary who is going to a new country. They don't have Jalsa Salana, they don't no. have Tahir Academy, nothing. and they don't have nothing. So no. you have to not only do Tabligh, but you also have to do all the Tarbiyat aspects Allah of tarbiyat. trying to establish a Jamaat. Yeah. So when somebody joins, you can't just leave them alone. No, no, no. And say, that's why I want to ask actually Joya Sahib, same thing. Mm -hmm. Joya Sahib has had experience, mashallah, in the Pacific Islands for many years, and now he's serving in Hawaii. And you've also experienced this, many people will join. But then the real work starts then, right? Please tell us a little bit about that, even in Hawaii, some of the work that's going on. So, Jazakallah Khalsa, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Um, you're no stranger to the field, sure. mashallah. You yourself <laughs> have served in the martial islands for a long time. Um, so, once the so we have two groups of people. There's a group of people who have already signed up bad and they're dedicated and they want to learn. There's another group of people who become Muslim, but they have some hesitation uh, in joining Jamaat. But they would like to learn more about Islam as well. So for both groups, uh, we have uh, different uh, arrangements. For example, for the first group, we Jumai, of course, is the biggest uh, event of the week uh, for Muslims. So they, you know, they hear the khutbah uh, in the, of our Friday sermon. We provide the summary of uh, Uri Anwar's, um, you know, uh, points that he has mentioned. In the, you have classes. Exactly. And then on, su on Sunday, we have Tahir Academy classes. For the other group of people, we have on uh, Tuesday, um, in the afternoon we meet and that's kind of like Islam one-on-one -on -one class where we answer their questions, we go through different topics, trying to help them understand Islam and hopefully down the road um, sure. they're able to join. And that's again for many of our viewers, especially if you're in America, mm -hmm. you think of Hawaii as these beach cities, but when you go to Honolulu or a place like that, you realize they're struggling like any other inner city Deep in America. Yes, they, they have homelessness, they have drugs and alcohol, yeah. and they're on the streets, they need Islam and Madiyat, if not more, than yeah. you know other places. Absolutely. They're ice on an island, they can't go anywhere else. And so it's very important. That's alhamdulillah, we're blessed that Jamaat is established in Hawaii and they're continuously working. You have a number of people who are helping you who are also islanders, I believe. So alhamdulillah, that's very good. And that's why I want to talk a little bit about any other converse that you may have had um, recently that you would like to share a little bit about the story. We actually spoke to two, we spoke to Julio recently, yes. just in the last interview. So, yeah. so I was actually going to mention his, uh, his yeah. story. Please tell us, yes. Um, so actually, uh, there's uh, because we've already talked to Julio, we, we, Alhamdulillah, we have other converts as well. So there's another convert, most recent convert. Um, he was telling me, I reached out to him uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, he was very interested. He came to the masjid, and we started talking, and he said, you know what, someone reached out to me four years ago from this Jamaat. And at that time, I wasn't really interested in the faith, but uh, you know, whatever was said at that time, I had it in my mind. And then he said, four years ago, my, my condition was completely, completely different. These four years, so many things have changed in my life. And now I'm starting to really appreciate Islam. When I reached out to him, he said, it's so interesting that you reached out to me right now. You know, just a couple of months ago, recently, I have just left the Catholic Church because I've just gotten completely fed up with it. Amazing. And he said, you know, I was so involved. I was going to retreats. I was training to be a priest even. But he said, I just kind of wrap my head around how they would operate and their doctrine. But now that you've reached out to me again with the message of Islam that I was already thinking about, he said, I was following people on Instagram. I was following people on Facebook. I was learning about Islam that way. And he said, now you've reached out to me. 
and now I'm really I'm very interested. I would like to learn. So we met with him many times, and Alhamdulillah, recently, like I mentioned, uh, he did that, and uh, he's very. That's he's, a good testament to the fact that you don't just meet somebody they join. Sometimes it no. could be a four-year experience. It could be somebody who's not ready yet. Exactly. So but we know from the life of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, not everybody accepted when no. they first heard. That's right. Some people came you know, over a dozen years later, 20 years later. Yeah. You know, in the last year, many people accepted. Yeah. Not everybody was Abu Bakr. Exactly. <laughs> you know, right. who joined. So we have to keep going out there. We have to keep giving the message. And we don't know when that seed will germinate and when it will flower. So you were mentioning about Christians, for example. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, are there any Christians nearby and, and what is their treatment with you, especially in Dominican Republic? Absolutely. Our mission house, the 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 Dominican Republic, the culture of the church, in every village, there is a small, 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 small church. There are a lot of people who are protesting, but it is that they don't know that we are Catholic or Protestant. They talk about it, then they give the advice, then they give the advice, then they say, तो बंदा कहता है लेकिन तुम तो कैथोलिक है ही नहीं हो तो मुझे कह रहे हो कि मैं कैथोलिक क्रिश्चियन हूँ लेकिन तुम नहीं हो तो फिर उनको वो रिलाइज करते हैं और फिर ऐसे ही हमारा एक वाक्य हुआ था कि हमने मिशन हाउस ओपन किया नया तो उसके सामने बिल्कुल ना चर्च है जब उसने देखा कि उन्होंने उसमे� تقریر شروع کر دیتا ہے کہ جو مسیح کے خون میں نہ آکے نہیں آتا وہ مسیح نہیں ہو سکتا اس طرح کی چیزیں لیکن پھر آمدلہ ہم نے اس کو انوائٹ کیا مسجد میں کھانے پر بلایا اس کو بڑا سمجھایا لیکن الحمدللہ آپ اس کے ساتھ چھتا لوگ اپنے وہ تانگ کرتے ہیں یہ رائے ہے سٹیپ بائی سٹیپ سمٹھائیں مخالفت ہوتی ہے پرسیکیوشن ہے جو بادرنگ یو There are other Muslims also, I believe, in Hawaii, also in Puerto Rico. So share a little bit about that. Is there any interaction or <laughs> so what are they doing? <laughs> right, yeah. I know it's an interesting experience. I guess it varies from place to place. In Hawaii, there is an Arab Muslim community who have been there decades before Jamaat got there. Okay. But um, they have a reputation of being very secluded and closed community. They do not go out with tabligh or, you know, dawah they call or anything like that. And um, part of the reason, I think, is that some of the very important issues currently that uh, are on the surface, they don't have proper answer to. So I think we're lucky, we're blessed to have the teachings of the Prophet Islam, who has uh, discussed all these issues, whether it's jihad, women in Islam, exactly. all these controversial, so-called controversial yeah. issues. Yeah. We have clear-cut answers to it. So we're actually looking forward to going out and trying to get that message. And we can address them head on. Exactly. Just like the Jalsa first session has been exactly that. Every issue, head yes. on. You know, yesterday we talked about domestic violence. Yeah. Today mm. we talked about transgenderism. Just head on. All these yeah. issues, directly discussing. And they don't have that answer. And they don't have so, those answers. So that's exactly. what we're blessed to be uh, MDs. The know? real aspect of our blessing really is Khilafah. Right. It brings Very us together. Absolutely. So I wanted you to just share. Each one of you can share. Jump in as you need to. But really, you know, what is the aspect of either your members or yourself the attachment to Khilafat or their experience with Khilafat, has anybody ever met Levin Hazur or came to USA? Whatever that may be, I want to just open it up if anybody would like to share something. I can't, I, please. I, well, I mean, we all have a story about uh, Khilafat and how Allah heard our prayers through the Khilafat, right? So one of the very interesting and inspiring story that I found was of a member from Pusrai where you also served uh, several years. Um, he was a, a former mayor, um, he moved to Hawaii and he asked for, for prayers because he was worried about his daughter who had married for many years but uh, she did not have any child. And I had shared my personal story with him and because of that he asked if I could write to Azur um, for prayers, which I did. And interestingly she conceived and within a year Allah blessed her and the mother and the father, they both uh, you know, happily named her Fatima. Achha, mashallah. So, so, so it was very uh, inspiring for the whole family, not only for yes. Mr. Maita, yeah, but yeah. you know, the parents and the extended family as well. Amazing. This is one of the way how. You know, Sahar so. please share some story. Yeah, our one member, Omar Antonio Sahib, he was when I saw that you were reading the Imam, he told me that I am also an Imam. I am also an Imam. I am also an Imam. तो वो मेरे से नाराज हो गए कि क्यों नहीं मैं नहीं बन सकता मैंने उनको बताया कि उम्र काफी है उनकी उम्र 72 बहत्तर साल की है तो मैंने उनको बताया कि जामिया में इंट्री के लिए वो कुछ रिक्वायरमेंट्स हैं वो आप उन पे पूरा नहीं उतरते तो वो बड़ा गुस्से हुआ मेरे से वो नाराज हो गए उसने हिसाब को खा� 
تو وہ پھر صاحب کی طرف سے اس کہا کہ ٹھیک ہے آپ اس کو وہ تیاری کروائیں مطلب لوکل ملم کے طور پہ تو الحمد للہ آج کل تیاری کر رہا ہے اور بڑا خوش ہوا صاحب کی طرف کیسے مجھے کہتا ہے کہ تم میرے سے پیار نہیں کرتے لیکن خلیفہ میرے سے پیار کرتے یا الحمد للہ لیکن وہ بڑا انٹرسٹیڈ بندہ اور بہت مطلب بہت فوکس کے ساتھ وہ اس چیز کو سیکھ رہا ہے قرآن جیت پڑھنا سیکھ رہا ہے اور سارا کچھ اس نے دو ہزار سولہ میں یوٹیوب کے تھرو مطلب مسلمان ہوا تھا پھر ٹو تھاؤزینڈ نائنٹین کے بک فیئر پہ نو سوری ٹوینٹی ٹوینٹی ٹو کے بک فیئر پہ جو ہے نا وہ ہم سے ملا اس نے پہلی دفعہ ہم سے جانا اور تب سے پھر ہمارے ساتھ وہ بیت کر کے انٹر ہو گیا بیت ابھی ریسنٹ اس نے کیا ایک سال تک وہ ہمیں دیکھتا رہا ہے کہ کیسے ہیں کیسے اس طرح سارے بکس پڑھتا رہا ہے لیکن پھر الحمد للہ آپ تیاری کر رہا ہے وہ امام بننے کے لیے لوگ But, you know, the attachment to Khilafat. I remember one time we encouraged all the members to write a letter. Right, right. They all wrote it. We put an envelope and sent it to Beloved Hazur. Each one came back signed. It was like 30 letters came back signed from Beloved Hazur for each one of the members. And they were <laughs> surprised, shocked. Because yeah. we were so far away and he remembered us. Like he, he wrote to us. And this is, again, the, you know, the amazing attachment that we have to Khilafat is very unique. Like you said, there are other Muslims. Each, you know, community is very uniquely separate. In Los Angeles, for example, we were there, and each mosque is a local mosque. There's no connection between the mosque in this town or that town. Right, yeah. Whereas in Jamaat, they're all, we're all unified. We're all here at Jalsa mm-hmm. as one body, as one group. And again, that shows us exactly what's going to happen next. We're going to have another session, which is guest speakers, you know, people who come in yeah. and share their, you know, their experiences with Ahmadiyyat from the outside. And we have an entire guest session. We have a number of guests that are also attending. And I know all of you are experiencing that as well, where you share the message of Islam, and people really enjoy that, that feeling mm. of hearing Islam and seeing Islam firsthand. I don't know if you want to share, if somebody wants to briefly, quickly share, just something where you've shared Islam to an outsider, and just their impression of how we are, how we behave uh, in terms of that. I mean, um, I remember I got to Puerto Rico, and a few, I think, uh, two or three months after that, I was invited to a government uh, program. Uh, and it was called like the day of prayer so I went there and there were many evangelical preachers and they were giving their sermons and they had music and everything and I went there and I had a very short discussion just I, I told them that we're Muslims we believe in peace we love Prophet Jesus and uh, we're here to build bridges of understanding with all groups and communities here and um, it was very short and I thought you know Everyone else had music and they had people singing and they were dancing Trying around. Trying to entertain and, as much you know, as they, they were could, right? <laughs> and I just said a few words. But afterwards, at the dinner, the, the personal representative of the governor came up to me. And she said, I really enjoyed the way that you presented your religion and how you're trying to build bonds. And she said, this is something different. And then she showed me pictures. She said, I know people, other Muslims. And I'm so happy that now we have a community here that, that is this open and understanding. So Allah, it's nothing that we did or we can do. This is Allah opening the hearts and the minds of people in ways that would be impossible for us to do. Allah Himself is preparing them. We just have to go out and present the message that we have always been giving. I know that, for example, Joy Sal has met presidents of countries before. And I know it's humbling, right? Because you Absolutely. realize you're representing Ahmadiyya. It's not because who you, who and you and I, you know? Or because we're representing Khalifa al Masih, that's why they're even entertaining us, right? Mm-hmm. And that's it's an amazing experience. Have you had any chance also to do some PR work? I know that, like I said, it's only been a year, and yeah, uh, there's a lot uh, of work like, to do. The Dominican Republic has a Sunni mosque, and it's one of the only mosques in the whole country. کافی انہوں نے بہت پیسہ لگا کے اس کو بہت عالی ملک کتنا بڑا یہ بھی بتا دیں ملک بہت اتنا بڑا نہیں ہے چھوٹا سا ملک ہے لائک ایسٹ ٹو ویسٹ جو آپ فور آور میں کمپلیٹ کر لیتے ہیں تو سڑکیں وغیرہ ہیں نا سب یا یا سڑکیں ہیں الحمد للہ سڑکیں ٹھیک ہیں تو جو ریموٹ ایریاز ہیں وہ تو تھوڑا ہوتا ہے لیکن الحمد للہ جو کیپٹل ہے یا دوسرے شہر ہیں ان میں سڑکیں ہیں ہائی ویز ہیں سب کچھ ٹھیک ہے تو انہوں نے نا وہ ایک مسجد بنائی ہوئی ہے تو کافی لوگ نا مسجد سانتو دومنگو میں کیپٹل میں تو جب سرچ کرتے ہیں نا تو وہ ہمارا نمبر پاپ اپ ہو جاتا ہے تو وہ کال کرتے ہیں تو وہ کہتے ہیں کہ ہم مسجد دیکھنا چاہتے ہیں ہم آنا چاہتے ہیں میں کہتا ہوں ٹھیک ہے آ جائیں اور جب وہ آتے ہیں وہ دیکھنے کہتے ہیں یہ تو وہ مسجد ہی نہیں ہے تو ہم پھر ان کو آسا ملتے ہیں اس طرح نا ایک کانٹیکٹ ملا ایک عورت نے رابطہ کیا کہ میں فلانی عورت سے جو ہے نا اسلام کے بارے میں سیکھتی آ رہی ہوں تو اب میں مسجد دیکھنا چاہتی ہوں میں نے بلایا تو وہ حیران ہو گئی 
तो ये तो मस्जिद नहीं है ये तो क्या आपने वो घर के अंदर नमाज सेंटर तो मैंने फिर उसको आस्ता आस्ता ना तबलीग करना शुरू की लेकिन फिर भी वो ना जान वो सुनियो की मस्जिद में गई ढूंढ डांड के उधर वो गई उनकी मस्जिद में तो उसने जाकर उधर ना एक नोट की चीज के ब्रदरहुड नहीं है उनमें वो कहते हैं कि मुझे मस्जिद में नहीं उन्होंने इंटर नहीं होने दिया क्योंकि मैंने शॉर्ट्स पहनी हुई थी तो अलहमदुल्ला वो फिर वापस आई उसने कहा कि सॉरी मैं चली गई थी आपसे लेकिन अब मैं वापस आती हूँ afternoon session of 73rd Jalsa Salana USA at this time i would like to invite azhar hanif sahib missionary in charge usa to please come on stage and preside this session Assalam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We will now begin this special session We have invited guests and as our tradition we will begin our session with the recitation of the Holy Quran tilawat I request Muhammad Al Baraki sahab to please come for tilawat السلام عليكم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان ارش يُغْشِي اللَّيْلَ النَّهَارَ يَطْلُبُهُ حَثِيثًا وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ وَالنُّجُومَ مُسَخَّرَاتٍ بِأَمْرِهِ أَلَا لَهُ الْخَلْقُ وَالْأَمْرُ تبارك الله رب العالمين ادعوا ربكم تضرعا وخفيه انه لا يحب المعتدين ولا تفسدوا في الارض بعد اصلاحها وادعوه خوفا وطمعا ان رحمه الله قريب من المحسنين وَهُوَ الَّذِي يُرْسِلُ الرِّيَاحَ بُشْرًا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ رَحْمَتِهِ حَتَّى إِذَا أَقْ 
قلت صحابا في قال سقناه لبلد ميت سقناه لبلد ميت فأنزلنا به الماء فأخرجنا به فأنزلنا به الماء فأخرجنا به من كل الثمرات كذلك نخرج الموت لعلكم تذكرون والبلد الطيب يخرج نباته بإذن ربه والذي خبث لا يخرج إلا نكدا كذلك نصرف الآيات لقوم يشكرون Jazakum Allah. And now for the English translation, I request Yusuf Sharif. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings of God be upon you. Following is the English translation of just recited verses from Surah Al Araf. Chapter 7, verses 55 through 59. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. Surely your Lord is Allah, who created the heavens and the earth in six periods. Then he settled himself on the throne. He makes the night cover the day, which pursues it swiftly. And he created the sun and the moon and the stars, all made subservient by his command. Verily, his is the creation and the command. Blessed is Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Call upon your Lord in humility and in secret, Surely he does not love the transgressors. And create not disorder in the earth after it has been set in order, and call upon him in fear and in hope. Surely the mercy of Allah is nigh unto those who do good. And he it is who sends the winds as glad tidings before his mercy till when they bear a heavy cloud, we drive it to a dead land. Then we send down water therefrom, and we bring forth therewith fruits of every kind. In like manner do we bring forth the dead that you may remember. And as for the good land, its vegetation comes forth plentifully by the command of its Lord and that which is bad, its vegetation does not come forth but scantily. In like manner do we vary the signs for a people who are grateful. Zakma. Next, we shall have a poem in the Urdu language. And I request Adnan Nasir Sahib to come and recite some couplets. السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ پاکیزہ منظوم کلام سیدنا حضرت اقدس مسیح معود علیہ السلاۃ وسلام
जो कुछ बुतो चांद को भी देखा तो उस यार नहीं जब चांद को
इस जाए पुर अजाब से क्यों दिल लगाते हो दो जख है ये मुकाम ये बुसता सरा नहीं दो जख है ये काम ये बुसता सरा नहीं वो देखता जो कुछ बुतो में पाते हो उसमें वो क्या नहीं जो कुछ बुतो the translation of this poem into english for the sake of those who could not understand the original language and the spirit of that message i request abdul latif belanta sahib to please come and share a gist of what was just recited because no language can do justice to another perfectly in translation but at least we'll have a gist Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The following is an English translation of the just recited verses taken from a poem written by our beloved promised messiah Mr. Guliam Ahmad may peace be upon him He sees it Why do you attach your hearts with strangers What do you find in the idols that he does not have What do you find in the idols that he does not have? We pondered over the sun but did not find that light. When we saw the moon, it too was not like the beloved. He is one, unique, immortal. All are subject to death, but he does not perish. all are subject to death but he does not perish all good lies in attaching your hearts with him pray seek only him friends there is no loyalty in the idols pray seek only him friends there is no loyalty in the idols why do you attach your hearts 
with this place of torment. This abode is like hell. It is not a home and a garden. This abode is like hell. It is not a home and a garden. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In this special afternoon session, we will have a keynote address to open it, and it will be followed by a session with many friends and guests from outside the community who have joined us this day on this auspicious occasion of Jalsa Salana USA. At that time also, there will be a humanitarian award given to one of the distinguished guests, and then we will conclude it afterwards. I first request the keynote speaker, Dr. Wasim Syed, who is our National Director of Outreach and Propagation, and also a PhD in theoretical physics. I'm sure he will not speak about physics, but about our faith. And I trust that all of us will pay and grant him rapt attention. This is a message we have been delivering throughout the entire world to help mankind find a path of peace going forward. I request, therefore, Dr. Wasim Syed to please come and deliver his opening keynote address. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'du fa a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin i bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. He is one, he has no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad is indeed his servant and messenger. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed. And I begin in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. Respected Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum, peace be on you all. Working in harmony with nature, man has, over the many years past, unlocked the secrets of nuclear energy that powers the stars and our sun. And a use of that same power may soon, sadly, lead to the annihilation of humanity. My purpose in this short speech is to show that humanity can attain peace and save itself from this impending disaster, but only through recognizing, acknowledging, and seeking the help of the one who created nature. The tradition of holding this auspicious occasion, this Jalsa Salana, this annual gathering, was started in 1891 in Kadyan, India, 132 years ago, by the holy founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be on him. He had claimed to be the promised Messiah, and the Imam Mahdi, whose advent had been prophesied by Muhammad, the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. His mission, according to the Holy Prophet, was to end wars, to usher in an age of peace at a time when humanity would have forsaken God and become entirely consumed by worldly pursuits, materialism, that invariably lead man into a state of extreme greed, injustice, and ultimately self-annihilation. 116 years ago, in that small hamlet, 
1907, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the promised Messiah, alerted the world to the fact that heedlessness of God was propelling it towards a catastrophe. I quote, O Europe, he said, you are not safe. And O Asia, you too are not immune. And O dwellers of islands, no false gods shall come to your rescue. I see cities fall and settlements laid waste. The one and the only God who kept silent for long. Heinous crimes were committed before his eyes, and he said nothing. But now he shall reveal his face, and in majesty and awe, let him who has ears that that the time, let him who has ears hear that the time is not far. I have done my best to bring all under the protection of God, but it was destined that what was written should come to pass. Truly, the turn of this land, too, is approaching fast. The times of Noah shall reappear before your eyes, and your own eyes will witness the calamity that overtook the cities of Lot. But God is slow in his wrath. Repent that you may be shown mercy. He who does not fear him is dead, not alive." End quote. The promised Messiah alayhi salam, worked relentlessly throughout his life to fulfill the mission that God had assigned to him. And as he came near the end of his life, he penned a book that deals squarely with the topic I have been assigned to talk about. He stated therein clearly that the key to unlocking peace had to do with recognizing God, the true God, whose grace and mercy are indiscriminate and universal. In his message that I shall read a small portion from, he articulates the inseparable and fundamental connection between establishing peace and the universal nature of God that is manifest in the functioning of nature and the material universe. Here he supplies the rationale for why it is that recognizing God will lead humanity to peace. The essence of the argument lies in the observation that when something fulfills its intended purpose, a state of tranquility prevails, and man's purpose is to come to recognize his creator. He says, and I quote, my countrymen, a religion that does not inculcate universal compassion is no religion at all. Similarly, a human being without the faculty of compassion is no human. Our God, he says, has never discriminated between one people and another. This is illustrated by the fact that all the potentials and capabilities granted to the Aryas, he was addressing at that time the Aryas and the Muslims of India, he says, all the potentials and capabilities granted to the Aryas have also been given to the races inhabiting Arabia, Persia, Syria, China, Japan, Europe, and America. The earth created by God provides a common floor for all people alike. And the sun, moon, and many stars are a source of radiance and provide many other benefits to everyone. Likewise, all peoples benefit from the elements created by him, such as air, water, fire, earth, and similarly from other products created by him like grain, fruit, healing agents, etc. These attributes of God teach us that we too, these attributes of God teach us, he says, that we too should behave magnanimously and kindly towards our fellow human beings and should not be petty of heart and illiberal, end of quote. So the first essential point that the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, makes is that everyone must embrace the profound truth that we are all one. This alike for all, this oneness of nature is something that science has confirmed to prevail throughout space and time. The laws of nature that we observe and validate in laboratories across the globe are found to be same throughout the universe and as far back in time as we can see. The light from stars arriving here after millions of years of travel show spectra that match the spectra of elements we observe here in our own devices. Only they are shifted to the red or to the blue end of the spectrum due to what they call the Doppler effect, signifying that the star emitting the light is either moving towards us or away from us. 
The Holy Quran points to this truth magnificently. It states, no incongruity can you see in the creation of the gracious God. Then look again, seest thou any flaw? I look again and yet again, your sight will only return unto thee confused and fatigued. Amazingly, 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 this oneness aspect of nature was brought to perfect focus in my own life in 1967, as I came to realize later, when Professor Abdus Salam, a distinguished member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, established a unified understanding of three of nature's fundamental forces, namely the weak nuclear force, along with the electric and the magnetic forces. This won him and two other scientists from our own United States for their contribution towards this understanding, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1979. It is to this oneness in nature that the promised Messiah, peace be on him, points to remind us of our own oneness. The second critical point that connects beautifully to the subject of peace is the need for everyone to become like God, to adopt his attributes of universal and indiscriminate beneficence. Thus, he says, friends, take it as certain that if either of our two nations would not treat God's attributes with respect and will not shape its conduct in accordance with the conduct of God, then that nation will soon be wiped out from the face of the earth. Not only will it destroy itself, but it will also jeopardize the future of its coming generations. He goes on to say, the righteous of all ages have testified that following God's ways works like an elixir for the people, a life-giving force. Moreover, the survival, both physical and spiritual, of human beings depends on the same eternal truth that man should follow the virtuous attributes of God, who is the fountainhead of all that is essential for survival. He goes on to say, God commences the Holy Quran with the following verse, which I recited at the beginning, which states, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That is all perfect attributes, all perfect and holy attributes belong exclusively to Allah, who is the Lord of all the worlds. The word Alam comprises all different peoples, all different ages, all the different countries. The commencement of the Holy Quran, he says, with this verse was designed to counter the views of such people as attempted to monopolize God's unlimited providence for their own nation and imagined that the other nations did not belong to God or that having created these other peoples, God discarded them as being of no consequence or else perhaps they were shelved to oblivion by him or God forbid, they were not even created by him." End quote. So here, the truth laid bare in the, is the reality we see operating in the world also. Namely, to benefit from God's creation, we have to come into harmony with nature. This is what science is all about. Understanding nature and learning to benefit from it by working in sync with it. The promised Messiah, peace be on him, on him is telling us that if science has understood that man can gain immense benefit by working in harmony with nature, then why is it hard for man to recognize that he would be able to attain immense progress in the realm of human relations, in the realm of spirituality, if he adopts the colors of God? The rule that we see working in nature, he says, applies also to the truths of the spiritual realm. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, was a mercy for the whole of creation, as the Holy Quran itself testifies, and quote, and we have sent thee not but as a mercy for all peoples. He and his followers were persecuted mercilessly for years, yet he bore all such suffering with patience and total resignation to the will of God. He illustrated to the greatest extent what it means to achieve peace, to embody, personify, spread, and advance the cause of peace. Many great historians familiar with the life history of Muhammad may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, have testified in writing to the truth of what I have just stated. And when, with the help of Allah, he became victorious, he forgave all except a few 
who had been guilty of absolutely heinous crimes against humanity. And from among even such people, when they came under the mantle of his pardon, even if by trickery, he did not seek to punish them. He won them over with his kindness and advanced peace and the cause of peace as never before in the history of mankind. What a perfect example he was of the teaching of the Holy Quran. Let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just. That is nearer to righteousness. This is the crucial principle set forth by the Holy Quran that everyone must heed to bring peace to the world. The immense effort begun by the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, to guide mankind to bring about universal peace has continued with ever greater intensity under the guidance of his spiritual successors under the system of Khilafat. So in our own time, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, our beloved Imam, the fifth successor of the Prophet Messiah, may Allah be his helper, has been at the forefront of the efforts for decades to reduce the risk of war and increase the chances of peace. He wrote to all the world's great leaders over the last two decades and gave them the sagacious advice of the Holy Quran. I invite every one of you to study these discourses that are compiled in a book given to each of you as a gift, or it will be, The World Crisis and the Pathway to Peace. Writing to President Obama on March 8, 2012, he stated, I believe that now, rather than focusing on the progress of the world, it is more important and indeed essential that we urgently increase our efforts to save the world from this destruction. He, he continued, there is an urgent need for mankind to recognize its one God who is our creator, as this is the only guarantor for the survival of humanity. Otherwise, the world will continue to rapidly head towards self-destruction. The world stands today, if you listen to the news, you will be conscious of this. The world stands today at the very edge of annihilation. It is essential for humanity to realize the oneness of humanity. And this is impossible without recognizing the one who created us all and without seeking his help. People often say, that we can act on all these uh, principles that you are talking about without believing in a creator or God. The truth, however, is that God exists. And it is to the recognition of this truth and submission to it that God has guided humanity throughout the ages, all over the world, by sending his prophets into the world and establishing the truth of his existence through them. It has always been the case, if one looks at the history of the prophets, that they were powerless, weak people who were always opposed by the most powerful people of their times. And those who believed in them also were the weak and the poor. Yet, it was always the case that they, the prophets, prevailed and those who did not listen to them and heed their advice perished. The examples of Moses and Jesus, peace be on them, can be cited. I could give a detailed presentation on the life of that weak, unlettered orphan God raised in Arabia whose name was Muhammad. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And in this age, the life and circumstances of the holy founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community also attest to this same truth. The lives of all of them prove the truth of the statement made by the Holy Quran, Allah has decreed, most surely I will prevail, I and my messengers. Verily, Allah is powerful, mighty. They all established the truth of their claims with manifest signs and prophecies against all worldly odds. Just as man cannot survive in the material world without working in consonance with nature, human beings cannot live together in peace without recognizing and developing a genuine relationship with God and thus attaining certainty about his existence. I think it's necessary here also to clarify what I mean by the recognition of God that I keep talking about. There are millions of people in the world who readily declare that they believe in God 
and yet they are unable to resist the temptation to commit sin, fail to discharge the rights of fellow man, cheat and defraud, and all this while professing belief in God. How is this possible? When man attains true recognition of God, he comes to realize that divine wrath is an all-consuming fire. And when God manifests his beauty upon man, he realizes that in him lies perfect bliss. All the veils between him and divine majesty and beauty are thus lifted. And this alone can check the egotistical passions and bring about true reformation. Our everyday experience shows that we are at once drawn towards things that are useful and shun and avoid what we are afraid of. For instance, if you do not know that the thing you are holding in your hand happens to be arsenic and imagine that it is some other useful thing, you will not hesitate to consume even 10, 20 ounces of it. But if you know that it is a deadly poison, which will kill you instantly, you will never dare to take even an iota of it. It is only when man truly recognizes and realizes that God exists and that every sin is punishable in his eyes, that he refrains from sin. Thus, how welcoming it is to hear the Holy Quran declare that whosoever tries to strive on this path, Allah will surely make him successful. Thus, Allah states, and as for those who strive in our path, we will surely guide them in our ways. And verily, Allah is with those who do good. There is another fundamental teaching of the Holy Quran that I want to mention briefly. We need to realize that to establish peace, there is a need for everyone to give up something, to have compassion for others, and indeed to start to think of humanity as a mother does of her child. It is this need to go well beyond merely behaving equitably to which Islam calls humanity. Verily, Allah says in the Holy Quran, Allah enjoins justice and the doing of good to others and giving like kindred. The pursuit of justice, according to Islam, is merely the first step towards establishing peace. To effectively be rigged about peace, additional measures are often needed. Given the highlighted or the heightened emotions often present among parties engaged in disputes, it becomes imperative to advocate for benevolence, kindness, and compassion. However, there are occasions when even this much is not enough. And the Holy Quran encourages us to take a second step forward. It urges treating others with the same care and tenderness as one would treat their kith and kin, like a mother's unwavering love for her child. In this profound concept, no trace of ulterior motives or seeking personal gain exists. Acts of goodness are carried out without any expectation or desire for reciprocation. Given the current situation of the conflict in Europe and the growing threats of it spreading to other areas of the world, all parties must look at the teachings of Islam I have mentioned in brief and that are detailed in the book I've just mentioned as the potential path to lasting peace. Lest anyone think that all of these things are mere philosophy, let me quickly summarize the practicalities of these teachings and outline how they move humanity towards peace. Irrespective of the religion, the teachings attributed to God are generally the same. Love for God and his creation. If truly manifested by practical care and concern for fellow human beings, validates the truth of a believer's claim for God, for love of God. If all human beings align their paths and move towards recognizing God and adopting his attributes of universal and indiscriminate beneficence, we could bring peace to the world. In such a situation, everyone would be trying to please God and not their egos. This principle is the root of the Quranic prescription for establishing peace among all religions. Allah says in the Holy Quran, say, we believe in Allah and in that which has been revealed to us, and that which was revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes, and that which was given to Moses and Jesus and other prophets from their Lord, we make no distinction between any of them, and to him we submit. This also leads to internal peace. As the Holy Quran states, I, it is in the remembrance of Allah that hearts can find comfort. This internal peace then expands into the peace of our neighborhoods, cities, and the world. Focusing on pleasing God only will keep us away from evil and harming fellow human beings. God encourages justice, irrespective of personal interests. Focusing on pleasing God will also prevent us from engaging in hate speech, avoid hurting the feelings of fellow human beings, and destroy social harmony. The Holy Quran directs believers 
to wage peace relentlessly, to never let any opportunity to restore peace escape. Even if there is a danger that it may be an attempt by the enemy at deception or to gain time to regroup, or whatever may be the case, to trust in Allah and proceed to attempt to make peace whenever we are afforded an opportunity to do so. Thus Allah says to the believers in the Holy Quran, and if they incline towards peace, incline thou also towards it, and put thy trust in Allah. Surely it is he who is all hearing, all knowing. And if they intend to deceive thee, prevent a nation from moving forward post-war and limit its freedom and prosperity should also be avoided at all costs. Talking specifically about Russia for a moment, what incentive will Russia have and its leaders to cease hostilities if they know that their withdrawal will lead to their certain ruin? Keeping communication channels open and striving to find mutually acceptable agreement terms is essential. China, Turkey, Indonesia, several African states and others are making attempts at peace. The Holy Quran guides the intervening parties by saying that their objective must always remain the establishment of peace instead of seeking revenge or humiliating the aggressor, nor should their underlying intention ever be to line their own pockets or to exploit the conflict to advance vested interests. It says, and if two parties of believers fight against each other, make peace between them, then if after that one of them transgresses against the other, fight the party that transgresses until it returns to the command of Allah. Then if it returns, make peace between them with equity and act justly. Verily, Allah loves the just. This guidance is concrete and comprehensive and has as its goal bringing about lasting peace. Rather than acting wisely, certain leaders and officials are making statements or pledges that serve only to pour fuel on the fire. The world is well versed in supporting victims and those suffering injustice, as is the case with the Ukrainian nation at the moment. Yet it may surprise you to hear that Islam teaches Muslims to help not only the victims of persecution, but also the perpetrator and the oppressor. Of course, this does not mean that you provide the aggressor with the means to uh, a freedom to inflict further cruelties. Rather, to help the aggressor means to stop him from committing further brutalities and injustice. Whatever wrongs are being committed by the Russian state, we must keep in mind the broader picture that if the war is not brought to an end, it will lead to a deepening global crisis with potentially catastrophic results. Ladies and gentlemen, it is only, with through, it is only through the recognition and with the help of the one true God, whose grace and mercy are universal and indiscriminate, without whose help nothing can be achieved, that we can usher in peace the world over. So it was with the most ardent desire of the Holy Founder of the Holy, uh, so it was the most ardent desire of the Holy Founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community for all of his followers to always adopt righteousness and draw themselves close to God and pray to him for the achievement of all their wishes and desires. It is to this, it is to these endeavors that our beloved Imam, the current head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, continues to draw our attention again and again. And it is to this that I, in the end, turn. I also invite our friends to join us in this most ambitious and worthiest of all endeavors. This is the marvelous duty that we see our Khalifa discharging tirelessly all over the world. We must share these teachings with the whole of humanity starting with our friends and neighbors and fellow workers and colleagues and everyone we come in touch with. The holy founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community writes, you should strive to the utmost of your power to spread the idea of his singleness and unity all over the earth. Be kind and merciful to humanity for all are his creatures. Do not oppress them with your tongue or hands or in any other way. Always work for the good of mankind. In another book he writes, God Almighty desires to draw all those who live in various habitations of the world, be it Europe or Asia, and who have a virtuous nature to the unity of God and unite his servants under one faith. This indeed is the purpose of God for which I have been sent to the world. You too, therefore, should pursue this end, but with kindness, moral probity, and fervent prayers. If we pay attention to this work, this responsibility, inshallah, God willing, we will see peace spread and the whole world become a veritable garden of Eden, a paradise, which really is what the ultimate goal of all divine guidance is. May Allah enable us to do so. Ameen. I thank everyone for their kind attention.
And our last word is that all praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. Allah, thank you, Dr. Wasim Syed, for those profound insights, for those thoughts on world peace which can be achieved through the recognition, submission, and obedience to God's will and word, and historically to his prophets. And in this sense, of course, in the few minutes he had at his disposal, he could never and no one could ever do justice to this topic. But I hope that provided some food for thought. And as was mentioned, all of us, whether we are members or we are guests, can take more time in your leisure to go through that book, which contains so many wonderful lectures from our supreme head, Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmad Sahib, the head of Jamaat Ahmadiyya worldwide, here in USA and throughout the world, talking about this topic of world importance, how to achieve peace through recognizing God, I hope and pray that we may do so. At this point, we will continue with the next portion of our session, which is going to invite guests to give their remarks and to present the 2023 Ahmadiyya Muslim Humanitarian Award. For that, I request our national uh, leader of Public Relations, Ahmed, Amjad Mahmoud Kansab, to please come and to welcome our guest and to present this award. Honored guests and Jalsa delegates, Assalamu Alaikum. This is the Islamic greeting of peace and blessings of Allah on all of you. On behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA, welcome to the 73rd Jalsa Salana, or annual convention, the nation's oldest and longest running American Muslim convention. It is now my honor to introduce several special guests, dignitaries, public officials, and friends of our community. And we'll begin with the Honorable Justin Fleming, who serves as a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives for the 105th District and was elected to this position in November 2022. Representative Fleming. Good afternoon and thank you everybody. Um, I, my name is Justin Fleming, and I am the state representative for the 105th Legislative District right here in Dauphin County. And congratulations on holding your Jalsa Salana, uh, the oldest and longest running Muslim convention in America. And it is my pleasure to once again welcome you to Pennsylvania's capital city of Harrisburg. I'm honored to be here and meet so many Ahmadiyya Muslims across, from across the country. Uh, I wish to congratulate your global spiritual leader, His Holiness Misra Masur Ahmad, under whose guidance your community conducts work here in Pennsylvania. And we look forward to welcoming him again in Pennsylvania very, very soon. I certainly commend the work of your Harrisburg chapter, which has provided exemplary social services in the community for many years and including this week. You truly live by your motto, love for all, hatred for none. I express my gratitude for your recently launched Jalsa Cares Community Outreach Project. Uh, this is a thoughtful and noble project. Um, among these works, you're donating food, um, blood donations and finding volunteers to combat homelessness and food insecurity throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and for that we thank you. I know that this work you do is a reflection of the true teachings of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be unto him. 
So one of the areas that I am proud of is the fact that this community is my home. I was born in Dauphin County 40-something um, years ago, and I am accustomed to growing up with a rich diversity of people of all walks of life. And um, the school I attended is just about a mile and a half down the road here to our east, Susquehanna Township High School. And we had, you know, folks of all kinds, races, religions, ethnicities, creeds. And so this is what I'm accustomed to. And this is what uh, we have here in the 105th Legislative District. And I'll just give you one small example of that. Just, uh, just this week, on Tuesday, I had an hour-long meeting with an evangelical minister in my office to talk about his congregation and his church and his faith belief. Uh, I had lunch with a rabbi on Thursday, and now I am here uh, on Saturday in front of you, welcoming you all, the, the um, Ahmadi Muslim, Ahmadiyya Muslim uh, community here once again to Harrisburg. And so, you know, that should give you just a small piece of what Dauphin County is about, what our greater region is about. It is about truly love for all and hatred toward none. And I could not be more proud to represent this area and represent this district, uh, which I hope serves as a beacon to the rest of the country that we can live in peace. We can live together in prosperity and we can uh, live together in the words of Abraham Lincoln uh, with malice toward none and charity toward all. So I just wanted to say um, with this year's convention theme uh, being recognizing God as a key to unlocking peace and we heard the wonderful remarks earlier, this is an incredibly important topic and I wanna say that one way to recognize God in our lives, and this is true in my Christian faith tradition as well, is to serve his people. And that's exactly what I'm doing in my service in the Pennsylvania General Assembly, and I'm honored to do so. That's, of course, what you're doing here uh, with your community work, and this is how you, we create lasting peace and lasting bonds with one another. Thank you again for this invitation. It's truly an honor to be here, and I, I hope you have a wonderful uh, Jalsa Salana convention. Thank you, Representative Fleming, for those kind remarks. As uh, Representative Fleming, Fleming mentioned, we just launched a new JALSA CARES initiative, this JALSA Salana. We're very excited about this. Um, the, the spirit of JALSA Salana is to serve. And the first convention took place in 1891, just 75 people. But here in Harrisburg, we launched this uh, initiative with the support of the city of Harrisburg and particularly Mayor Wanda Williams and the public works director and everyone associated with the city because we wanted to give back to this beautiful city. We've been here, it's our 13th time holding the convention here in Harrisburg. And so this community outreach uh, took place one day before the Jalsa Salana began, so Thursday. And uh, we had over 40 volunteers clean up the city on 6th and Emerald donate blood throughout the day, and also significantly donate meals, the Downtown Daily Bread, a, a wonderful organization. And so this is just a humble offering of our community, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, because we care about this city, and Jalsa Salana cares as well. Earlier this week, we also met with Mayor Wanda Williams. She's been a terrific partner in this, and she couldn't be here today but she shared a beautiful message, and I'll ask the MTA team to please uh, share those remarks now. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you, my brothers and sisters. It is my tremendous honor as mayor of this great city to welcome you once again to Harrisburg and to congratulate you on holding your 73rd Jasa Salana here in our capital city. This oldest and longest running Muslim convention 
is a sign of what can happen when love and strength comes together and triumphs over everything in its path. A global pandemic did its best to keep us apart, but you returned in full force with full hearts, and we welcome you back with open arms. You have my word that as long as I am mayor, you will have a home here in Harrisburg. That love goes both ways. While we have welcomed the Jossa Solana back year after year, you have embraced us each time you return. It is no surprise that you truly live by your motto, love for all, hatred for none. I can think of no better phrase to describe the people of Harrisburg as a whole. This is where diversity and differences are celebrated. So where better to celebrate one of America's largest Muslim conventions? I may not be able to be with you in person today, but I have been in years past and am with you in spirit now. And to that I say, God is most great, and to God be the glory. While I am sorry I physically cannot be with you today, I am spiritually there with you by our shared love and following of the Lord. There is far more which brings us together than separates us, and we have God to thank for that. Our manner of worship may be different, but our beliefs are shared. Love strength, kindness, and peace. As the Jossa Solana returns to the city of Harrisburg, let me spotlight the work of the Harrisburg chapter, which continues to provide exemplary social services throughout our community. Your Jossa Cares initiative is tackling one of our city's most glaring needs, homelessness. It is a model for success by donating food and money to our unhoused organizing blood drives and mobilizing the community for neighborhood cleanups. You continue to show that we can accomplish anything with a big heart. One of the reasons I love hosting the Johnson Salama in the city of Harrisburg is it allows me to learn more about Islam and your message of love and peace. Last year, I spoke about your ongoing Supreme Justice campaign to root out and combat hatred, racism, and bigotry. Today, I stand as firm as I've ever been to say no more today, tomorrow, and every day. Justice and equality deserve to be had in all levels of society. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community has always remained at the forefront of human rights. It does not matter who you are. All men and women, black, white, or brown, are equal in the eyes of the Lord. As your founder, the promised Messiah, peace be upon him. He once said, a religion which does not teach universal compassion is no religion at all. Similarly, a human being without the faculty of compassion is no human at all. Our God has never discriminated between one people or another. The earth created by God provides a common floor for all people alike. I want to close on this. Thank you to His Holiness, Mizra Mashroor Ahmad, for his leadership as the global head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. A few years ago, he spoke here in Pennsylvania and said, quote, in times of grief and despair, we will always be there to wipe away the tears of our neighbors and to support and comfort them. My friends, what you're doing today is an embodiment of those beautiful words. You are those vessels of love and peace which your teachings have instilled in you for so many years. And it is peace and love which will carry us to amazing heights moving forward. When you leave our city, take with you the comfort that no matter where those vessels roam, you can always dock them here in the city of Harrisburg. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon you.
Our next speaker is Dr. Harrison Akins, who serves as a policy advisor for the Office of International Religious Freedom at the U.S. State Department in Washington, D.C. He serves as the team lead on Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan. He received his Ph.D. in political science from the University of Tennessee. We're honored to welcome Dr. Akins to our JALSA. He'll be introducing also a special video message from the Honorable Rashad Hussein, U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. Dr. Akins? Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for inviting me here today to this 73rd Jalsa Salana. Congratulations for hosting this event. It's wonderful. I'm so happy to join you all at this unique event and be able to visit with members of your community. I've been fortunate enough to have previously attended the Jalsa Salana in the UK, where I was honored to have the opportunity to meet and visit with Hazor an opportunity that I continue to cherish to this day. I've experienced the vibrancy of this Muslim community that contributes so much to society through your humanitarian and relief work. You truly have love for all and hatred for none, something that we desperately need today. As my, as, uh, my friend Amjad said, I'm Harrison Akins and I'm the South Asia Policy Advisor in the State Department's Office of International Religious Freedom, headed by the Ambassador-at-Large for International Religious Freedom, Rashad Hussein. The Office of International Religious Freedom promotes universal respect for freedom of religion or belief for all as a core objective of U.S. foreign policy. The office also monitors religiously motivated abuses, harassment, and discrimination worldwide. And in our work, we are privileged to be led by Ambassador Hussein, who serves as a principal advisor to the Secretary of State and President on religious freedom conditions and policy. He is a tireless advocate on these important issues. I know Ambassador Hussein wished he could be here with you today as well, but he has provided recorded remarks that I would like to share with you now. I would like to thank you for the opportunity and the invitation to speak to the 73rd Jalsa Salana USA to celebrate and honor this vibrant community that for more than a century has been a valued part of our diverse American society. The Jalsa Salana is an important opportunity not only to strengthen the bonds of community, but also to reflect on the challenges to peace and acceptance that too many communities struggle with today. The United States has been a global champion in promoting respect and defending freedom of religion or belief for all. The freedom to practice and express one's beliefs is a core tenet of American life. And this principle remains an important part of the Biden administration's overall efforts to advance human rights as a foreign policy priority around the world. Our efforts to protect religious freedom for all would not be possible without our civil society colleagues. And your community is an important partner that I am proud to stand with and confronting myriad challenges to freedom of religion or belief. I know and greatly respect how Ahmadi Muslims advocate for members of other oppressed communities with the same passion and dedication as you all advocate for your own brothers and sisters. And I commend you for truly living your message of peace and acceptance, love for all and hatred for none. You do so even as members of your own community face significant repression. Ahmadis have been murdered for their beliefs and in some parts of the world, your mosques and graves have been destroyed. In some countries, Ahmadis cannot even vote in elections without disavowing their faith. Ahmadi leaders have been frivolously charged with blasphemy. And in some countries, authorities have even targeted Ahmadis with widespread arrests and prosecutions. No one should ever be targeted for their religious beliefs. And that's why the United States has stood up for the rights of Ahmadis as equal individuals. 
My team and I work closely with our embassies and consulates around the world to use the full range of diplomatic tools to encourage governments to meet their inter international obligations and commitments to respect freedom of religion or belief. And we document the abuses that Ahmadis and others face in our annual International Religious Freedom Report. I had the honor of releasing the 2022 report in May alongside Secretary Blinken, who stressed the administration's enduring commitment to defend the freedom of religion or belief, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because of the extraordinary good that people of faith can contribute to society by promoting peace, caring for the sick, protecting our planet, and expanding opportunities for underserved communities. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a shining example of the good that faith communities can accomplish with your steadfast commitment to humanitarian relief and your work around the world. Again, I am honored to be able to speak with you today and appreciate all that you do to strive for peace and a more just world. I wish you a very successful Jalsa Salana and hope to visit you in person soon. Thank you. We thank uh, Dr. Akins and uh, Ambassador Hussein for their diligent work to protect international religious freedom for everyone, everywhere. Our next speaker is Knox Thames. He currently serves as senior fellow at Pepperdine University School of Law and visiting expert at the U.S. Institute for Peace. He is an international human rights advocate, lawyer, and author who has served over 20 years in the U.S. government. This includes serving as the special advisor for religious minorities for the U.S. State Department under both the Obama and Trump administrations. Knox? There's a pandemic sweeping the globe, but not just COVID-19, a pandemic of religious persecution that impacts your community, my community, and people of all faiths and none. The question is, what are we going to do about it? As Americans, as Muslims, as Christians, as people of goodwill, it starts by raising our collective voice and saying enough. Religious freedom is a foundational freedom, the soul of the human rights system. It's where American interests and values meet. The United States should speak up for religious freedom because it reflects who we are as a country. It reflects American values. It's an American distinctive. But we should also speak up for religious freedom for everyone because it's in our interest. We know that countries that respect the religious rights of all their citizens are more peaceful, more prosperous, more stable, and better partners. Thankfully, for the past 25 years, the United States has been a global leader in promoting religious freedom. This October, we'll celebrate the 25th anniversary of the passage of the International Religious Freedom Act. It was a groundbreaking piece of legislation that a Republican Congress passed and a Democratic president signed into law that established religious freedom as a foreign policy priority. And so we have people like Ambassador Hussein and uh, former Commissioner Manza who have been involved in this work representing all of us overseas to promote this right. But we can't rest on our laurels 25 years later because evil continues to find new ways to repress. So it's crucial that everyone here lets their congressmen and senators and even President Biden know that religious freedom matters for all. Of course, we know your community faces consistent persecution in Pakistan with increasing troubles in Indonesia and horrible terrorist attacks in Africa, pressing governments to end discrimination against Ahmadiyya Muslims to protect their religious freedoms and ensure their equal citizenship must be a pri priority, but it will be tough. I know that from when I served at the State Department in a special envoy role, I would meet with, meet with Pakistani officials. I would raise concerns about your community. I remember handing documents in two different meetings to the Prime Minister's human rights advisor and to the Chief Justice Minister of Punjab in Lahore, documenting the criminalization of Ahmadi Muslim texts and documents and the jailing of booksellers. But one meeting is not enough. The United States must consistently raise this issue. We must lead. 
And so it's up to all of us to insist that our country do more to help persecuted Ahmadiyya Muslims, to end the religious apartheid system in Pakistan and discrimination elsewhere, to insist on setting captives free. And of course, while it's good and natural to speak up for our own, if we don't, who else will? We know that an environment with full religious freedom for everyone will ensure the brightest future for our brothers and sisters of the faith. So when we speak out for faith, we must speak out for others who are persecuted as well for their religion or belief. And I know from my 20 years of work doing and promoting religious freedom internationally that when one community is targeted, for sure other communities also face great repression. There is solidarity in suffering and there is solidarity in speaking up for all. I've been recently reading about this new um, philosophy of covenantal pluralism. It's a beautiful idea where we don't dumb down or pretend there aren't deep theological differences. We agree to disagree agreeably. But we're locked arm in arm fighting for the rights of everyone to pursue truth as their conscience leads, to have this covenant that we can live together in a pluralistic society defending the rights of each other. And I'm happy to do this for your community. I love Ahmadiyya Muslims. I mean, first, just because the founder of my faith, Jesus Christ, says we should love our neighbors. And as we know, sometimes some neighbors are harder to love than others. But Ahmadiyya Muslims make it easy, I have to say. The official slogan of your community, love for all, hatred for none, is beautifully said. I've seen your communities in uh, community work, helping others through blood drives or food drives. As someone from an evangelical background, I respect the zeal that you have for your faith. And as an international human rights lawyer, I know how leaders in your community have stood up for religious freedom, dating back even to the founding of the UN when Zafarullah Khan, the first foreign minister of Pakistan and in Amity, defended the religious freedom provisions in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights when the UN General Assembly was considering to vote for it in 1948. And frankly, I love Amity's because you're my friends. Amjad, Kudus, Nassim in Sweden, Harris, Mahmoud, Imam, Lakum, and so many others. And as someone who's been to Pakistan more times than I can remember, this is my first Jalsa to attend, so it's wonderful to experience this warm fellowship and to see how your community is thriving and adding to the richness of our country. In conclusion, as people of faith, we, we know and we agree that God holds the ultimate key to unlocking peace that can bring about a harmonious society. And while we may draw different conclusions about ultimate theological questions, we as Americans, as people of goodwill, we stand united in support of religious freedom for everyone. Thank you very much. We sincerely appreciate the amazing work that Knox has done for two decades in defense of religious freedom for everyone. Amity Muslims are deeply committed to the promotion of peace, freedom, loyalty to country, and service to humanity. In 2011, our community established an annual Ahmadiyya Muslim Humanitarian Award to recognize the services and contributions of individuals who selflessly strive to assist oppressed and disadvantaged communities around the world. By being an advocate for these communities, these individuals protect and safeguard fundamental and universal human rights. This year, we're delighted to honor the work of Nadine Mayenza. Nadine is the president of the International Religious Freedom Secretariat and global fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. She was previously appointed by the White House on the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, where she served two consecutive two-year terms, including as chairperson. She is a noted speaker, writer, and policy expert with more than two decades of experience as a champion for international religious freedom. She has worked tirelessly in defense of persecuted religious communities all over the world, especially her work for the rights of Yazidis, Christians, and Muslims. She has led official human rights delegations on behalf 
of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Myanmar, Bahrain, Indonesia, Iraq, Azerbaijan, Thailand, Taiwan, and Uzbekistan. And Nadine has advocated for the rights of persecuted Ahmadi Muslims in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Algeria. Our community has worked extremely closely with Nadine to rescue persecuted Ahmadi Muslims from Afghanistan, where Nadine has personally invested hundreds of hours of her own time for this project. Sometimes in the dead of night, I remember one such example on a personal note. It was 1.45 in the morning in Los Angeles when I received the news, the harrowing news of our Amity brothers and sisters in danger, right when the rescue efforts were underway in Afghanistan. And I messaged Nadine thinking that she can get this message perhaps the next day. And she picked up the message at four in the morning her time. And she called me and worked on that matter for the next two hours with me over the phone all night to help our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. It's really a delight to give this honor to her. We ask her to receive the 2023 Ahmadiyya Muslim Humanitarian Award and then to share her remarks. We ask that she receive the award from our missionary in charge. Right here. Assalamu alaikum. It is such an honor and a privilege to be a recipient of this humanitarian award. Thank you. And I'm honored to speak alongside so many friends and professionals who have my admiration. I have been fortunate to spend much time with many members of the Ahmadiyya community, such as Amjad, Nesim Malik, Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, Mahmoud, Harris, others, and in London I was able to visit with His Holiness, Mirza Mesrour Ahmed. I am touched by your motto, love for all, hatred for none. But I'm touched especially because it's not just a slogan, but it's a way of life. I share this award with friends and colleagues who were partners in the Afghanistan evacuations and our continued work to rescue religious minorities at risk. Charmaine Heading and the Shai Fund, Sir Charles Hoare, and another who remains unnamed. When the Taliban took over Afghanistan and evacuations were announced, I feared that the only people that would be able to get on these planes were those that had contacts with powerful people in Washington, D.C. I worked to make sure we included the most vulnerable, including at-risk Ahmadiyya Muslims, Christian converts, Sikhs, Hindus, and others. A special thank you to the Nazarene Fund and Mercury One for providing these planes and the Shai Fund for organizing the effort. It is important to note that in addition to religious minorities, half of these planes that were privately funded were filled with those who worked with the U.S. government, at-risk women, judges, and others. It was on these planes that we were able to get out, members of the Ahmadiyya community. There were some harrowing moments especially the one night spent stuck in a Taliban checkpoint. And when we finally were able to get everyone out safely to the airport, shooting began and everyone had to pull back. That was a low moment. We would eventually get that group out, but not that day and not even that week. It would be months. I still thank them for their trust and their patience. I am distraught that there are still so many in danger, and I pray for them daily. We remain committed to providing help as needed. The horrific persecution that is happening to the Ahmadiyya community in several countries, including Algeria, Malaysia, and especially Pakistan, is extremely disturbing. While I was a commissioner at USERF, we stood up strong for the Ahmadiyya community, and I appreciate their continued support and diligence. And I'm also thankful for Ambassador Rashad Hussein and his excellent staff, like Dr. Harrison Aikens, who also continue to advocate so strongly. 
I do urge the U.S. government to follow USERF's excellent recommendations, including entering into a binding agreement with Pakistan under Section 405C of the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. This binding agreement could include benchmarks pressing Pakistan to repeal the blasphemy and anti ahmadiyya laws, and until that is done, they could enact reforms making blasphemy a bailable offense. They could press the removal of requirements of religion on ID cards. These are practical steps that could make the difference for thousands of Ahmadiyyas and other religious minorities. It also is important that we continue to work globally to improve religious freedom conditions, even in countries where there is no outright persecution of Ahmadiyya Muslims and others. An important question, are you and other religious minorities included as equal citizens in society? If not, then still work needs to be done. If you are, then we need to safeguard those religious freedom conditions against future events and leaders that could threaten them. For that reason, after I left USERF last May, I immediately joined Greg Mitchell at the IRF Secretariat, where we are building infrastructure to support the religious freedom movement globally. We run the International Religious Freedom Roundtable in Washington, D.C., and in over 25 countries globally and growing. These roundtables bring together civil society, religious communities, and government officials to solve problems in their own community and to advocate further globally. I am thankful for the strong Ahmadiyya Muslim presence in our Washington, D.C. roundtable, in our, um, the U.K. forum, and, and all, in many of our, our work throughout the world. And, and as Knox said, the way that you stand for one another is, is so impressive, and it does make it easy for us to love you back and it, for all the work that you do and the kindness that you show others who are also being persecuted. And you know, this goes beyond tolerance. We don't tolerate things, we tolerate things we don't like. And accepting one another as equal citizens, even among our deep theological differences, is the key to this work. And it's also the key to long-term peace and stability. And as a Christian, I am especially honored to stand alongside Ahmadiyya Muslims against discrimination, marginalization, and persecution. I'm confident that working together, we can make the difference in the lives of many seeking to follow their conscience and practice their faith peacefully. Thanks again for this special honor. It is so meaningful to me, as is my continued relationship with all of you. I'm confident I speak for the Earth Secretariat and the Earth Roundtable movement in promising to continue to stand with you in supporting love for all, hatred for none. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine, and congratulations again. Our next speaker is the Honorable Herman Toe. Charge d'Affaires of the Embassy of Burkina Faso in Washington, D.C. Mr. Toe previously served at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Communication in Burkina Faso. We're very honored to have him here. We ask him to share his remarks. Assalamu alaikum. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, Allow me to express my gratitude to the member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community for honoring Burkina Faso by inventing, inviting us to this 73rd Sal Jalsa Salana. Burkina Faso, through my person, would like to thank the Ahmadiyya community for all the social work and charitable work is carried out in my country. My special thanks go to His Holiness Mr. Masroor Hamad, global leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been present in Burkina Faso since 1950. The community is known for its teaching and peaceful practices in line with its official slogan, Law for all, hatred for none. It had carried out a number of projects in my country, including the construction of a large ophthalmological hospital in Kubri, near to the capital Ouagadougou. It's called Mashroud Ophthalmological Institute, 
which was inaugurated in 2022. Other projects have been completed or are underway, such as schools, water pumps, and helps for victims of terrorism. Regarding terrorism, I would like to pay tribute to the memory of nine Ahmadi Muslims killed in a horrific attack in January 2023 in the mosque of a village of Burkina Faso at 45 kilometers from Dori on the border with Niger. According to the initial information gathered at the scene, these Ahmadiyya worshipper was were particularly targeted by this attack, which shocked Burkina Faso peoples and the entire Ahmadiyya community worldwide and claimed the life of Imam Brega, Brema Bidiga and eight of his companions. It is recognized or worldwide that living together in peace means accepting differences, listening, showing esteem, respect, and recognition for others, living in spirit and peace in harmony. These are the virtues that the Amaja community is transmitting in Burkina Faso. These nine faithful Muslims from the Amaja community died for their belief in a world of tolerance, love, and peace. According to the National Council for Emergency Relief and Rehabilitation, the number of people fleeing terrorist attack in Burkina Faso has surpassed 2 million internally displaced persons by March 2023. This represents almost 10% of the population of the countries. This raises a number of issues, including the issues of the radicalization and reintegration of terrorist fighter into the society, the return and reintegration of internal displaced persons in their villages, the issue of reconciliation after almost 10 years of social fractures, and finally the issue of development. Distinguished guests, sister and brothers, the government aware of this issue and has taken appropriate measures to address them. These measures include the fight against religious radicalism, which lead the violent extremism by raising awareness among religious and traditional leaders so that they can in turn act as relays in their community raising awareness among their followers. Distinguished yet, the commitment and effort of the government of Burkina Faso in the fight against radicalism, the respect of human rights and the collaboration with all Burkina Faso citizens without distinction of religion or tribes for the progress and prosperity of the country through peace and security deserve to be supported. That's why I would like to take this opportunity to appeal for all partners for increased support for Burkina Faso in, the, in its quest of peace and development. I would like to conclude my speech by reiterating my sincere thanks to the Amadia community and by encouraging Amadia community to continue to be an example of peace and tolerance throughout the world. May God help us to cultivate love and tolerance because without love and tolerance, no religions has any meaning. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Honorable uh, Herman Toye, for those kind remarks and our thanks to the government of Burkina Faso. Our final speaker uh, this afternoon is the Ambassador of Guyana to the United States, His Excellency Ambassador 
Samuel Archibald Anthony Hines. His Excellency previously served as Prime Minister of Guyana almost continuously from 1992 to 2015. He also served briefly as President of Guyana in 1997. He was awarded Guyana's highest national award, the Order of Excellence in 2011. He has served as the Ambassador to the United States since 2021 and is a dear friend of our community, our Jamaat in Guyana. Your Excellency. Thank you much. Brothers and sisters, esteemed colleagues and friends, I bring you greetings from Guyana, a Caribbean country on the South American continent. And I bring greetings particularly from our President, His Excellency, Dr. Irfan Ali. It is an honor and a privilege to have been invited to take part in this Amadea Annual Convention in the USA. It is an opportunity to reestablish contact with Amadeas, which began in Guyana about 20 years ago when I was in office in our country. Allow me to use this opportunity to extend thanks to the Amadea mission to Guyana, starting with the great flood which we had in 2005. Let me also thank your continuing service, Humanity First Guyana, for all that it has been doing, schools, food drives, and medical missions. I want to join in putting emphasis on your motto, love for all, hatred for none, and your emphasis of service to humanity. Recent history has been bringing all our people rapidly to the point of being one world, one human race. Whilst this been has this has been a long-held noble aspiration. The bringing together of our different languages, cultures, histories, and religions alongside each other also bring together many possible sources of contention and conflict. Thus in our world today, we need as many people as possible to be committed to, be, to peace and with a strong sense of love for all, hatred for none, and service to all humanity. In Guyana, we have had the throwing together in colonial times of six peoples from four continents with three main religions. We have had about 175 years of living together. So we know the difficulties that can occur. But we've been doing fairly well with some ups and downs. Our president today, His Excellency Dr. Irfan Ali, is himself a Muslim. But growing up in Guyana, he would have attended schools and worked with fellow Guyanese who are Hindus and Christians. We're all comfortable in working and socializing with each other. Nonetheless, our president, Dr. Ali, has been advocating one Guyana so that we can become more steadily one people, one nation with a common destiny. Brothers and sisters, please accept my encouragement to live up to your aspirations, love for all, hatred for none, and in service of humanity. I thank you.
Thank you, Ambassador Hines. Uh, that concludes our formal remarks, but I do want to make some acknowledgments here. As a community, we have a history of receiving bipartisan support for our Jalsa Salana from members of U.S. Congress, and this year was no different. We have received videos, letters, and proclamations from many public officials across our nearly 60 chapters. We especially thank U.S. Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania, U.S. Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland, U.S. Congressman Dean Phillips of Minnesota, U.S. Congresswoman Angie Craig of Minnesota, U.S. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, U.S. Congressman Greg Kassar from Texas, and the Commissioner for the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, Fred Davies. All of them gave special video messages. And in the interest of time, we are posting those on our YouTube page and all of our social media handles. To all of our guests, we thank you for coming today. We invite all of you to stay for a hospitality reception just to my right uh, at the guest uh, reception room. Immediately after the conclusion of this program, our team members are standing by to escort you. I now turn the program back to our chair. In conclusion, I just have enjoyed in an afternoon with so many good friends who have come here perhaps first time or many times before and sharing these remarks, let's remember what they're saying to us. The work of peace is not the work of one man or one faith group, one nation or one group of any form or fashion. It is the work of all of us. But well, we are the ones who are living in this planet together, the planet Earth. And as Martin Luther King once said, either we live on this Earth together as friends in peace, or we'll die together as fools in bloodshed and war. I'm paraphrasing the messages I've heard from so many here tonight. We as Muslims in the Ahmadiyya community have been having jalousies throughout the world. And this session is a reflection of that message of peace of the founder of this community. One thing we can walk away with is that as a Muslim community, we have five fundamental pillars, five parts that make our faith whole. Short of any one of them, our faith is incomplete. The first is our creed, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. The second is prayer. The third is giving alms. The fourth is fasting. And the final one is performing the pilgrimage of Hajj to Mecca. In all of these fundamental pillars, we can see it a form of action. To pray, I go through a certain form of prayer. It's an act. To fast, I give up food and drink for a certain period of time. It's an act. To give alms, I reach into my pockets or into my wealth of time, knowledge, and energy, and give to others. It's an act. And to go for pilgrimage, I must leave my place of residence and go to a place called Mecca and perform certain rites. It is an act. The first one, however, the creed, La ilaha illallah, is the act only verbal, does it mean that once I've said these words, I've done the action that's required? I believe what we see today, that that cannot be true. That creed must also have an action. And that action is to learn not just to love God Almighty, but to live as a lover of God and love everything that is God's. And what is not God's? 
What has he not created in this world that he does not love? And so in this one first and foremost act, we can achieve peace if we love God and love all that is God's, whether we call God by any name or any term, we believe it is the same one God who's created all of this world we are living in. And this is how we can live in peace. I thank all the speakers who have come today and shared an aspect of this love of God and peace. And I appreciate the guests who have taken their time to join us and all of us, brothers and sisters, we should reflect upon this as members of the Islamic community to act on these five principles always and invite the world toward them, for it will lead this world that we're living in to peace. In the end, we'll have some announcements. We'll conclude. We'll head for the refreshments and to take the break until the next prayer session. I appreciate you and request the announcements now. Mohabbat sab ke liye Nafrat kisi se nahi Nafrat kisi se nahi Welcome back to the MTA studios. We have just wrapped up a powerful day two here at Joseph Solana USA. We heard a powerful speech from a CMC. It's um, about the current state of the world, how the Khalifa has empowered the world leaders to act and to act for world peace. We have just heard from various dignitaries coming from the state, the U.S. government, and from the international uh, arena talking about how Ahmadiyyat is the word of God. And it is the truthful word of Islam. Before we send you off, we do have some tweets we got from this morning and from this afternoon. Our first tweet is from at Sayyid Amit Avas 1. The Tablig Department organized a successful session with Murabiyan, new converts, and guests to deepen their understanding of Islam and Madiyat. Alhamdulillah, the event was a great success in fostering knowledge and harmony. So as you can see, there are various events that happen outside of the speeches and the usual sessions that happen during the breaks. And we have quite a few of those tweets that will recap of the different things going on. From at Muslim Kids USA, youth from at Muslim Kids USA always take pride in serving as the guests of the Promised Messiah alayhi salam. So as you can see, uh, some kids have, you know, been handing around water, you know, volunteering, ensuring everyone is able to have a good time at Joseph Solana. Our next tweet is from at Imam A. Dibba, a studio host, uh, at Muslim president hitting the nail on the head in his lecture about modesty, making you distinct and special, not something to be embarrassed about. Day two morning session ongoing. So as we mentioned earlier, Sadr Saab's speech mentioned to not worry too much about trends, but to more so focus on your own deen and to stay true to Khilafat and, and Jamal Ahmadiyyat. Our next tweet is from at Muslim underscore scientist. He writes at AMA USA and at Science Muslim. Hashtag reunion at Joseph Solana USA with respected presidents of AMA and AAMS, Dr. Fizan Abdullah and at Sohail Hussain Lab. At AMA USA is the Amity Muslim Medical Association and at AAMS is the Amity uh, Muslim Science Association. So as you can see, Joel says not only a place for speeches, but it's to reconnect with brothers and to share memories and to make new ones as well. Our last tweet of the day is from at Muslim Youth USA. Our hashtag MK Hub is up and running strong at Joe Solana USA. We have snacks, games, and special sessions like the upcoming session with Amir Jamath USA happening at 2 p.m. I was actually there for that session. It was very informative. Amir Saab led us in a QA and and was able to answer any questions that a young Qadim might have, as well as impart us some wisdom. That is all the tweets we have for today. We will now pass you off to Imam Dibba Saab and Muhammad Ahmed Chaudhry Saab, who are off in the RF cam right outside of the studio. یہ جلسہ ہمارا یہ دن برکتوں کے My favorite part uh, or experience uh, about the Jalsa uh, Salana is the opportunity to serve 
um, I have been blessed enough to serve in different capacities uh, and and make the experience better for people who are visiting from all over and make the make the experience as as smooth as possible for them and to express to guests what as Ahmadis we stand for which is the slogan of our Jamaat love for all, hatred for none people can gather together and know that this is such a peaceful community and learn a lot from us Welcome, we are outside of the set closing of the second day of Jalsa Salana USA as the as the guests come come back out we have a special guest with us who is the Southern Ansarullah of Bangladesh and he is the Secretary of Murekharja Amit Tafshir Saab. Amit Tafshir Saab, welcome and thank you for joining our US Jalsa. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Jazakallah. Assalamu Jaza. Thank you very much. Uh, I must have to share a little bit of the last Jalsa experience in Bangladesh and and what transpired. Ji, uh, this this Jalsa was our 98th Jalsa Salana Bangladesh. By the grace of Allah, we had been holding our Jalsa. It's around 106 years we started our Jalsa, but due to some reasons we couldn't hold in between some Jalsa. But this year it was that's why it was 98th Jalsa Salana. And inshallah, we'll be holding our 100th Yasa Salana on 2025, inshallah. Last Yasa Salana, there were some incidences. I mean, I, and I feel uh, we love our brothers in Bangladesh. They acted with such bravery. Uh, and there was a shahadat. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, there was an incident in our last Yasa that was uh, supposed to be held on 3, 4, and 5th March. And the situation was apparently is very fine and smooth. There was no sign of any hesitation. And in general, we hold our jalsa very peacefully, except few incidents it took, uh, held also. It took place also earlier also. So this time we were prepared, and suddenly a group of uh, mullah they started uh, agitation. They are holding rallies. And uh, they are uh, asking the, gov the local authority to stop our jalsa. However, uh, the local authority came to our jalsa just day before the jalsa started, the second March in the evening, and they assured us that don't worry, we will uh, take all measures, and uh, you go ahead, your jalsa will be fine for three days, don't worry. But unfortunately, uh, that was Friday. You know, we usually we start our jalsa on Friday. So 3rd March was Friday, and uh, after Juma, suddenly uh, there was an attack in our Jalsaga. First they attacked our medical center, adjacent to our Jalsaga, there we have medical center. They first attacked there, and within a few minutes, the surrounding area of the Jalsaga, uh, they started attacking. So, so, and, so, and this was almost, oh, well, this was over a year ago now, about 15 months ago. Uh, uh, no, 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 it's uh, last March. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, last March. Uh, and, and, and how did the community respond? Yeah, before that, I want to say one thing more, that the Jalsa, we usually are, take place at Ahmednagar. It's around 450 kilometers away from the center of the Dhaka city. Uh, but the area called Ahmadnagar and Shalshri, we have two villages, and there are around 3,500 inhabitants of Ahmadi. That is that out of the total population, roughly 45 to 50 percent are Ahmadis. So it's an uh, Ahmadi area, and our Jalsaga is surrounded. But unfortunately, when this took place, uh, we received very good uh, support and response from the media and also civil society. In terms of being able to host at the new site and this new yeah. site, there, there, as you said, there's a lot of assurance from the police and others that there's going to be a lot of safety, but sadly there wasn't. Uh, and one uh, member of the uh, Andy Muslim community was martyred? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, when the attack started, uh, the, the police deployed in the Jalsa area, they were inactive. And that is a very uh, mysterious 
Uh, we don't get any direct uh, reply from them. The why you were not uh, act in action? So for that reason, uh, the the miscreants they try to enter to a Jasaga, but they couldn't. Because they yeah, you know, uh, we we pray for all our brothers and sisters in Bangladesh, and we uh, continue to pray. And we we heard Azur's message after this as well, um, and we love them, and we'll continue to pray them, uh, pray for them. Uh, just a, a little quick transition. What is your what has been your impression of the U.S. Jalsa uh, after that occasion? Yes, but be, let me be, uh, point out one more thing. When the, the attack was going on, we had direct communication with Huzur at this, and uh, 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 Muni Javesa was communicating with me and also with Amir Saab. And Huzur was taking care. He was uh, very much anxious about the situation. And he was praying for us. So anyway, unfortunately, we have to stop our JOSA, postpone our JOSA, uh, because the administration came to us and they said that at this situation, we cannot uh, give you the support. We are sorry for that, and uh, we have to postpone your JOSA. So you, you have to postpone it, and we have to do that, so yes. I am as the, for your next, last question, Alhamdulillah, I am very happy. This is the first time I'm attending the uh, U.S. JOSA Salana, I mean the East Coast. I had the opportunity of attending the West Coast Jalsa, but long ago, it was sometimes in 20, 2006. And this is the first time I am attending uh, Jalsa Salana USA. That is the main Jalsa, I should say. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it's fantastic. It's a very nice environment. And uh, lots of uh, attendance. I think it will be around 8,000, 8, what I understand. Maybe we'll be let know when uh, Amisa will declare the total attendance. Jazakallah for being being on with us and Jazakallah for visiting our Jalsa and we'll continue to pray for our Bangladesh uh, brothers and sisters. With that, I'd like to, as we end day two of Jalsa Salana USA, you will you see um, as people come out, they they enjoyed various speeches this morning from ver, ver, uh, from three different individuals and then we had the guest session uh, this afternoon and where the various guests and elected officials came, you saw the MKA Hub, the Humanity First booth, plus plus many other things that are going on. And I think individuals are moving around to going to enjoy the Jalsa for the rest of the evening. Jazakallah for joining us today. Uh, and we welcome you back tomorrow morning to Jalsa Salana USA. But for today, Assalamu Alaikum. <laughs> Love